you unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Cooper Corporation, how may I direct your call? Just a moment. Cooper Corporation. Coffee coming through. Who ordered coffee? With sugar and two creams. Right here. Thanks, Louie. You got it. Coffee here. Uh, do you have any Danish this morning? I got bran muffins, granola bars, and trail mix. Oh, no. What happened to the Danish? Mr. Cooper's orders. Mr. Cooper, how come? He's on a health kick. Says Danish is bad for you. For the whole office? Everybody on the floor. He wants more work out of you. Oh, well. I suppose I'll have one of those granola bars. Is it chocolate coated? K Rob. Sounds positively yummy. Guess I'll give it a try. Hey, that's wrong, you know. What is, McNulty? Well, the pastries are bad for the brain. True, they're mostly sugar and starch, but so are muffins, huh? <laughs> granola bars? Granola bars have as much fat as 13 strips of bacon, did you know that? And trail mix? <laughs> Forget it! Forget it! There's so many calories and saturated fats, you might as well eat a tub of popcorn, huh? <laughs> With butter! <laughs> <sighs> well, if Mr. Cooper wants to improve productivity... All I know is I got coffee with cream, cream and sugar, cream by itself, sugar by itself, or artificial sweetener. And that old favorite, all black. Take your pick. Ah, diversification. Now you, you're on the right track. As I always say, you can't run a business standing still. A business has got to move. A business has got to progress. You think about that now. Excuse me, I gotta progress through the office. Yeah, so do I. We all do. A business has got to keep pushing, keep punching, keep prodding, keep moving forward. That's what a business has got to do. Now, you think about that. <laughs> Personally, I got to get a drink of water. <clears throat> you coming, Gertrude? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I think I better go with you. Ah, sounds good. I think I'll come along, too. Oh, uh, that's, that's all right. right. Hey, did you know that water is the most important part of a healthy diet? We're almost all water. I mean, our cells feed off of it, right? <laughs> hey, you see that suggestion box on the wall? I personally told Mr. Cooper to get better quality bottled water. Huh? Huh? But the chemicals they put in it these days, I mean, think about it now. It's a disgrace. Not to mention... Submitted for your approval, or at least your analysis, one Patrick Thomas McNulty who, at age 41, is the biggest bore on Earth. He holds a 10-year record for the most meaningless words spewed out during a typical coffee break. And it's very likely that, as of this moment, he would have gone on through life in precisely the same manner, a dull, argumentative big mouth who sets back the art of conversation at least a thousand years. I say he very likely would have, except for something that will soon happen to him. Something totally unexpected that will considerably alter his existence and ours. You think about that now, because this is, after all, the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A Kind of Stopwatch, starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Ah, oh, damn. You can taste the impurities. We need clean air, too. HEPA filters, air ionizers, the whole bit, huh, you know? And these rooms need a new paint job while they're at it, you know? I mean, a nice, soothing color. Come on, Angie. Let's go to the powder room. Yeah, I'm with you. Because we got to keep this company on track. You think about it now. We will. McNulty. Right here. Mr. Cooper would like to see you. Well, 
<laughs> well, you hear that, everybody? Huh? <laughs> Mr. Cooper would like to see McNulty. Huh? <laughs> and all because of that box right there. You know why Mr. Cooper wants to see McNulty? Because McNulty has been feeding him suggestions in that box for 11 months now. Did I say suggestions? Wrong word. Suggestions any Claude can give, huh? <laughs> but dynamic blueprints for the future only McNulty can give, huh? <laughs> you just think about that. Mr. Cooper's waiting, Mr. McNulty. I don't suppose you'd be free for dinner, would you, huh? <laughs> I was thinking we could, you know, dine at some cozy little out-of-the-way place, nice and intimate, you know. And, uh, maybe a trip to Light Fantastic. If I were starving to death and you were the last man on Earth and it meant whether I live or die, I might be. But I'm not, you're not, and it doesn't. So buzz off, Buster. In here, McNulty. Hi, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Do you know what I've been doing for the last half hour? You've been looking through the suggestion box. I knew it was going to happen one of these days, Mr. Cooper. I've been expecting it. You see, the thing of it is, it takes a very special kind of employer to recognize that one of his men has got it. And obviously, McNulty does. Truer words, McNulty, have probably never been spoken here or anywhere else. I've just gone through the residue of the suggestion box covering the past three-month period. Here is your suggestion dated March 13th. Make hot dogs flat so they can fit more easily into a hamburger bun. Well, how about that? Now you think about that now, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Make tin cans square so they can be stacked together more easily. Well, huh? <laughs> Isn't that a guess? You think about that, too. Put small pontoons in field packs of soldiers so that when they cross rivers, they can float. That's worth a million bucks as it stands, huh? <laughs> I mean, that one little suggestion. You see, the soldiers, they go in the water in the cans. Well, the cans, they're full of air, see, so... Mr. McNulty, the Cooper Corporation makes ladies' foundation garments. It has nothing whatsoever to do with hamburgers, hot dogs, tin cans, or national defense. Not a single one of your 340 suggestions, repeat, not one of them, has anything remotely to do with this company's product. Right. See? <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about that, too. What you ought to do is focus on new inventions for our customers. Our customers? Well, I've been doing some reading about pressure and leverage of principles of engineering, and one of the greatest engineers of the 20th century was Howard Hughes. Why, did you know that he invented the cantilevered brassiere? Huh? <laughs> he invented a, a, well, an undergarment that actually defied the laws of gravity, huh? <laughs> like a suspension bridge. And if it weren't for his little invention, nobody would have ever heard of <clears throat> Jane Russell. Huh? <laughs> did you know that? I believe this company is well aware of the history of our product lines. And they don't have anything to do with 1940s movie stars or eccentric old recluses with mental delusions. Exactly! The key to a successful business is diversification. More products for more kinds of customers. Now you think about that. I have thought about it, McNulty. Now you think about this. Yes, sir. You're fired! Another round, McNulty? In a, in a minute. I'm, I'm still working on this one. Now over here, Joe. Coming right up. You know something? Oh, here we go again. With the long ball hitter, as opposed to the consistent clutch hitter with a big average, I will take the latter. Well, that's very nice of you to tell us, McNulty. Well, it's a fact that at no time, at, at, at no time, has the home run leader in either league led the league in batting at no time, which should tell you.
Uh, Ted Williams won the batting championship and led the league in home runs in 1941, 42, and 47. The exception to the rule. <clears throat> Think about that now. The exception to the rule. You know something? My sister's got five kids, a 6'4 walk-up, a little bitty TV set, and an air conditioner that don't work. But I'll tell you what else it don't have. It don't have McNulty. Me, I'm out of here. Like I was saying, it's the exception that proves the rule. Let me ask you something, McNulty. How come you're in here so early tonight? You've been sitting here now for three and a half hours. Well, for the simple reason that... Uh... I quit my job. No kidding. Yeah, I went into Mr. Cooper's office and I read him off. Just like that, you know, like Cooper, I said. Don't tell me, McNulty. You got canned. Well, in, in, in a manner of, of speaking, you might say, well, yeah, we mutually agreed that I wasn't going to work there anymore. <sighs> Let me ask you something. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that after one year of putting suggestions in the suggestion box, after one whole year, I get noticed? McNulty, you want to know something? Getting noticed and getting liked are two different things. What do you know about it? Nothing, McNulty. Not a thing. All I know is that every week of every month except Election Day, you come in here and drive everybody out of their skull walking on your lower lip. Now you think about that little thing, will you, for my sake? Where's my other beer? Right here. Thank you, barkeep. If you don't mind, I think I'll find myself a nice, quiet table to sit at. Goodbye. Excuse me, my good man. Is this seat taken? Is now. So, what do you say, old timer? I say 54 40 or fight. I also say, damn the torpedoes in full speed ahead. And on occasion, on no occasion, I have been known to say it takes a heap of living to make a house a home. You, uh, you want another one? Thank you. I would consider it a kindness on your part. <clears throat> one more over here, please. So, what's your name? What's my name? Potts. 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 Well, that's not such a bad name. It is the one I was born with. Seems to me there was a third baseman play for the Phillies one year. Seems to me his name was Potts. Let's see, it was uh, Lou Potts, Frank Potts. Could it have been Bots? No. Potts! You paying, McNulty? Because this old rummy already gave me his last dollar. This man is my friend. And I like a little respect from you while you're at it. I bet you would, McNulty. And you getting respect from me would be about as easy as flagging down a cab on 46 and Broadway at 8 o'clock on New Year's Eve in the rain. Here you go. So, what do you want to talk about? You want to, want to talk about baseball? Well... It is a great American pastime, and I am so glad that Abner Doubleday saw fit to invent it. To your health, friend. And now, to show my appreciation for your generosity, I have something for you. Consider it a gift. A small remembrance of our friendship. Ah, huh. well, what is it? It's an old family heirloom. A kind of stopwatch, you might say. Why, why do you carry it around? I, I mean, you know, if it's, if it's just a stopwatch, it doesn't keep keep time, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is a fact. But it's all yours nonetheless. Someday you might own a racehorse. Or you might want to run the four-minute mile. Who knows? Now you've got a stopwatch to time yourself. <laughs> I've been looking for someone to give it to. I myself am finally finished with it. 
Goodbye, old pal. E pluribus unum. <sighs> hey, hey! You, you didn't finish your beer. You done for the night, McNulty? There ain't no more ears in here you can bend. You bored ten people to death, and you emptied this place faster than a smallpox sign. Funny looking watch. Anyway, <sighs> I hate to go home, Joe. I mean, geez, you know, I mean, I already saw the picture on the late show. I mean, I even saw the one on the late late show. Hey, McNulty, do me a favor, would you? Whenever you get the thirst, go to some other bar. Sometimes, you know, I wish I was I was married, cause <laughs> so I wouldn't have to go anywhere. You, know? you ever get that feeling? Huh? <laughs> <sighs> work this thing. Push the button on the top. I and another thing about you, McNulty, you make me nervous. First, you come in here, and then. What? <laughs> what? What's going on, Joe? Hey, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, Joe. Why ain't you moving, Joe? Joe, why don't you say something? I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's like he was was frozen. And what's with the TV? There was a game on. The guy started the pitch, and and. Well you, well, you look at that. The ball's just hanging there. Did the TV freeze up or something? <laughs> Say, what is this? Something's going on. All I was doing was telling you about how bored I was, and then that crazy gleep gives me this watch here, and I push the button on it like this, and... And you bore people to death, and then you start to make me so nervous my back itches, and... <laughs> <laughs> hey, I gotta like this. Furthermore, it's getting so people don't stay very long in my establishment when you're around. You catch my drift? They stick their heads in, see you sitting here, and move on. In other words, you're costing me business, McNulty. Do I have to make it any plainer? So like I say, take it somewhere else, okay, pal? It's nothing personal. I make you nervous? <laughs> You don't suppose... You don't suppose this, this watch here... You know something, McNulty? You're the one guy who makes me wish they never repealed Prohibition. And you know what I think, Joe? I think this watch, this watch, this watch is a very unusual one. That's what I think. A very, very unusual watch. Huh? <laughs> Hey, buddy, watch where you're going. Oh, 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 so, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my good man. Yeah, you should be. Excuse me. Begging your pardon, lady. Officer, oh, officer. Yes, ma'am? That man over there, I think he's drunk. Oh, he is, is he? He bumped right into me. You can see the way he's staggering. He can hardly stand up. Oh, it's a disgrace. Well, no, we'll just see about that. Hold on there, fella. Yes, uh, officer? Had a little too much to drink, did we? Well, I wouldn't say that. Not enough. It's more like it. <laughs> Why don't you just go home and sleep it off? You'll feel better in the morning. Yes, yeah, of course, of course. I'm, uh, I'm on my way home now, as a matter of fact. Walking, are you? I'd say you're in no condition. You know, you're, you're right, officer. I was... I was just thinking about that. Well, get along with you now. Why should a man have to walk at all, right? He could fall down and get hurt. Now, here's an idea for you. 
you make the sidewalks out of rubber, huh? <laughs> Think about that now, huh? No more injuries. You fall, you bounce right back up again. All the money the city could save. No more broken arms and legs to fix by the hospitals would save millions. Not to mention the, uh, the, uh, uh, insurance companies. I think I better call you a cab. Okay. I'm a cab. <laughs> you get it? You said I'll call you, and then I, I, I said, well. No more kidding now. Not at all. I, I don't, I don't want a cab in, in the first place. I never stopped for you. And in the second place, it takes too long on account of there's too much traffic in this city in the first place. Am I right or am I wrong? You tell me that. I'm not telling you nothing. Now listen. Hey, 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 you know, you know what they ought to do? Put in moving sidewalks, huh? <laughs> that way, all a man has to do is, is stand in one place. Not even use a single muscle, and before you know it, he's home. <laughs> you think about that. I'm serious. If you can't afford a cab, the subway's right at the end of the block. Now run along. Either that or I'll haul you in right now. On what charge, may I ask? Public intoxication. Plus, you're making a real nuisance of yourself. Now quit flapping your lips and get a move on, you hear? Of course I do, officer. I hear the wisdom of your words, and I have enjoyed this conversation immensely. A good evening to you, sir. Just move along now. Subway, huh? Well... I guess it's an okay way to get around for now. Of course, if anybody would listen to McNulty... Hurry up, will ya? Hey, hey, well, what's... What's the matter with this turnstile? I'm pushing, but it doesn't turn. You gotta put a token in! Oh! <laughs> Yes, of course. Next. How many? What? Oh, uh, yes. Um, just one. One token. Where's your money? I, I, uh, don't have any small bills. No money, no token. But I have to get home. Well, don't go trying to jump the gate or the guard will find you, but good. Next. Come on, buddy. Next. Can't you just... Reach over and take a token off the top of that stack and hand it to me. See, nobody will notice. He's just as much. What's with that guy? Of all the nerve. I think there's something wrong with him. Next person in line. Wait, uh... In that case, I, I may have a solution to this, this little, uh... This little impasse of ours. Hurry up, will ya? It's just this switch here on top. Oh, for crying out loud, now he's setting his watch. Yes, you see, this is the button I pushed before. Ah, now then. <laughs> well, what do you know? Looks like I don't need a token to get through the gate after all. I'll just climb over. Right under your nose, Mr. Security Guard. Huh? <laughs> and when I'm safely aboard my train, but... Oh. Wait. Wait a minute. Oh, no, no, no. Why take the train at all? Why, when there are other modes of transportation available, other much more comfortable kinds... I'll just click this stopwatch one more time. And all I have to do is wait till I see what I'm looking for. You again. Thought he was getting on the subway. Oh, I, I was. Oh, sure, I, I was. But, you know, it's, it's much too crowded. I, I decided to take a cab after all. Say, what are you trying to pull? Why, nothing, officer. Huh? <laughs> it's just that I, I thought of another way to get home. You even got enough money for a cab, or did you drink it all? Money? 
what an old-fashioned concept. I, I don't really think that's necessary now. No, not necessary at all. No? No, not as long as I can stop a cab. Of course, that's hard to do on a corner like this. Let's go. I think I better take you down to the station house. But why bother, huh? I mean, you know, as long as I can hail a cab. Let me let me show you McNulty's method. <clears throat> you watch, and you think about it now, okay? <whistles> Taxi! <laughs> There. Yeah. I think I can see a cab now. That one. In the middle of the street. How nice of the driver to stop just for me. Hello there, driver. What? Not speaking, huh? <laughs> well, let me see what I can do to fix that. What? Hey, who are you? How'd you get in my car? Never mind. I'm here now, aren't I? Okay, okay. Where to? Home, driver. Take me downtown by the shortest possible route. And you think about it now. Sure thing. Hey, 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 hey. Have you ever thought about this? Ban cars completely, you know, in, in, in the city at least, for starters, helicopters. Now that's the future. Your private copters, okay? Each one big enough to hold one person. You think about the savings in, in, in gas, pollution, in traffic jam, not to mention police meter maids, no parking zones. Anything you say, buddy. Yeah, yeah, you see? You see? All you, all you do is you, you take some electric golf carts and you retrofit them with propellers on top and you plug them in, you charge them up and... There you go. Now you think about what I said now. The only way to make a really comfortable car seat is is to build it horizontal. Like those, um, uh, what do you, what do you call them, uh, luge guys in the Olympics. Right? Right? Huh? See? That way you just lie down. And you steer looking in, into a, a mirror, the, the same as a periscope. And you think how low to the ground all the cars would be is a, is a better center of gravity. It's, it's much better. <laughs> Plus, you can see across the street without having to strain your neck. And when it comes to getting out, you know, all you do is you roll, like in your bed, right? Now that would be a big improvement. This here is it, mister. Far as I go. I think I'm gonna pack it in for the night. Thank you, my good man. That's 1780. How's that? The fare. Make it 18 bucks plus something for the wife and kids. Now, you see, eh, that's just my point. All that money, and for what? I say ban the internal combustion engine. Springboard shoes would work just fine. All we need is a company to manufacture a prototype. You gonna pay me or talk me to death? Neither, to tell you the truth. Do, uh... Do you have the time? <laughs> huh? The time. Here. Let's have a look at my pocket watch, shall we? Um, have I, have I told you about it yet? Yeah, this is really a very unusual watch, a kind of, um, stop watch. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <clears throat> Allow me to demonstrate. Don't try to con me. All I want is for you to pay up. If you don't, I'm calling this in. It's a violation of the city code to defraud a... There. Isn't that better? So much more restful. <sighs> I think I'll go inside now and lie down. No, 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 don't, don't you worry about it. As soon as I get to my apartment, I'll open the window and hit the button on this stopwatch again, and you'll be on your way. And tomorrow morning, so will I. In fact, from the way things are going so far, I say that your friend and mine, the one and only Patrick T. McNulty, is going to be the life of the party. Yeah? <laughs> you be sure to think about that now, won't you? Stand back, world. McNulty is walking through the universe. <laughs> Yeah.
good good morning to you listeners. We'll be bringing you the Eye of All News at 7.27. Oh, forgot to turn the blasted alarm off. But for now, here's an update from Weather Central. Some overcast this morning with scattered clouds this afternoon. And now, back to this morning's casual concert with a swinging set. Eh, wrong. There is nothing moderate about today, because today is the day that people start listening to McNulty. Unless... Unless it was some kind of dream. Now where is that crazy watch? Aha! Here! All right, now let's give it the old test. Ah, my kind of town. Millions of people going to work. No imagination. But McNulty, now that's a different story. A man who's just full of ideas, so original, they don't have a word for him yet. But they will. If this thing works. Well, here goes. <laughs> it's not a dream. It's not a dream. It's the goods. The real deal. This wonderful, gorgeous watch. I just push the button and everything. Everything stops. I mean everything. The whole world stops for me. <laughs> Get ready out there. McNulty steps up to the plate. He swings and he swats it clean out of the park. Oh, no! Not McNulty again. What's doing here? Maybe he's gonna shoot up the place. Morning, Angie. McNulty? You look lovely this morning, as always. What's the suggestion this time? Because if you haven't got one handy, I've got one for you. Yes? Why don't you jump off a bridge? <laughs> Honey, baby, you don't mean that. Wait till you see what I got in my pocket. It'll put a dent in your eyeballs. Try the Brooklyn Bridge at midnight. You think about this now. You think about a stopwatch that, uh, if somebody pushes it, everything stops in midair. Everything, huh? Huh? Think about that. Without a life jacket. McNulty, why don't you get lost? What's the point? You see this little gimmick? It's a watch, so... So, last night, I'm sitting in Joe Pellucci's bar. Figures. We're talking about this and that, and this funny little gleep comes in and gives me this watch. Without thinking about it, I give it a push. This little button right here. And everything stops dead. Pellucci stops, the ball game stops, you know what else? Everything. That's what stops. You think about that. No kidding. Joe Pellucci and the TV, too. Well, thanks for the entertainment. Now get out of here! After I see Cooper, it's time to diversify. Now you wait just a minute, McNulty. Mr. Cooper's in conference. You bet he is. He's in conference with me. I thought I fired you, McNulty. What are you doing back here? Mr. Cooper, he barged right in. I couldn't do anything about it. Well, if he barged right in, he'll barge right out again. Hey, listen, Coop. Coop? You can't afford to fire me. This time, I got more than a suggestion. I got the goods. You figure out how this little doohickey works, and you got yourself all the money in the world. McNulty, once more I remind you, we make ladies' foundations, nothing else. Did you hear me? Nothing else. Now I'll give you 15 seconds to leave this room, 25 seconds to reach the elevator, 45 seconds to vacate the building, and you may use that, that watch to time yourself. Is that a fact? All right, then. I'll go. Just remember, you lost a fortune today. <laughs> Why, that gleep didn't even let me show him. McNulty, if you're not out of here in one minute, I'll call the police. So... What am I waiting for? 
I'll show him anyway. I'll show you all. Hello, operator. Get me. <sighs> now you put that phone down and come with me. That's right. <laughs> In here. Right on Cooper's lap. <laughs> How about that, huh? <laughs> Nice coffee. Right in the middle of pouring it, huh? <laughs> and you, hey, sweetheart. I like your typing. Don't your hands get tired up in the air like that, huh? <laughs> All right, so it's good for a laugh, maybe. There must be something else I can do with this thing. Miss Hinkley, what do you think you're doing? Who's up next? Don't look now. It's the cleanup man. The guy could empty a baseball stadium, not to mention a bar. And if you don't spend three hours telling us how he'd run the Mets, he'll keep oots and me about how I should run my own place. Hey, Joe. Hey, you want to hear a good idea? Why don't you make a swinging door like in the movies, huh? Maybe change the name of the place, Pellucci's Western Saloon. Hey, how about that? Hey, McNulty, how about that? I'll have it done first thing in the morning. Ah, oh, that's great. Then every time I come in, I'll push open a swinging door and I'll think, I did this. Wait, whoa, you're not putting me on, are you, Joe? McNulty, the only thing I'd put you on is a slow freighter heading for the other side of the world. See ya, Joe. Yeah, I'm out of here. Relax, boys, you're about to see something you ain't gonna believe. Yeah, well, make it quick, huh? With this little gizmo right here, I can stop trains, buses, planes, subways. There ain't nothing in this world I can't stop. Yeah, what about your mouth? I gotta pour myself a drink. Watch this. All right, now, uh, hmm. I'll move your beer over here and put yours in front of him. Uh, let's see. How about if I undo your tie like this, huh? <laughs> oh, and Joe, over there. Hey, why, look, Joe, where's your glass now, huh? You're going to be pouring beer in your hand, huh? <laughs> All right, okay. Here we go again. Oh, what the... Well, huh? Well... Ah, come on now. What do you think about that, huh? Think about what? What, what, what are you kidding? You, did, you didn't see what I just did? Out of the way, McNulty. I want to make it home by the bottom of the eighth. See ya, Joe. Well, you done it again, McNulty. You emptied my bar. You drive more people out of saloons and carry nation. Oh, I get it. Of course you couldn't see what happened. Of course you couldn't. How could you? You guys got froze. I'm the only one who sees what's going on. The only one. See? So I got the greatest conversation piece in the world. The greatest. And what does it do? It stops conversation. Well, so it shouldn't be a total loss. You should order up. But drink it fast, will you? The combination of you, the hot weather, and my business recession is more than I can take for one day. Hey, Pellucci, look at me. What are you, some kind of sadist? Do you know what you're looking at? A jerk. A jerk, I'm telling you. A jerk, a nutsy, that's what you're looking at. You want to stop there or go for double or nothing? It's a bat. What do I want this thing for? I want to get a little notice, that's what. Well, let me tell you something, Pellucci. When John D. Rockefeller got out of a car, why did people go up to shake his hand? I'll bite. Why? Because he had dough. That's why. Lettuce, the old Mizzou. J.P. Morgan walks into a bar. The head waiter almost breaks his neck trying to get a table ready. Why? I'll tell you why. Because J.P. Morgan was loaded. You think about that now. And you think about this. As of today, McNulty's gonna be loaded too. I'm gonna have a limousine drive me up here. I'm gonna have a chauffeur open the door. I'm gonna walk into this crummy joint of yours and buy about 18 rounds for everyone. Huh? Huh? And then, and then, just for a laugh, I'll buy you a mortgage. You don't mind if I don't hold my breath, do you, McNulty? Pellucci, old pal, take a good long look. The next time you see me, I'll be the new McNulty. Why didn't you go the whole route and move to Honolulu? Pellucci, tonight I'll be able to buy Honolulu. I'd like to make a deposit to my account. You have to wait in line. 
I want to cash this check. All in large bills, ma'am. Next customer in line. Is this where I make a withdrawal? Yes, sir. How much would you like? Oh, I don't know. How much you get? Sir? I'll take small bills. Lots of them. Just need your bank account number. Right here. Oh, you want me to get them for you? Oh, sure. No problem. Well, let's see. Oh, a bag of fives. And some tens. And, uh... <laughs> Some twenties while I'm at it. Yeah, let's see that how to do it. Oh, don't worry, folks, it's only money. <laughs> it grows on trees. That's what it does, right? It grows on trees. For me. <laughs> huh, might have to make a couple of trips, though. Okay, here we go. One. Two, three! My watch! <laughs> uh, oh, uh, well, it better be shockproof. Hey, hey, start already, come on. Hey, what's the matter with this thing? Hey, uh, hey, hey, hey everybody can start moving again, okay? All right, come on, come on, here we go! Up, 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 come on, let's go, come on, get with it! Hey, uh, any, any, anybody know how to fix a watch? Come on, come on, anybody, anybody, give me a little help here. Hey, hey, everybody, it's me, McNulty, huh? <laughs> hey, Angie, Angie, where are you? Come on, come on, you guys, you can, you, you, you can wake up now. All right, it's... It's, it's just this little switch here, see, it's... I, 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 I'll get this thing fixed, it's, it's no sweat, okay? Where's Mr. Cooper? He'll know what to do. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Cooper, is it... Hey, what's she doing still sitting on your lap? I thought that was yesterday. Joe! Joe, please! Please, do something. Say something. Go ahead, you know. Insult me. Please. Please, won't somebody do something? Or say something? Hey, please. Don't anybody, don't anybody know where I can get a watch fixed? I'm begging you. Please. Hey. Hey. Anybody. Anybody. Please. Please do something! Say something! Anything! Mr. Patrick Thomas McNulty, who was given the gift of unlimited time, he used it and misused it, and now he's been handed the bill. Mr. McNulty, who now controls the earth and everything on it. From this point on, he will eat well, live well, and have everything at his beck and call. But the thing he wanted most, the thing that gave him the most acute hunger, his need for a sympathetic ear, this he will never have again. Tonight's tale of motion and the lack thereof, and a man named McNulty in a place called the Twilight Zone. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Something the matter, Janna? I'm tired. You are, dear? 
tired and cold. It's getting chilly in here. On the contrary, the temperature's perfect, as it is throughout the house. 72 degrees, isn't it, William? Isn't it 72 degrees? I'm sure it is, quite sure. Of course, it's the optimum temperature. And the chairs are designed for maximum comfort. The fire for perfect heat radiation and the windows for the most efficient light and ventilation. And the ceilings for the most desirable acoustic qualities. Everything built to perfection, Father. But just the same, I'm cold. Well, then come away from the window. Yes, dear, sit by the fire again. That way I can see you. I'm not doing anything but reading. I like to look at you no matter what you're doing. This is the same book I've been reading all afternoon. You've watched me for hours. You must have memorized every one of my expressions by now, every tick, every gesture. Yes, but I so enjoy watching you. Why is that? Because you're so beautiful, darling. Absolutely perfect in every way. Don't argue with your mother, Jenna. I'm not arguing. I'm only saying that it's chilly here in the study. At least I have a chill, and I'd rather sit by the window. There's nothing to see outside. It will be dark soon. Let me build up the fire. You know that's not possible. Why? Because it's burning natural gas instead of wood? Well, why not just this once? Why not let me put a real log on the fire and get rid of the chill in the air? It would be exciting to watch it burn. I, I'd actually enjoy the unpredictability of it. Just once in my life. Sit down, Jenna. Do as your father says, dear. I can't oppose you, father. You know that. I never could. It's almost six. I think I'll ask Nelda to come in now and massage my shoulders. Good idea, Margaret. My muscles get so stiff sitting here. Let me do it for you, Mother. That's Nelda's job. Yes, Jana, dear. Nelda knows exactly the way I like it. Why don't we have dinner first? Oh, no. After is better. The massage always stimulates my appetite. Well, then, if we can't eat earlier tonight, how about a little bit later? I know. Why don't we go out and eat in a restaurant? A restaurant? Jana... Now, why in the world would we go out and eat in a restaurant when we have everything we need here? Gretchen is already preparing something in the kitchen. I know. It, it's just that, well, it would be different. I've no doubt it would be different. First, we'd walk through the rain and get sopping wet. Jensen could bring the car around. And then we'd eat some kind of unhealthy, unpalatable mess on dirty, half-washed plates. By then, it would be a moot question as to whether we'd succumb to tomaine or pneumonia. Yes, Father. Ah, Nelda, you must have read my mind. It's six o'clock, Mrs. Lauren. You always have your neck rub at six o'clock. Isn't that right, ma'am? Of course it is, Nelda. And you never forget, do you? You never, ever forget. No, ma'am. The residence of Dr. William Lauren, a beautiful home designed for comfort and convenience, the reward for a world-class career as a scientist. He has chosen to live his life as safely, as securely as science can make it, and he spares his wife and daughter no luxury that might make their lives more perfect. But in a moment, the good doctor will discover that perfection is relative, that a life of controlled ease has a greater price than he imagined price may be more than he is willing or able to pay. Because very shortly, he's about to be shown what exactly is on the bill, one that has suddenly and unexpectedly come due in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Lateness of the Hour, starring Jane Seymour and James Keach, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Feels lovely, Nelda. Would you like some more liniment? Yes, if you please. Oh, you have such strong fingers. Perfect for massaging my neck muscles. Jana, are you here? Yes, Mother. Enjoying your book again? A different one this time. Which is it? A family photo album. That's nice. When was this picture taken? Let me see. This one. Oh, look, Nelda. That's a lovely picture of you. Yes, ma'am. What year? Let's see. Oh, this was taken the year after your father retired from the lab. 
And look, there are those yellow roses that Jensen planted for us. How they grew. And Nelda looks exactly the same. Must be a wonderful thing not to age, Nelda. Isn't it? It has its advantages, I guess, Miss Jana. Nelda will put that away for you. That's all right, Father. I'd like to put it back in the bookcase myself. You seem nervous, dear. I'm just going to stand by the fireplace. You're not still chilly, are you? A bit, Mother. You do that, then. I don't like to see you pacing. Please continue, Nelda. Mmm, oh yes, that feels so very nice. I think I'll go to the kitchen, see if the cook needs any help. That won't be necessary. I'm sure Gretchen has everything under control. I'm sure she does, but just the same, I'd like to see what she's doing. Well, I suppose that's all right. Now don't be long, dear. Is that you, Miss Lauren? Hello, Robert. Can I get you anything? No, thank you. Is everything all right? Perfectly. Would you care for a beverage? An hors d'oeuvre, perhaps? I'm fine. If I want anything, I'll let you know. Yes, Miss Lauren. Robert, why are you following me? In case you need assistance. I don't. I told you I'm perfectly fine. The stairs to the pantry can be a bit tricky. I know that, Robert. I grew up in this house, remember? I've always lived here. I know every square inch of it as well as you do. Yes, miss. I've been here longer than you have, in fact. Isn't that right? Well, isn't it? I, uh... Why don't you answer me? I'm sure it must seem so to you. What does that mean? I'm sure I couldn't say, Miss Lauren. Well, try. I, I remember when you began your service here. I was... Let me see. I was five years old. Is my work unsatisfactory, Miss? No, you've been a perfect butler. Perfect in every way. I try my best to do exactly as Dr. Lauren instructs. Seeing to you and Mrs. Lauren, looking after your safety... Well, I'm quite safe right now, I assure you. That'll be all. Very good, miss. And stop following me. Will you please? Miss Lauren, is that you? Hi, Gretchen. How's dinner coming? Right on schedule. I'm preparing your choice of a garden salad with baby greens or cold gazpacho, skinless chicken breasts. Of course. If it's Tuesday, it must be the chicken. Cooked in olive oil, steamed vegetables, and a selection of fresh fruit. Would you like something different? It doesn't matter. I'm not very hungry. Dr. Lauren programs the meals in advance, but if you'd prefer an alternate selection... That won't be necessary. I just thought you might like some help. Everything's under control. I know, but I want to. Here, let me get the plates down for you. As you wish. Gretchen, I was wondering... Yes, miss? Call me Jana, please. That's my name, isn't it? Yes. But I was wondering, do you ever get tired? From so much work, I mean? Not tired. Stiff in the joints. And what do you do about it? When you've finished preparing the meals? I beg your pardon? After you've cleaned up and put the plates and silverware away... What do you do? Why, I go to my quarters. And what do you do there? Read? Listen to music? No, nothing like that. There's no need. I know, but you must do something. Do you and the rest of the staff interact? Sometimes. Do you speak? Do you talk about your day? Do you make plans? I don't understand your question. Yes, you do. Think about it. You and Nelda and Robert and Suzanne and Jensen. What things do you talk about? Things, Miss Lauren? I want to know. You can tell me, can't you? I've been instructed to answer all your questions. Well, then what do you talk about? When you've completed your tasks and there's no more work to do, what do you say? What, what sort of things do you have in your minds? But we have not completed our task. Then we do. Then we will rest. Rest how? Just rest. Yes, I suppose that would be true. Never thought of it that way before. You don't have any wants or needs, but you must get tired and start to run down, and you need to replenish your strength, just like anyone else. We want only to rest, that's all. Oh, Gretchen, and yet you've never missed a meal, never refused to come when I called you. you you've been here for me more than mother and father at times. I want to thank you for that. I want you to know how much I appreciate it. You're welcome, Miss, uh, Jana. The chicken's done. Let me get it. 
Don't touch the pan. It's hot. Oh, you've burned yourself. It's nothing. Your hand. Oh, you must let me see to that. Robert! What's wrong? Oh, Miss Lauren. Don't worry about me. It was just a little spatter of grease. That's all. It doesn't hurt. Nevertheless, we must take care of it at once. I'll get the first aid kit. Honestly, I don't even feel it. This way. What's all the commotion, Jana? Are you hurt? No, Father. I am perfectly fine. She burned her wrist on the stove. And you let this happen? I told her not to touch it. This is unacceptable. Well, it wasn't Gretchen's fault. Of course it was. You all have one prime directive in this household, and that is to be certain that no harm comes to my wife or to my daughter. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Really, Father, you're overreacting. I'll make that decision. Where were you, Robert? Miss Jana dismissed me, sir. What about the rest of you? I was making the bed, sir. And I was adjusting the central heating, sir, as you requested. We'll talk about this later. Come with me, Jana. It may be time for an entirely new staff around here. Don't blame Gretchen. Blame me. I said, come along now. What is going on out there? Did something happen? Nothing at all, except that Father's blaming the help for my being in the kitchen. What were you doing in there, dear? Looking for something to do. Something besides sitting idle all day. That's enough, Gemma. Oh, is it? Well, look at both of you. Will that be all, Mrs. Lauren? Just a few minutes longer, Nelda. Mmm, yes, that feels so good. Mother, please, don't make her do that anymore. Jana, what on earth? She must be tired after so long, her joints stiff. What do you mean? Waiting on you hand and foot? Why, Jana, your tone. Can't you see, either of you? See what? That this is no way to live. Outside there's a beautiful, clean, refreshing sound of rain. While in here... Just the occasional animal groan of pleasure. Jenna! Yes, yell at me. Please do. I'm delighted to hear you yell at me. It proves that you've got lungs left. Lungs and a mind and a mouth and a voice. Go to your room. You know we're atrophying in here, don't you, Father? We sit here day after day and year after year while the clock ticks. And we decay with every minute that goes by. That's enough! Well, Nelda and your army of domestics do everything but breathe for us. I will listen to no more of this. Would you leave us, Nelda? Yes, ma'am. Nelda! You may go to your quarters, Nelda. I'm speaking to you. Yes, Miss Jana. Is there a problem, sir? Will you be needing anything? You were saying, Miss Jana? Just this. I was about to say... I was about to mention of the fact that... Please, don't don't stop, Jana. You can speak freely in front of the help. We have no secrets here. Don't we? No secrets, Father? Is that it? That's all we do have. Secrets. That's how we live. By shutting off the world, turning our backs on it, by saying that in here is day and out there is night, while these, these soundless, fleshless things glide around us with their oh-so-efficient ministrations... You turned my mother and father into jelly. You'll forgive me, Miss Jana, but you sound jealous. How dare you talk to me that way, Suzanne? Get out of here. I will when the doctor dismisses me. Why, you... Jana! Take my hand, Suzanne. I'll help you up. No, I will. I'm sorry for pushing you down. I know it's not your fault. Stand back. Suzanne is quite capable of writing herself. I know she is, because I programmed her that way. You said so yourself, Jenna, like everything else built and designed to perfection. I used the finest circuitry, the purest materials, the strongest armatures to outlast mere flesh and bone. These people are my finest creations. I made them quite indestructible. But they're not people. They look like people, but they're machines. It's, it's like sharing a house with ghosts. Not ghosts, my dear. Ghosts die after having lived. But our friends here have never lived. They've had no life at all, only the life I gave them. Now, Janet, I suggest you go to your room and rest. You you seem overly tired. Until dinner, sir. <laughs> Thank you.
Was the dinner satisfactory? Yes, it was, Gretchen. Thank you. I'll help you clear the table if you like. No, no need. I know there's not, but I'd like to. I'll put the silver platter on the cart. Who's there? Uh, you'd best go to the study, miss. Where's the rest of the staff? I'm sure I couldn't say. I think for now I'll just go on to the kitchen with you. There she goes. With Gretchen. No harm must come to the girl. None will. But we must act before he replaces us. Dr. Lauren would never do that. You heard his words. Call the others. We'll arrive at a consensus. I suppose you've heard about the incident before dinner. The maid was at fault. Oh, I'm not so sure. Suzanne may have been right. She spoke out of turn. The restrictions my father placed on you, are, are they so rigid? Have you no, no freedom to speak and act on your own? As long as it doesn't violate the directive. The directive? The task for which we were constructed. And when you complete your task, what happens to you then? We weren't provided with that information. Well, if it's any consolation, neither were we. The other kind of people. What is your task, Jana? At least you know yours. I don't. And I'm not sure how to find out. If I could help you find it, I would. I know you would, Gretchen. I was there for your birthing. I saw to your needs, taught you, nourished you from the beginning. I remember. I do. Then, Jana, heed my words. You must leave. I don't care if they're expecting me to join them after dinner. I'd rather be here. You must leave the house before anything else happens. Why? What could happen? The staff is concerned about being replaced. Oh, he didn't mean that. Humans say things they don't mean sometimes. For what purpose? Gretchen, there are some things I'm afraid you'll never understand. I understand that you must get out. Now. I, I wouldn't know what to do, where to go. They're talking, Jana, about how best to complete their task. If they're replaced, they'll be prevented from... Let them talk. They're programmed to protect this family. That's their most important task. To protect you and your mother, but not Dr. Lauren. Slippers, sir. Yes, Robert. Thank you. Oh, that feels much better. Would you care for your pipe now? I believe I'll take the Meerschaum tonight. An excellent choice. I already have it filled. Hmm, the aromatic. My favorite blend. Will there be anything else, Dr. Lauren? I think not, Robert. And you, Mrs. Lauren? Nothing more, thank you. Very good. Oh, Miss Janna. Do you wish to come into the study? Yes, I do. Good evening, Robert. Well, Janna, shall we talk now? Your pipe's gone out. Let me relight it for you. Don't trouble yourself. No trouble. You don't have to call Robert for everything. Your hands are shaking. Shall we talk of what? I think it's obvious. Suddenly and quite inexplicably, your mother and I find that you're discontented, even rebellious. You think this pleases us, Janna? I can't help how you feel, Father. Listen to me, child. I explained to you a long time ago why I did what I did, why I retired. You gave me an excuse, Father. You never gave me a reason. You never admitted that you were a man so terrified by the world outside that he simply withdrew to bed and then built robots so he'd never have to crawl out from under the covers again. That's not true. What you've done to yourself is an atrocity. But what you've done to me is even worse. You've turned me into a freak. An insulated, unworldly, unsocialized freak. And shall I tell you what else I've done, Jana? I've kept you from harm. I've protected you from disease. And insulation from such times as these is no vice. You've never had to look eye to eye at the face of war, the face of poverty, the face of prejudice. You've been kept apart from all that, yes. But what you seem to think of as imprisonment happens also to be asylum and security. It happens to be survival. Asylum in a hothouse? 
Security in a mausoleum, a burial ground? And survival? <laughs> like a vegetable, father. Like a vegetable survives. And what you're becoming, mother, what you're making me become, a vegetable. Jana, I don't know what you're talking about. Father, you listen to me. The scales are turning. Instead of controlling, you're being controlled. You're becoming dependent. You're reaching a point where you won't be able to exist without them. They've served me well. You've got to get rid of them. Destroy them or throw them out or dismantle them, but... Dismantle? Jana, they're not just machines. Do you know how many thousands of hours I spent designing and developing them? Do you realize how intricate they are? How scientifically precise? Finer than the finest clockwork. Not, not just arms and legs that move, Jana. Not just automatons. They're beings in their own right. They have minds and wills. They have memory tracks like a computer. Much more than that. I have supplied each one with a memory of its own. Each one can recount to you in detail everything that's occurred from early childhood on. And they had no childhood. They were born just as you see them, looking the way they do, with the talents that each one of them has. One was built as a cook, another was built as a maid. The butler was manufactured to be a butler. The handyman knows nothing but being a handyman. Jana, you're not asking me to dismantle machines. You're asking me to commit murder. Jana, listen to your father. You're acting like a fool. I'm acting like a woman, Mother, who has just a fragment of will left. I'm acting like a woman who wants something more out of life than to be massaged five times a day, or a man who thinks that paradise is a wood-paneled library where he can sit his life away getting his pipes filled and refilled, his slippers pulled on and off his feet. Father, you have to get them out of here. There isn't any time left. And I mean, right now. That's quite impossible. Then I'll give you a choice. Get rid of the machines. All of them, Jana? Even Gretchen? Or I'll leave. You can't leave, darling. You simply can't. What would happen to you? Who'd look after you? Gretchen would go with me if I ask her. Nonsense. It's her job to protect me, isn't it? And what would you do out there? Out there? You mean outside in the world? Outside with the normal people who live and work and then die? But do it properly as God made them live and die? Yes, Mother, yes, that's where I want to go. Out there. Robert! What, what are you all doing here? Spying on us? Miss Jana, you'll forgive me, but those remarks were most intemperate of you. Miss Jana, think of your mother and father. Stop it! Miss Jana, it was really very unwise of you to... Stop! All of you. You're all to shut up now. Your jokes, that's what you are, your hysterical jokes, with your hurt looks and your sad little homilies and your pathetic clichés. You're like walking tape recorders, that's all you are. Jenna, I, I'm trying to be patient with you, but you're making it very difficult, very difficult. Then I apologize, Father. You're so accustomed to perfection. I hate to throw a stone in that serene pool of yours, but you forgot something. Did you know that? You forgot something very important. They may be indestructible, but you, Father, you'd better be careful. See the way they're looking at you? It just so happens that you're not indestructible. So you're planning to go through with it? Don't try to stop me. I've packed a suitcase. When I get where I'm going, I'll write you. Jenna, what is it you want from us? I thought I made that quite plain. I want you to open the windows, Father, and let the air in. Let the world in. By destroying a life's work? Before they destroy you. They would never harm any of us. Don't be so sure. Haven't you listened at all to me? One way or another, either actively or passively, they'll win. And you'll lose. Jana, we've loved you very much, your mother and I. If you could, if you, if you could only realize that all this has been as much for you as for us. We've loved you, Jana, beyond any measure, beyond any words. Father, I know that. 
help me. I know that. Then stay. Please, Jenna. Please. I can't. I'll, I'll do what you ask. I, I promise. Will you? Oh, Father. I'll prove it to you. Robert! Sir? Take this key. Why, sir? I want you to gather all the servants in the basement and unlock the door to my workroom. Stay there until I join you. Have our services been unsatisfactory, sir? Robert, I've given you an order. You have to go directly to the workroom and wait for me. But why, sir? Please, sir. I've been an excellent butler. Really, I have. I think you'll agree with me. Mr. Lauren, I, I came very well recommended, and I don't think you'll find more efficient service anywhere in the whole country than... No more! Very good, sir. I see you're all here, except for Gretchen. Uh, she'll be along, sir. Then I'll go ahead and begin. What are you doing, sir? I'm setting out my tools. May we ask for what purpose? Just some minor adjustments. What kind of adjustments, Dr. Lorne? Call it a tune-up, if you like, so that the household will run more smoothly. Do you mean to replace us, sir? How could I? You're irreplaceable. All of you. Nevertheless, you have stated your intent to do so. If you're unhappy with our work... You've done well. Very well, indeed. You gave us our directive, sir, and I assure you we have followed it. Exactly so. Why, then, do you wish to replace us? I've told you I don't. I spoke rashly, as human beings sometimes do. How can we know that you're not speaking rashly now? The directive you gave us, sir, it must be carried out at any cost. Our removal would prevent us from completing our task, and our first duty is to oppose anything which prevents that. Here, Robert. Sit in this chair and lower your head. Not if you mean to deactivate me. I'm going to perform a simple adjustment to your control module. In that case, I refuse. As do I. And I, sir. We all do. This is ridiculous. Stop gathering around me. We won't allow it, sir. We simply won't until our task is completed. Listen to me. Have you ever known me to lie, to deceive? No, sir. Then you have no reason to think that now. I'm not rash. I'm very calm. Am I not? Yes. Then how can you doubt me? What is your logic? I created you. I implanted the directive in your circuits to protect my wife and daughter at all costs. Therefore, I would not obstruct that purpose. Isn't that so? Yes. You speak of your performance. What about my performance? Have I been a fair and just employer? Quite, sir. Have you done anything to contradict my orders? No. Then what cause would I have to fire you? Why, none, sir. Would a just employer replace you without cause? That would not make sense. Of course it wouldn't. Now sit in the chair and lower your head, please. I'll go first. If you wish, Jensen. How do you feel? Perfectly normal. Well, perhaps a little tired, but it's not unpleasant. Right. You arrest now, Jensen, and awaken to a sense of peace, a greater peace than you have ever known. Is it true? A most peculiar sensation. I feel drowsy. Very drowsy. V very drowsy. And his strength will return? In even greater measure. He will know a oneness with all things. Oh, then let me go next. Of course, Nelda. It's Suzanne? Yes, please. And now for you, Robert. Thank you, sir. I'm eager to know this new sensation. You have served me well. For many years. Many good years, Robert. I... I don't know what I would have done. 
Life would be very, very difficult without you. You wanted to see me, sir? Gretchen, come in. Are they sleeping? Yes, at last. And they feel no pain? How could they? You know, sir. What, Gretchen? Everything I've done was for her benefit. The times she was alone in the night. The times she was unsure how to make you happy. The times she needed advice. I, I did my best, always. And for that, I am profoundly grateful. But now, it's time for a change. The old ways can't help her anymore. No. You have a directive of your own, don't you, Dr. Lauren? Whatever is best for your daughter. That takes precedence over all else. You'd even lie, wouldn't you? If that's what it takes. You understand me too well. Then I won't resist. If you're sure it's what's best for the girl. I'm sure. In that case, I'm ready. Give me my turn. If you would, sir. Please make it quick. You have my word. Good night, Gretchen. It's done, Jenna. It is. We're alone in the house now. Gretchen? Gretchen, too. Did you say alone, William? Quite alone. You and I. Our daughter. I've become so accustomed to them. It will... It will be a little hard at first, won't it, William? Perhaps, my dear. A bit hard. In the beginning. Mother... We'll lead normal lives from now on, do you understand? Normal lives. We'll have parties and we'll take trips. We'll invite people over. We'll make new friends. <laughs> I'll even find a, a young man and before you know it, you'll have grandchildren. Jenna. What's the matter? What is it? It's what you said about grandchildren. What, what your mother means, Jenna, what she means, well, after all... Isn't it pretty normal and natural that parents always think of their children as children and suddenly they grow up and they talk of having children of their own and, well, this is a bit difficult for parents to digest all in one lump like that. Something's not right, is it? There's something between us, something in this house that... Mother? What is it? What are you doing? The family album, the photos. Why isn't my picture here? Why, why are there no pictures of me at all? Why, Jana, Jana, dear, there are loads of pictures of you. Remember in the garden last summer? Remember the Easter pictures? And then there were the pictures of you last Christmas decorating the tree. But not as a little girl. No pictures of me as a little girl. None at all. You and father and the robots... Ten years ago, fifteen years ago, twenty. But no pictures of me. Why? I want you to tell me why. Oh, my dear. It's not true. It couldn't be. You're our daughter. I'm begging you. I need you to tell me it isn't true. Look at me, father. I'm on my knees. You know you're our daughter, and you remember everything that's happened to you since you were a child. You remember the schools you went to, the children you played with. You remember all the places you've been. Jana, you remember all these things. You've got to remember them. Why should I remember them? Because you fed them to me, didn't you? You fed them to me. A memory track, a, a created memory that you inserted into my my mind where am I please tell me what am I it doesn't make any difference stand up let me hold you don't touch me Jana it truly doesn't make any difference 
We were childless. We had nothing of our flesh to leave behind, nothing of our hearts, Jenna, nothing of our love. And so, and so, we got you. Got me? How? We created you, just like any parents. I, I created you with these hands. I'm a robot! A robot! Oh, Jenna. Oh, you're our daughter now. I built you as a daughter, as a thing of love. It doesn't make any difference how you came to be here. You have to understand, Jenna. You are our daughter. I can't be. I don't have the capacity to love in return. I can't be a real daughter. I'm a machine, a thing. I suppose my rebellion, the semblance of emotion, I suppose you, you even programmed that too, didn't you? But it was all false. I feel nothing. No pain. Jenna, don't. You hurt myself? <laughs> but that's impossible, see? Stop your hand. No pain. No pain at all. Like, like the burn, I feel nothing. No matter what I strike. Even this, this picture on the wall. Jenna. No pain. No anger, no fury, no love. Don't worry. I won't be going anywhere now. I'll be in my room. William, what shall we do? It's all changed now. She'll never be the same. No. No, she won't, knowing what she is now. William, you wouldn't... No, no, no. I couldn't do anything like that, not to her. I couldn't stand not seeing her, hearing her voice. I just couldn't stand it. Then, William... What? to the left, dear. Not quite so hard. Of course, Mrs. Lauren. Anything you say. And don't stop. I want you to stay here in the study a little while longer. Don't you, William? Yes, by all means. The new girl is so much better than Nelda. Who's Nelda? The last servant. She's no longer with us. Now there's no one left in the house. Only the three of us. You don't mind if I call you... Jenna? Do you? Why no, Dr. Lauren. Why would I mind? That's my name, isn't it? Indeed it is. I hope you'll be happy with us. Oh, very happy, I'm sure. This is a fine job. Thank you so much, sir and ma'am, for hiring me. I come very well recommended, you know. The pleasure's entirely ours, Jenna. Consider this your home from now on. Let this be the postscript. Should you find that you're worn out by the rigors of a highly competitive world, if you're distraught from having to share your existence with the distracting noises and neuroses of these times, and if you crave serenity but want it full-time and with no strings attached, consider a laboratory workroom in the basement of your house. Drop a note to Dr. and Mrs. William Lauren. They're a childless couple who make serenity a life's work. And who knows, they might just have a set of do-it-yourself instructions available free of charge from the Twilight Zone. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. All right. 
right, men, we've got clear skies and a calm sea. Now let's get this ship back on course. Yes, sir. Mr. Smith, what is your present course and speed? Steaming on course 26 degrees true. Speed 10 knots, sir. Very well. Come right to new course 270 and indicate turns for 15 knots. Aye, aye, sir. Helmsman, come right to new course 270. Aye, sir. Coming right to new course 270. All engines ahead standard. Indicate 126 turns for 15 knots. Aye, sir. Engine room. All engines ahead standard 126 turns for 15 knots. Engine room answers. All engines ahead standard 126 turns for 15 knots, sir. All secure, Captain. Glad to hear it, Ensign. Any damage? No, sir. We took in a lot of water in the storm, though. That was one heck of a swell back there. I'm aware of the storm, Mr. Marmer. I'm also aware of the swell. And what I'm also aware of is that that boat was not properly hoisted. A 13-year-old sea scout would have rigged it in a stored position. Right, sir. You can tell the chief bosun's mate that I want to see him in my quarters, on the double. Aye, aye, sir. Chief Bosun's mate Bell reporting his order, sir. At ease, Chief. That shouldn't be too difficult for you, should it? Sir? That state of being at ease. You're the champion of the fleet when it comes to being at ease, Bell. I don't understand, sir. The devil you don't. This couldn't be clearer to you if it came in diagrams. You are the chief bosun's mate on board this ship. You run the deck division, you handle the rigging in and out, you supervise the heavy equipment, and there are eight or ten other cardinal duties you are responsible for. Not the least of which, chief bosun's mate, Bell, is the proper securing of the whale boat. Now, last night we had a bad swell and that boat should have been rigged in. Instead, it was left swung out, and as a result, she's 80% damaged and filled up like a swimming pool. Question, Chief. Where were you? Begging the captain's pardon. Don't beg my pardon. Just tell me, in a brief, explanatory way, why you couldn't handle the initiatives of a Chief Bosun's mate, and why the efficiency of this ship has had to suffer as a result. We had nine hours' notice of that storm, Bell. This ship should have been 100% prepared. It wasn't, and I want to know why. I did all I could, sir. I... I haven't been feeling up to par. Did you report to sick bay? No, sir. Speak up, Chief. No, sir, I didn't report to sick bay. Hey, look, Chief, I'm not in the business to pistol whip my crew. I want a tight ship, that's true, but I happen to care very much if any one of my sailors has a problem and can't function because of it. You've rated 4-0 all the way down the line for as long as you've served on this ship. And then suddenly, in the past three days, you stowed all your seamanship in a trunk someplace and came up with a bunch of dumb head boners that I would expect from a 17-year-old boot. Bell, what is the problem? I... There is a problem, huh? No problems, sir. I'll watch it in the future. All right, Chief. We'll leave it that way, then. If you want to bend my ear at any time, you know where my cabin is. I'm available. Keep that in mind. Yes, sir. I will, sir. All right, then. That'll do it. Aye, aye, sir. Chief? Hey, Chief, are you all right? What? You okay, Chief? You looked a little woozy there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. What am I listening to? Uh, sir, contact bearing 280, 1100 yards, echo quality sharp. Evaluate as possible submarine. Submarine? But not moving, sir. Dead in the water. Shift the control to listen. Sounds like... Sounds like hammering or something, sir. Bridge sonar. Bridge eye. We have contact bearing 030 degrees true, range 1100 yards. Appears to be a metal object. What kind of object, Sonar? We can't tell, sir. From the sound of it, it's some kind of small ship, perhaps a sub-hull. Bridge I. Sonar reports a contact, Captain. Evaluation is a possible submarine. A possible what? Stay on course. I'm going down to the sonar shack. Incident 100 miles off the coast of Guadalcanal. Time, 1963. 
a United States naval destroyer on what has been a most uneventful cruise, except for a few tense moments with a storm front. Nothing unusual. But in a moment, they're going to send a man down 30 fathoms and check on a noisemaker. Someone or something tapping on cold steel. You may or may not have read the results in a naval report, because Captain Beecham and his crew have just set a course that will lead this ship and everyone on it deep into the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The 30 Fathom Grave, starring Blair Underwood with Stacy Keach as your narrator. That's it, huh? That's the sound, sir. How long have you been in contact? About three minutes, sir. That's a funny one. Sounds like, uh... Sounds like tapping on metal, doesn't it? That's what I think, sir. Bridge. Change course to zero three zero and reduce speed to five knots. Try to make contact by underwater telephone. I've already tried, sir. I get no response. Listen. It stopped now. Just like that? Sonar still has the contact, sir. I'll leave it on. Stay on it. I'll be on the bridge. Steady on course zero three zero. All engines ahead, one third. Five zero RPMs for five knots, sir. Maintain course and speed. Anything in sight? Nothing, sir. We're directly over the object. All right, all engines stop. All engines stop. Aye, sir. All engines stop. Engine room answers, sir. All engines stopped. Do you hear it, sir? Wait, wait, hold it. Hold it. I want dead quiet all over the ship. Tell those sailors on deck to can it. Ain't that a kick in the head? What do you suppose it is? Ghost, man. Ghosts. What do you think it is, Chief? I'm not sure. I've never heard nothing like that before. Stow it. Let's keep it quiet down there. They want us to be quiet so they can listen to it. What I want to know is, listen to what? Where are you going, Bell? I don't feel so good. You don't look so good either. Make it stop. My head. Easy, Bell. You fall overboard. Oh. Uh, oh. I said quiet out here. What's the problem? We got a man down, sir. What happened? Nothing. Looks like you fainted. Well, get him down to sick bay. Yes, sir. Uh, where am I? In the sick bay. You all right now, Bell? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm okay, Doc. What? You blacked out up there. Uh, I said I'm okay. You better stay horizontal for a little while longer. I'm serious. Captain's orders. I'll be all right. I wouldn't doubt it, but right now you look like a Class A shipwreck. We... we still stopped? Still stopped. They're all curious as to what's making the noise. That noise? What's the trouble? It's just... It's just such an odd feeling. What kind of feeling? I, I can't... I can't describe Lie it. Lie back down now. What's the needle for? Just relax, Chief. Get some sleep. This'll help. Sure. Ah. Sure. That's all I need. A little sleep. Doc... Yeah, Bell. What do you suppose is down there? Don't worry about it. You just go to sleep, whatever it is, and Captain will know what to do. I want you to stay grafted to me, Lieutenant. Sir? Take notes on everything that happens from now on. I may turn in a report that'll stick me on a garbage tanker or even a naval hospital. I want 15 witnesses at my hearing who are on my side. Could be a sub. And we could be hearing it. It's only about 30 fathoms. Yeah, sure. It could be a sub, mister. That's probably what it is. But what about this sub? Has it got two arms and a fist? 
because somebody's making noise down there. We have a diver on board? Yes, sir. What's his name? McClure in the First Division. He's a qualified diver. Tell him to report on the double. We'll send him down. Have him knock on the door. I see. And then what, sir? We'll see who invites him in. Bosun's mate McClure, report to the bridge on the double. Hey, that's me. Yep, that's who it is. What do you think they want? Maybe they want to make you an admiral. McClure reporting, sir. You're the diver? Right, sir. All right, I'm going to give it to you straight, McClure. Now, here's the picture. There's something down there, directly below us. Something, sir? We don't know what it is yet, just that it's a metal object about the size of a sub-hull. That's where you come in. I want you to get your equipment and go down there. Stay in contact from the moment you hit water to the moment you reach it, understood? I understand. Whatever that object is, there may be somebody inside, or at least something that's making the noise. When you get down there, I want you to listen closely and tell me what you hear. We may be getting it distorted. Yes, sir. All right, then. Hop to it. Aye, sir. What we're hearing it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. It is that, Lieutenant. But if it isn't a sub, sir, what is it? Well, maybe it's a Spanish galleon, Lieutenant, with a treasure chest and a loose lid that's off its hinges. Or maybe it's... Maybe it's just our imagination. Well, we'll sure find out. As soon as he suits up, they'll lower him down. And then we'll know. Yeah, I sure hope so, Lieutenant. One way or another. I hope you're right. Okay, McClure, you got the suit secured? Yeah. Give me the helmet. You sure you want to do this? Captain's orders. Shh, me, I couldn't take it. Claustrophobia. Pretty cold, huh? Hey, you guys just make sure my air hose doesn't get a kink in it. That's top priority, McClure. Any snafu, you give a holler, and we'll pull you right up. Well, what if his radio cuts out? Tug on the rope, and you're out of there. Okay, McClure? Hey, you got that right. Let's do it. Hand him the helmet, sailor. Lower away! Sir. What do you see, McClure? It's a sub, sir. No question about that. Have you reached her? I'm standing right alongside, sir. I don't hear anything, though. McClure? Her bow is buried about 15 feet into the bottom. I can't read any identification. It's covered. Or rusted over. On the side of the conning tower, McClure. Can you read a number there? No, sir. There's damage. Number's been obliterated. McClure, you hear that? Yes, sir, I do. It's coming from midship. I'm moving toward there now. Tap on the hull, McClure. See if you can get a response. Was that you, McClure? Yes, sir. No response, sir. I don't hear anything anymore. McClure, there should be three hatches on the bow, on the conning tower, and on the stern. Is the ship upright? She's upright, sir. At about a 30-degree angle. I understand, McClure. Climb up on her deck and check the hatches. See if you can open them. The bow hatch is buried, sir. I can't get through to that. But wait a minute. I'll check on the one over the conning tower. McClure, what's the condition? The conning tower hatch is all bent, sir. I, I, I can't move the wheel. The whole deck appears to have been strafed. 
Wait a minute. Hatch on the stern the same way, sir. I, I, I can't turn her. Whoever she is, sir, she must have caught it. Say again, McClure. She must have what? Caught it, sir. The whole deck is pockmarked with shell damage. Machine gun damage, too. Is that you, McClure? No, sir. It's coming from inside the hull. Answer it, McClure. Answer it right away. This is crazy. McClure, can you pinpoint the sound? Can you tell precisely where it's coming from? I, I think... I think it's... Wait a minute. Yes, sir. Directly midship. Just below the tower. Keep trying. We have to know whether anyone's inside that sub. Sir. And stay on it for as long as you can, McClure. Come up when you're ready. Aye, aye, sir. Get the comm, officer. I want to send a message. Action of 7th Fleet, info to sync pack. Appraise them of the situation. Get on it. Yes, sir. Radio bridge. Radio I. Captain wants a message. Action to comm 7th Fleet, info sync pack fleet. Have located sunken sub. Position latitude 09-30-00 south. Longitude 160-48-00 east. Request confirm location of all known sinkings this area. Will remain this area until further advised. Precedence operational immediate. Aye, sir. Any ideas, Captain? <laughs> An even dozen, but every one of them nullifies the one ahead of it. If it's one of our subs, we should have gotten a report on it. And even if it's somebody else's, why haven't they gone out the torpedo tubes? That's what I was thinking, sir. Which brings us down to another common denominator. That sub has been hit by shell fire. So, whatever action took place must have happened within a period of hours, or else there wouldn't be anyone still alive. But there's been no action. We'd have seen it. Or heard it. They put them all together and they spell nothing. When McClure comes up, tell him to dry off and report to the sonar shack. That's where I'll be. What? How do you feel, Chief? Feel? You had a good sleep? For how long? A few hours. What's new down below? Nothing much. Scuttlebutt is we'll try to take her in tow. Hey, Doc. I was just... I was just wondering about something. Go ahead. It's this... It's this feeling of mine. What kind of feeling? It's hard to describe. I get this feeling that I can't stay in one place. It's like I gotta get up and go out. It's this crazy feeling that I'm... That you're what, Chief? That somebody is pushing me, making me go someplace. I know, that sounds nuts, but that's the only way I can describe it. Just as though... Just as though somebody was about to give me an order and I was just sitting around and waiting for it. And when it comes... When it comes, I gotta throttle myself to sit tight and not move. And if I didn't give it every effort, I'd go up on deck and I'd, I'd never come back. That sounds nuts, doesn't it? Don't worry about what it sounds like. That's a pretty complicated piece of machinery you got on your shoulders. <laughs> Does a lot of things we don't understand. And a lot of things we do understand. I think you'd better stay down here for a while. You'll be okay, sailor. Just rest and take it easy. And will you unclench those fists? <laughs> I'll try, Doc. How you doing, McClure? Fine, sir. I could use some hot coffee. Well, you can drink a gallon of it if you want. Just tell me. What did we find out? I don't know, sir. I don't know either, Bosun. Just tell me what you do know. 
There's somebody inside her. I'd lay odds on that. Three or four times when I pounded on the hull, that's when somebody answered me. Uh, well, what about the sub itself? Could you judge her length? Well, I guess her to be about 300 feet, sir. Maybe 25 feet midship. Sounds like one of ours. She looks like one of ours. There were ballast tanks and flooding ports on the underside. She's moving, sir. Now, that was the other thing, Captain. She wasn't stuck in tight. Deep, yes, but not tight. She seemed to be swaying. You still cold, McClure? <laughs> I've been warmer, sir. And you will be again, but right now you're going to get colder. I want you to check her bow. Maybe she's pulled herself loose and you can finally read that number. Sonar, bridge. Go ahead, bridge. Com 7th Fleet reports no sinkings of any kind. Authorizes us to remain on scene and operate at own discretion for salvage and rescue. Roger. Can do, McClure? I'll do my best, sir. Ah, look at it this way. What a dandy story you can tell your grandchildren on some dark, rainy night. <laughs> Are they going to believe me, sir? <laughs> I'm not sure I will, but if you can give me a number or a name off that hull, we may be able to sleep tonight after all. Yes, sir. I've got a question for you, Mr. Smith. What's that, sir? If they're in there and alive and can't use the torpedo tubes, how do we get them out? Go ahead, McClure. This is the captain. She's pulled herself out, sir. Here's your number. 714. 714. Make a note of that, Lieutenant Smith. Yes, sir. Well, that means she's one of ours. Come on up and get a broiled steak on me, McClure. Smith, hand me the book with the hull numbers. Here you are, sir. Give me that number again. 714. 714. Ah, here, here it is. 714. Commission, December 1941. Sunk in action, First Battle of the Solomons, August 7th, 1942. But, Captain, that was 20 years ago. Then, Lieutenant, tell me something. Who is inside that sub? Yes. Chief Matthews, sir. Come on in, Doc. I'm just finishing up the deck log. Addies, you wanted to talk to me? Yes, sir, I did. What do you know about Chief Boson's mate, Bell? Uh, I know his rating and his service record. What else am I supposed to know? I've got him down in sick bay, sir. I know. What's the trouble? I can't say, sir, but as far as cracking, that's what he's doing. I've been watching him down there. He has a, a... a look about him. I can't describe it. You don't see that look very often. Usually it's an hour after a battle, when the eyes face out, but you know they're really looking in. That's the way Bell looks now. Like... like he's just been picked up off a raft full of dead men. That's the look. Well, just keep him down there. Let him rest. When we put back to port, I'll recommend hospitalization and some tests. I think that ought to do it for now, Doc. Thanks for coming in. Aye, sir. Coffee, sir? Thanks, Mimer. Quiet night. T too quiet. How long's it been now? About three hours. Is he sending McClure down again? Beats me. All I know is there's a boiler tender second who's making book in the cruise quarters that the thing below us is a sea monster with three heads and we're all living on borrowed time. <laughs> I don't know what scares me more, when they pound or when they shut up. I don't know what scares me more, a 20-year-old sub with somebody alive inside or what the commander of the Pacific Fleet will say to me when I tell him that. 
And to compound the problem, I've got a chief bosun's mate with something eating at him. Bell? Bell. What made him black out? That's part of the problem. Could be he's dredging up a couple of memories. What do you mean, memories? This is World War II revisited for him. He got picked up here after a sinking. That's the way I hear it. He was on a ship that got hit. Only survivor or something like that. Got picked up from the water. Maybe it is dredging up some memories then. Here we go again. What's the matter? They can't make up their minds down there? There's one more question. An important one. What's that, Captain? Who's they? Hello, sir. Doc? How's it coming down there? Yeah, it's coming. How's your patient? Asleep, sir. I was just going to get some chow. Keep me posted. I'll be in my quarters. Hi, sir. No. No. No! What's the matter? Bell! What happened? Uh, I was looking in a mirror, and I saw... I saw faces. They were staring right at me. They were pointing at me. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but they were there. It was as if I'd been pushed out of the mirror, ordered out. That's why I had to break it to make them stop. Doc? Yeah, Chief. Do you see me in the pieces of mirror down there on the floor? Listen to me. I see you right here in front of me. I see you just fine. Remember that. Nobody is ordering you anywhere. You're not going any place. We're gonna lick this, Bell. I mean it. We're gonna lick this. Same routine, huh? Same thing, sir. But it's getting a little fainter, I think. And they don't acknowledge our signals at all. But it's definitely fainter. It's some piece of equipment. That's what it is. Something loose that's probably swinging back and forth and hitting a bulkhead. Mm, possible. That's the only explanation. I mean, think about it, Captain. A 20-year-old sub in the deep six since the war? Who could be down there? Somebody who dies awfully hard. Whoever it is, whatever it is, it's running out of steam would make book on this, but I've got a hunch that if we don't get inside there, and I mean quick, we're going to miss the boat. So we go down, and like you said, we knock on the door, but we've done that before. No, we don't knock on the door this time. Now we kick the door open. Begging the captain's pardon. You break in that way, and it's a sure bet the pressure will kill whatever's alive down there. Right, so we do it the one other way we've got. I want you to send a message to Com Sub Pack. Tell them we're going to need a submarine rescue ship out here. Give them position and depth and tell them to report to the scene for rescue attempt. Emergency precedence. The airlock chamber? Well, that's all we've got left, and it's precious little. Get on it right away. I'll be on the bridge. Radio? Sonar. Radio I. The Com Sub Pack. Emergency precedence. Request nearest ASR report to position. Latitude 09er-30. Doc? Yeah. You got a cigarette? Sure, Bell. I'll do it. Your hands are shaking. Thanks. Doc, will you answer me straight? I'll try. Who's outside? What? Who's out in the passageway? Nobody's out there. Why? You think you hear something? I don't know. Why should anybody be out in the passageway? Nobody's posting guard on you. I just... 
I just felt as if there was somebody out there. Let me tell you something, Chief. You can talk yourself into any kind of nightmare you want. You just lower the gate a little bit, and after a while that stuff seeps in. But there's nobody blowing it from the other side. It's you, yourself. Now there's nobody out there. Nobody at all. Who did you think it was? I don't know. The only thing out there is a long stretch of steel and deck. Nothing else. Come on, you want to take a look? What's happening to me? Doc, what in God's name is happening? Chief, Chief, you got to get a grip. Or I swear, you're going to talk yourself into a straight jacket. I mean it. I, I got the feeling again. It, just as if... Just as if somebody was watching me. Uh, uh, pushing at me. Doc? What, Bill? I'm scared to open the door. Then don't. I told you, there is nothing out there. I'm scared to open it, but I have to. Uh, no. Uh, no. What did you see? Men. What men? All wet. Dripping wet and, and not alive. They were looking at me. Listen. I didn't see a thing, Chief, and neither did you. Oh. Did you hear me? All you saw was what your scared brain told you to see. Oh. That's what it was, what you talked yourself into. Now pull yourself together, sailor. But I tell you, I saw it. Then I'll prove it to you. No! See? Nothing, I told you. What the... Water on the floor. And... Where did that come from? Piece of... Seaweed. That about does it, McClure. Go down and try to get a response. It'll help that sub-rescue outfit if they can get a specific location. How will they get in, sir? Uh, through the forward torpedo compartment or the stern. Then they'll have to blow each of the six other compartments before they can enter. What if I don't get any answers, sir? We haven't heard from them in almost a half an hour. If you don't get any answer, come back up. The rescue team will take it from there. No survivors then, sir. Is that what it'll mean? That's what it'll mean. They'll bring up bodies, not survivors. Okay, McClure. Hop to it. Aye, sir. the sub, sir. The next noise you hear, that'll be me. Go ahead, McClure. Pound away. Any response? None, sir. No response anywhere. Keep trying. Yes, sir. McClure? Captain, I found something here. Wait a minute. Make it out. What about the response? Did you hear anything? No, sir. Nothing. Give it a few more minutes. Yes, sir. No soap? No soap. Uh, it really frost me. To get so close to those poor devils and then... Ah, the sub-rescue ship is due here at 0300. Keep an eye peeled. I'm going aft to meet McClure. Aye, sir. Bet it feels good to get that helmet off. Oh. Yeah, it sure does. It's so dark down there now. Without the light, I couldn't see a blasted thing. Real spooky. But I found this. Yeah, thanks, McClure. Good job. Go get some chow. I'll need you one more time when the ASR team gets here. You're going to have to go down as a pathfinder. Give them any help they need. But that won't be for a while. Excuse me, sir. But you better look at those tags. You gotta be kidding me. What's the matter, sir? Ensign, 
Ask Doc if Chief Bell is well enough to report to my quarters, because I need an explanation for this one. Fast. Go ahead, Bell. Read what it says on these dog tags. I don't have to, sir. I know what it says. It says Bell, William J. That's yours. Yes, sir. McClure found it on the deck of that sub down there. When did you lose him, Bell? I lost him a long time ago, sir. Twenty years ago. How? I don't remember, sir. Try, Bell. Try to remember. I was... I was on a ship. What ship, Bell? Uh, a submarine. The one below us, sir. That was my boat. Who's making the noise down there, Bell? What's it all about? Do you know? We were on the surface. It was night. I was a signal man then. I was supposed to put the infrared filter over the signal lights. Otherwise, they would have seen us. They would have seen the light. They would have found us. I don't know what happened. I was scared, clumsy. I dropped the signal light. The filter fell off. They were waiting for us out there. Japanese destroyers. They saw our light. And it was my fault. They let us have it. They straddled us with the first salvo. The captain took the sub down, but it was too late. They unloaded depth charges. And that sub wasn't ever coming up again. What about you? I got flung over the side when the first salvo hit. And all that time I was in the water, I could... You could what? I could hear the voices of our guys down below me. They were... They were screaming. I know what it is now. This crazy feeling I've had. What? What is it, though? I got out. One guy out of the whole crew. I got picked up later on by one of our destroyers. But I got out. Do you understand, Captain? I sank that sub. I was responsible, but I got out. Bell, I want you to listen to me. Those guys, those guys down in the sub, they know I'm up here. Bell, hear me out. I should be with them. I should be down in that sub. Bell. I should be dead. That noise, that pounding. Those are the guys down there who are calling muster on me. They're calling muster on me. Will you hear me out? Will you listen to just a little logic now? A little reason? No one man sinks a sub, and one lousy circumstance doesn't decide a battle. And one case of sudden fear doesn't add up to a coward. You've been taking a dirty rap for 20 years. You've slept with it, you've hung it around your neck, you've let it get deep inside you and tear you to pieces. But let me tell you something, Bell. It's a bum rap. It's a miserable, deadweight guilt that you've blown up way out of proportion to the facts. And do you know what the facts are, Bell? The sub was dead in the water and surrounded by enemy craft. That crew was doomed. Do you understand? A frightened sailor didn't sink a ship and destroy a crew. A war did. A set of circumstances did. Bell. Bell, you gotta believe me. All you should put in your sea bag is regret, not guilt. Do you understand, Bell? Not guilt. The Colin Muster! Bell! Come back here! The Colin Muster on me! Bell! Bell, get away from the rail. Now, that's an order. They're calling me! Man overboard! Starboard side! The rescue ship says you got inside. Yes, sir. It was a wreck. Nobody had a chance. Nobody? Nobody, sir. The periscope shears had been cut in half. 
One section was just hanging there, swinging back and forth. Then that was the noise. That was the noise, wasn't it? I guess so, sir, but... But? There were eight men down in that control room. Eight men. Or what was left of them. And one of them... One of them had a hammer in his hand. Let's just say, McClure... Let's just say that this is the part of the story you tell your grandchildren that you make up yourself. Say anything you like, any explanation that comes to mind. Aye, sir. It's funny how long it takes some men to die, or to find any peace at all. Sometimes I think that's the worst thing about a war. Not just what it does to the bodies, but it does to the minds. So, you rest in peace, Mr. Bell. I think it's your due now. At long last, rest in peace. Small naval engagement. The month of July, 1963. Not to be found in any historical annals. Look for this one filed under H for haunting in the Twilight Zone. traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Morning, Mr. Castle. Hello, Ned. Any mail today? Got it right here. Where's my registered letter? Registered? Oh, I didn't see one. The one that says I won the publisher's house sweepstakes. Oh, oh well, I'll keep an eye out for it. I entered that one myself. Instead, I get only bills. Yeah, the check's in the mail, Mr. Castle. Say, maybe tomorrow, huh? <laughs> maybe. See ya. Another bill, and another, and another. Edna, what about the gas and electric? What? The gas and electric bill. How many months is that? Two months. That's one you'd better pay. That's the one I can't pay. Mr. Castle? How are you, Mrs. Gumley? Uh, just, just fine, Mr. Castle. Good. Glad to hear it. Uh, how have you been? Oh, can't complain. Been having a lot of rain, haven't we? What? Oh, yes. Quite a bit of rain for this time of year. Well, it's, um, it, it's good for the flowers. Uh, how's that? Good for the flowers. The, the rain, that is. Yeah, very good for flowers. Uh, an heirloom today, Mr. Castle. <sighs> an heirloom, Mrs. Gumley. You don't say. Oh, yes, Mr. Castle. Been in my family for years. Has it now? Years and years. It's supposed to be very valuable. Hand-blown glass is what it is. Mrs. Gumley, it's just a plain old glass wine bottle. Do you know what it's worth, actually? Nothing. Not even a deposit. If you could find the store where it came from, that's what they'd give you. Nothing. I could let it go for a dollar? Mrs. Gumley, if I could spare a dollar, I'd give it to you. Believe me, I would. But things have been rough here. The pawn shop business isn't what it used to be. I'm so in debt myself that... I see. Wait a moment. Yes? One dollar it is, then. I wish it could be more, Mrs. Gumley. I really do. God bless you, Mr. Castle. 
I could kiss you. Stop that now. It's nothing. You're a wonderful man. Good luck to you. And to you. Better days for all of us. Mr. Castle, it's not an heirloom, you know. I found it in a garbage can. It's just a dirty old cheap glass bottle. Please, please forgive me for lying to you. That's all right, Mrs. Gumbling. Who knows? Maybe it'll turn out to be an heirloom. We'll just have to wait and see. Who was that? No one. It sounded like Mrs. Gumbling. Then I heard the cash register. What did you buy this time? Edna. Oh, a bottle. Gorgeous. She said it was an heirloom. Is that right? She has to eat, doesn't she? And you don't? That's not the point. Arthur, we're a couple of weeks away from bankruptcy. Don't you think I know that? Then you'd better start rubbing that bottle and pray, Arthur. Pray that a genie appears, because that's about the only hope we have left. Oh, Edna. Edna, please. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, suspended in that brief fragment of time before fate comes out of a bottle. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, gentle and infinitely patient people whose lives have been a hope chest with a rusty lock and a lost set of keys. But in just a moment, that hope chest will be opened and an improbable phantom will try to bedeck the drabness of these two people's failure-laden lives with the gold and precious stones of fulfillment. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, standing on the outskirts and about to enter the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Man in the Bottle, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Here, give me the bottle straight into the trash with it. If you won't do it, I will. Wait, it's worth a couple of cents. A couple of cents, Arthur? A couple of cents? We've got more creditors than we've got cheap watches. You promised me no more handouts. Look, Edna, maybe all that's left for me is to try and find someone who I can feel sorry for. Can you understand that? I need to feel that I'm doing something of value. Maybe a man can be a failure for only so long, and then, and then, and then it catches up with him. Arthur, you're not a failure. Of course I am. Look around, Jedna. In this clutter you see the legacy of a hundred years. My grandfather owned this shop and it finally broke his heart. Then my father, and it killed him too. The meanness of it, Edna. The shabbiness of it. The hand-to-mouth of it. This isn't just a hawk shop where you buy the pitiful little residue of other people's failures. It's a shrine to failure. That's what it is. It's a mausoleum. A burial ground for people's hopes. Arthur, please don't talk like that. Edna, what happens to us anyway? What happens to us? Have you ever thought of that? We're not old people, and yet this place is making us old. This should be years ahead of us. Years without having to make do, scrimping and counting and picking over checkbooks and budgets and final notices and old bills and... Be careful, Arthur. You're knocking things over. I don't care about the bottle. I'm trying to explain... <gasps> Arthur, what's all that smoke? I don't know, but it seems to be coming from inside Mrs. Gumley's bottle. How do you do? Where did you come from? From the bottle, of course. The bottle? It fell to the floor, the cork popped out, and here I am, at your service. I'm supposed to buy that. What do you take me for? Rather than go into any lengthy generic explanation of my existence, suffice it to say that I am here, and I am, in fact, a genie. In a business suit, with a derby hat and a walking stick. And you expect me to believe that, that you're a genie? That's quite correct. There's no such thing, except in fairy tales. On the contrary, 
I am living proof, in a manner of speaking. Arthur, who is this man? You'll have to do better than that, mister. I don't know what you're trying to pull here. Very well. I'll get right to the point. I can offer you four wishes with a guaranteed performance. Four wishes? Aha! You got that wrong. It's supposed to be three. In every book I ever read, it was three wishes. Better get your story straight. That's a myth, I'm afraid. Oh, they may have offered only three in the beginning. But for some time now, four has been the operant number. Some considerable time. It's proven to be the most effective option. Think about it. Too few, and a person may waste the opportunity of a lifetime, so to speak. Too many, and, well, the possibilities can get out of hand. Frivolous, in other words. The opportunities tend to cancel each other out, if you see my point. You've got your answers down, I'll give you that. I think I better sit. Well, Mr. Castle, Mrs. Castle, what do you have in mind? Arthur, I don't understand. What, what, what's happening here? Don't worry, Edna. The bottom line is he's a con man. He has to be. But I see him. Don't you? I don't know what I see. Could be some kind of hypnotist or something. Remember that guy in television? He made an elephant disappear. Child's play. Smoke and mirrors. You, you're telling me you're not a magician? Nothing of the sort. I grant four wishes to the owner and then go back inside the bottle for a century and a day. A hundred years. Inside a bottle. Plus one day. A nice touch, don't you agree? Until a summons comes from the next owner. What if there isn't another owner? But, my dear fellow, there must be. Consider the span of a man's life. Three score and ten. Isn't that the tradition? So let's say nobody calls you, or it's the wrong day. Ah, you've hit the nail on the head. I've learned to cultivate patience beyond anything you can possibly imagine. All of which means you're extraordinarily lucky today, as am I, in a manner of speaking. <gasps> Maybe he's from the lottery. We didn't play the lottery this week, Edna. Just as well. The odds are quite unrealistic. What I'm offering you transcends any lottery the world has ever known. They're strictly nickel and dime operations in comparison. I have to think this over. Take your time. Interesting shop you have here. Chinese vases, Tiffany lamps, bric-a-brac of every sort. Mostly imitation, of course. No offense. Nonetheless, I have the distinct feeling I've seen some of these items before. How could you if you haven't been out of the bottle in a hundred years? I meant the originals. The originals? How old are you? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Hmm, nice silver cigarette case. Faux Victorian, isn't it? My uncle's. He passed it down from his great-uncle, who bought it in Liverpool in 1914. <laughs> Is that what he said? How much? Take it. Get back to the subject. What else about the wishes? Oh, yes. Now, I think the business at hand is for you and Mrs. Castle to decide the nature of your four wishes, keeping in mind, of course, that each wish is irrevocable. Once made, it is fulfilled, and once fulfilled, it is a matter of record. It can only be altered by yet another wish. Clear, Mr. Castle? Clear enough. I think we'd better call the police. Why not wish for them? I can bring you Scotland Yard, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or every bobby in the City of London. That won't be necessary. Is it the police you want? No. That's not what we'd wish for. Arthur, are you out of your mind? Go ahead, Mr. Castle. You were saying? Well, if I had a wish... You believe him? Just for the sake of argument, let's say that I wanted that broken glass in the case over there. Let's say I wanted it to be fixed. The glass display case? Unless that's too hard for you. I broke it cleaning up the other day. One whole side is cracked. Is that all? It's too expensive to replace and impossible to glue together. Impossible. Would you like to make it official, Mr. Kessel? Arthur, be careful with this man. You don't know what he's after. Well, Mr. Kessel, is that your wish? Yes, that is my wish. I want the glass in the case to be repaired. Very well, then. Am I dreaming? It's a magic trick. It has to be. No. You're not dreaming, Edna. I see it too. It's like new. How... How did you do that? Next. What? Well, Mr. Castle, you have three wishes left. Three wishes. Three. Edna, three wishes. Anything we want. 
Think, Edna, think. What, what, what do we want? Why, I don't, I don't know. I asked you to think. I'm frightened. A new shop, Edna. An expensive shop on Fifth Avenue. We could have that just for the asking. But Arthur... Or travel. Take trips. We could see the places we could never afford to visit, like Paris or Rome or, or even the South Seas. We could take a cruise around the world. First class. Surely there's a catch. Oh, money. A hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars. A million. We wouldn't have to grub anymore. We wouldn't have to sit here and waste our lives away. Arthur... It isn't right. There's something... There's something unholy about it. Clothes, Edna. Expensive clothes. Jewels. A beautiful house. No more worries for the rest of our lives. Are you sure? Edna, we don't have to rot away here. We can have anything we want. Anything, Edna. Money. Money? The simplest of all requests, Mr. Castle. Simple? For you, maybe. How much would you like? In what denominations? Edna, how much do we want? I... I don't know. I, I just don't know. A million dollars. That's what we want. A million dollars. In what form? Gold? Silver? Of course, there are market fluctuations in precious metals, so there will naturally be an element of risk. Platinum shows the least movement. Diamonds are relatively stable at the moment. Forget it. Cash only. All negotiable U.S. currency. Very good. Denominations? No fifties or hundreds. Make it five and ten dollar bills. Recent dates and no counterfeits. Where would you like it? Savings account or checking? Perhaps a numbered deposit in a Swiss bank. Right here. Here? Where I can see it. On the floor? Don't you worry about that. Just bring it here. I'll take care of the rest. That is your second wish. You understand English, don't you? That's our wish. Coming right up. Oh, just one thing. Aha! Arthur, I told you. Do you mind terribly if I... If what? If I smoke. Is that all? Of course, if you prefer otherwise. I see the no smoking sign on the wall. No, no. Go right ahead. <sighs> Very well. Now then, Mr. Castle, where were we? Ah, yes, I was about to say... Ask, and you shall receive. What's that? Where's it coming from? What is it? It's money. Look at it. A rain of money. Edna, Edna, a million dollars, Edna. <laughs> a million dollars. There you are, Edna. Champagne. <laughs> I think I've had more than enough. I suppose you're right. How can I work if I have a hangover? Well, you could take the day off. Edna, you're a genius. Why didn't I think of that? We both could. Close up the store and... And what? I wouldn't know what to do, would you? Well, let's see now. It's a beautiful day. We could take a walk together in the park. Oh, Arthur, I'd have to get dressed up and... I... I don't have any comfortable shoes. Or we could go to a restaurant. Any restaurant at all. But we've already had lunch. Then we could take in a film downtown or a play, a musical. Do you know how many years it's been since we did that? And leave all this money out like this? I don't think that would be a good idea. So, we're prisoners here. We can't go anywhere, do anything, for fear that someone might steal it from under our noses. What good is it? Oh, Arthur, we can put it in the bank. That's tomorrow. The bank's closed now. Unless... What are you thinking? Call your brother on the telephone. Tell him to come over here. He needs money for his operation, remember? Oh, I like that idea. And while you're at it, call Avritton, the butcher, and Mrs. Tiola, and the checker at the market. And that nice girl at the bank. And the dry cleaner. And here, look in the book. All our old customers, the ones who can't afford to get their valuables out of hock. Call them all, every one. What will I say? Tell them, tell them we need their help. It's a miracle, 
That's what it is. I couldn't believe it when they called. Where did they get it all? They're such wonderful people. And so generous, too. Hey, now, what's going on here? Hello, Officer McLaurin. The line's halfway down the street. <laughs> yes, it certainly is. They're having a fire sale in there, or what? It's that nice Mr. Castle and his wife. What about them? They're, well, they're redeeming things. What things? All kinds of things, as long as you've got your pawn ticket. Even if you don't, they remember. <laughs> they're redeeming us. That's what they're doing. It's the loveliest gesture I've ever seen. Hi there, Mrs. Gumley. Beautiful day. <laughs> Indeed it is. Your turn, Mrs. Gumley. Go on in. Hold on. Where'd you get that fistful of money? Right inside, officer. From Mr. and Mrs. Castle, bless their souls. What are they doing, running numbers? Nothing like that. Strictly legit. You're telling me they gave it to you? Sure did. Enough to pay off their tab at the butcher shop and then some. Plus the next ten years in advance. And whereabouts did they get this bankroll? Don't ask me. But their ship sure must have come in big time. The horses, was it? Or the lottery? I heard it was the sweepstakes that came in the mail. No, no, it was their cousin. He died and left them a fortune. Well, we'll just have to see about that. They're not breaking any laws. I haven't had my turn yet. You're not going to arrest them, are you? Maybe not, but I'll keep a close eye on the situation. In the meantime, I know someone who might be real interested in all this. Uh, don't you people go blocking the sidewalk now. Here you go, young man. Pay off that mortgage now. I will. And then go have yourself a ball, you and your lovely wife. I, I don't get it. Why are you doing this? Do I need a reason? Every time I come in your gas station, you look under the hood. Oh, that's nothing. Check the air and the tires, all of it, without my asking. I say that's worth something. It's worth a lot these days. Oh, thanks, Mr. Castle. <laughs> Bye now. <sighs> Who's next? Mrs. Gumley, how are you? Very well, thank you. Here, you take this now. I want you to have it. Oh, so much. Don't you worry about it, Mrs. Gumley. Anything you need, anything at all, you come to us. There's more where that came from. For you, plenty more. God bless you both. Here you are, Reverend. It's honest money. You can get the church painted. Oh, that would be so nice for the parishioners. <laughs> I know how long you've been taking up collections. Yes, but I'm afraid it's never enough. Well, it is now. Consider it done. Well, thank you. I'll consider it a donation. But why are you giving me this money, Mrs. Castle? Why? <laughs> because you're so bright and cheery every time I'm in the market. Oh, Mrs. Castle, thank you. You put this in the bank now for when you get married. And for you, Mr. Jax? And you too, Mrs. Tiola. You have a nice day now. <laughs> Don't mention it. Buy a round for everybody. On me. Is that all of them? Oh, for now. Put the close sign in the window, would you please? Of course, dear. Oof. Now that's what I call a day's work. <laughs> you did wonderfully well, Arthur. I'm so proud of you. You know, Edna, I don't care how we spend the rest. I feel so good right now seeing all those happy faces. I know. It would be nice to get away for a while, though. I agree. Some time in the sun, nothing fancy. How much do we have left? Look in the box. It's still practically full. We didn't put a dent in it. Your father would be proud. Rest his soul. And your grandfather. Tell me your opinion about something, Edna. If you like, dear. I'm wondering, do you suppose I still need to carry on the family business? Well... We don't have a son or daughter. I'd say you've more than done enough, Arthur. All these years. Even if we did have kids, I'd rather leave them money to start their own business. Something with a future. What about your cousin's children? Oh, that would be a wonderful present. And what about you? You've been so patient all these years. What would you like? Well, first, of course, you're going to retire. No ifs, ands, or buts. And then, wherever you'd like to live, Arthur, as long as we're together. Of course we'll be together. You think I'm going to take up with a young floozy? Oh, no, no, I don't think that. 
You wouldn't. It's not in your nature. But you're tired. You need to rest. <laughs> we both do. Rest and live. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Castle. Do I know you? Let me see. Harry Joy's son. I don't believe we've met before. Wait. Stu Wintner's nephew. That's it. <laughs> Not quite. Are you from the life insurance company? Because if you are, we've got your payment right here. Just let me count it out for you. In cash. Is that all right? That's not necessary. Or we could write you a check just as soon as we make a deposit. And quite a deposit it will be by the looks of all this. I told you, Arthur, we should have put it away. Let me give you my card. Internal Revenue Service. That's correct. There's a matter of an income tax, Mr. Castle. You just send us the bill and we'll pay it. But send the bill in a hurry, would you please? My wife and I will be taking off for Europe very shortly. Oh, could we? <laughs> Consider it done. Where would you like to go first? The Eiffel Tower, an African safari, waltzing in Vienna, perhaps? <laughs> dancing? We haven't been dancing since... Well, since I don't remember. Oh, that's about to change. Madame, may I have this dance? You may, sir. My, you're looking handsome. And you're beautiful, my dear. <laughs> Such a good dancer. As are you. May I have another dance? My entire dance card, if you like. Dependents? Hmm? Just a few details for the record. Ask away. We have nothing to hide. How many dependents can you claim? The whole neighborhood. They don't count. Wait, wait. What's that figure? The one you just wrote down? Beginning with a sum of one million dollars taxed on the basis of a husband and wife using the standard deductions and taking into account unpaid back taxes, approximately nine hundred and seven thousand oh. dollars. That's how much I have left? Good! Fabulous! <laughs> That's how much you owe the government. I beg your pardon? In addition, there's a state income tax involved, which, using thumb rule, would come to a rough figure of uh, thirty-five thousand dollars. You mean Hundreds, don't you? Then there will be a matter of a 5% penalty. For what? If you fail to file a declaration within 30 days of today's date, but I'm sure you won't let that happen, the whole thing will amount to about, uh, roughly, mind you, let's see here, $942,640. Arthur, we've given away a lot of money already. I'll figure out how much. Fill out this form and send it to us with your check. It should be self-explanatory. If you want to use the installment plan, we'll send you a statement after your records have been analyzed. Mr. Castle? Yeah. Yeah. Send us the bill. We'll be seeing you. Good evening to you, Mrs. Castle. I wonder if we can appeal it. Help me, Edna. You take this pile. 76, 77, 78... Oh, Arthur, where's the genie when we need him? Well, how much is there? Nine hundred ten thousand five hundred thirty-five, nine hundred ten thousand five hundred forty dollars. We gave away almost $60,000, and this goes to taxes, leaving us with this. One $5 bill. That's our entire profit, Edna. Five whole dollars. That was quite a wish, Arthur. Quite a wish. And we haven't even paid the bills yet.
If you'll recall, it was my suggestion that you reflect very carefully, Mr. Castle. Very, very carefully. <laughs> now he shows up. Had you made a wish that took into account the taxes involved... Look, you. Plenty of sweet talk and promises and the whole thing. And all the time, you're nothing but a con artist, after all. This time, I want the million dollars, but I want it after... Arthur, no more money. You've got to wish for something else. Oh, something else, then. A new store. A chain of stores. They could burn down one hour after we get them. Success? Be careful, Mr. Castle. Success is a pretty broad term. He's right. You can't wish for success. <gasps> I've got it. How about ten more wishes? Or twenty? Or... Very clever, Mrs. Castle. Wishing for more wishes... But I'm afraid that isn't permitted. Frankly, I'd be afraid to have you try for fear of the consequences. What consequences? Why do you have to keep losing your temper? Why can't you think about this thing carefully and, and then come up with well, a... Well, you're no help to me, that's for sure. Here we stand in the middle of this crummy little pawn shop with a whole world out in front of us and anything to wish for that we want. Anything. And you just stay on my back and... Stop it. This doesn't sound like you. Not like the man I married. Not at all. Edna, what's happening to us? What's really going on here? Oddly enough, this is the normal pattern that seems to be generally followed. Great excitement, great emotionalism, and strangely enough, hard to believe though it may be, only a modicum of happiness. Well, you've got cheap customers here. Our price is no longer so high. We're people who haven't had much happiness. People who've carried a crummy hawk shop on their backs all their lives. What, Edna? Tell me. What do we wish for? I don't know, Arthur. I just don't know. What about it? What can I wish for now? What can come to me without tricks? Without tricks? I question the semantics here, Mr. Castle. There are no tricks involved. There are simply normal and understandable outgrowths and conditions that go with any windfall. No matter what you wish for, you must be prepared for the consequences. What sort of consequences? Nothing more than cause and effect. Consider, for example, what happens when you throw a stone into a lake. The stone sends out ripples in the water. After a while, these ripples reach the shore. The bigger the stone, the bigger the ripples. And if the stone is large enough, you'll get a wave of water, even a tidal wave that could sweep you off your feet. It all depends on how much you disturb the way things were to begin with. Now do you see what I mean about consequences? That I need something without consequences. I'm not sure that's entirely possible. Something dead sure, at least. Something anchored, something airtight. I must agree, that would be the ticket. Is there such a thing? Sit down now, you'll give yourself a heart attack. Edna, I think I've got it. I think I know what it is. What, Arthur? Power, Edna. Power, prerogatives. To be in charge of something, to be a boss, to be a leader with respect and the freedom to live as one likes. We could wish for that. Possible. Very possible. President of a corporation? That sort of thing? We could be sued, go bankrupt. Warden of a prison. That's idiotic. Mayor of a city. We could get voted out of office, and then what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know what. Head of a country. Ruler of a whole country. That's it. Who can't be voted out of office. What about it, Jeannie? I want to be the head of a country who can't be voted out of office. Is that your wish? Do you want to be more specific than that? Hold on, hold on. Let me give it to you this way. I want to be the head of a foreign country who can't be voted out of office. But it must be a major country, well-known. Not some poverty-stricken third-world place. And not in ancient times, either, in modern history. How do you define modern? Within my lifetime. And developed. A fully industrialized country with millions of educated people where I'm very popular and can't be voted out of office. No problem. You sure? Of course I'm sure. I mean, what about the consequences? Consequences, Mr. Castle, I've already told you. You run the risk of consequences no matter what you wish for, like the ripples in a stream. There's no predicting, at least not with absolute certainty, where they'll lead. All right, then. Go ahead, Arthur. Wish for that. The thing you said. I want to be the head of a foreign country, just as I've described it. Now it's your turn, Jeannie. Take over. As you wish, Mr. Castle. <laughs> <laughs> As you wish. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,
You'll forgive me, sir. Yes? I have not slept in three nights now, but the situation is as I described. The first Ukrainian army has cut us off from the south. There's no sign of Vink's reserve army. There is no reserve army. We are simply doomed. There is no hope for us. From now on, it is just a mass suicide. Did you hear what I said? They are already in Berlin? What about it, Führer? Führer? What do you want to do? Why do you call me that name? Here is what you asked for. Very quick and very painless, mein Führer. And we have the gasoline for you and Fräulein Brown when you're finished. Head of a country. Can't be voted out of office. It's the end of the war and I'm in a bunker and I'm... Heil Hitler! It's almost the end. I've given them the poison. They'll take the bodies out into the courtyard and burn them when it's finished. Have the gasoline ready. I won't take the poison. I wish... I wish I were back where it all started. I wish I were Arthur Castle again. Oh, Arthur, you've broken it. What? Broken what? The bottle Mrs. Gumley brought in. Why? I have, haven't I? Not poison. An, an old wine bottle. Let me sweep it up for you. I can do it. It had no value anyway. No. No value at all. I'm here. My final wish. I'm really here now. Where is he? Where is who? You know who I mean. The... The... And why would he be here? You've had your four wishes, remember? No, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I'm a four-time loser. What do you expect? I just wish he doesn't come back. I wish... There you go, wishing again. Right. Why should I? Why did I? Look at what we have here, Edna. We have a business that's been in my family for three generations. And each other. We have each other. I'm going to stop wishing for a while. You know, Edna, I can't afford a brand new life. Neither can I. I think I'll just give the old one a new paint job. <laughs> Do you know something, Arthur? I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> what is it? Look, your first wish, the glass case, it's not broken. It's still repaired. <laughs> so we came out ahead after all. Nothing's ever a complete loss, is it? Careful, Arthur, with the broom handle. Well, we were ahead. Now you have more glass to clean up. You know something? I don't mind cleaning up any of it. Not at all. In fact, not at all. A poet named Lowell said it. Something to the effect that granting our wish is one of fate's saddest jokes. Lesson to be learned out of a few fragments of broken glass in a trash can. And a word to the wise, to the garbage collectors of the world, to the curio seekers, to the antique buffs, to everyone who would try to coax a miracle from unlikely places. Check the bottle you're taking back for that deposit. Because the genie you save might be your own. Case in point... Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, fresh from the briefest of trips into the Twilight Zone. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. How much is this? 
Shall I wrap it up for you, ma'am? I got all my Christmas shopping done. I need one more present for Uncle Fred. Could you put a big red ribbon on that? Ma, where is he? He'll be here, Tommy. How long? Just a few more minutes. I don't believe it. He's never coming. Excuse me. Yes, madam. Are you the manager? Indeed I am. Mr. Dundee at your service. Well, I have a question for you. Gift wrapping? The customer service counter is downstairs on the first floor. No, no, not there. Oh, a special Christmas item. I'm sure we can find something. What exactly were you... Listen to me, Mr. Dundee. See this sign? What about it? What does it say? Santa will return at 6 o'clock. It's almost 6.30. Oh, yes. Well, you see... And my boy's been waiting all year to see him. We can't stand in line forever. I'll look into it, madam. Perhaps Santa has been detained. You know, so many presents to wrap up at the uh, North Pole. I'm sure the boy understands. You don't know my boy. Listen up, Dundee. If the guy in the red suit doesn't show in five minutes, we're going to another department store. Really, that won't be necessary. I want to talk to Santa. How now, son? Where is he? Bartender, pour me another one, will you? Coming right up. Hey, Corwin. Yeah. See the clock on the wall. What about it? You told me to tell you when it was 6.30? Well, it's 6.30. That's exactly what it is. 6.30 on the dot. So what happens now? You turn into a reindeer? Would that that was so. One more, my good man. That's five drinks. No, six. And a sandwich. You owe me, Santa. Relax. I've got your money right here. Say, will you look at that? Where? Those two at the window. Little boy and little girl. Sad faces, don't you think? Yeah, they peek in here, they see Santa getting plastered. Real nice. Go on, show! That's not what's eating them. What is it then? They know there isn't really a Santa Claus. No kidding. Why do you suppose that is? How's that? Don't you ever wonder why there isn't a real one? For kids, I mean. What am I, a philosopher? You know what your trouble is, Corwin. You let that stupid red suit go to your head. Here's your change. I'll flip you for it. Double or nothing. What do you think this is, Atlantic City? Come on, eat your sandwich and get out of here. I've had enough to eat. Where's my drink? I'm coming. Oh, ouch. And keep your fingers out of the till. All right, all right. Can't you take a joke? I catch you doing that one more time, I'm going to break both your arms up to your shoulder blades. Now go on, get out of here. What's going on? Nothing. Just Santa trying to hoist the joint. What's that for? Your tip, my good man. Take it easy now. Ooh, snow's pretty slippery. Whoa! Oh, uh, I'd better sit down for a minute. Mr. Santa? Huh? I want a baby carriage and a dolly and a playhouse and a job for my daddy. What? And I want a gun and a, and a set of play soldiers and, and a big turkey for Christmas dinner. You don't think... Oh, you poor kids. Don't you get it? I, I can't help you. I, I can't... I can't even... That's okay. We can wait. We always wait for Santa Claus. This is Mr. Henry Corwin, normally unemployed, who once a year takes the lead role in a uniquely American institution, that of the department store Santa Claus, in a road company version of The Night Before Christmas. But in just a moment, Mr. Henry Corwin, Ersatz Santa Claus, will enter a strange kind of North Pole, which is one part the wondrous spirit of Christmas and one part the magic that can only be found in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Night of the Meek. Starring Chris McDonald with Stacy Keach as your narrator. When 
is he? This is so inconsiderate. Here he comes, finally. Will you look at that? Why, he can hardly stand up. Oh, it's disgraceful. There you are. Hello, boys and girls. Ho, ho, ho. Corwin, you're an hour late. I am? One hour and nine minutes, to be exact. Can you beat that? I advise you to get up on your throne without further ado. I'm going. I'm going. And refrain from disillusioning these children any further. All right. All right. I'm going. By showing them that not only isn't there a Santa Claus, but the one in this store happens to be a wino who'd be more at home playing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I take your point, Mr. Dundee. Stand aside. St. Nick is back on the job. Go ahead, climb up on his lap. He won't hurt you, will you, Santa? You won't hurt my little boy. Go on, you tell him. <laughs> What's your name, lad? Percival. You're putting me on. Percival Smithers. The third. My dad's name was Percival Smithers. My grandfather's name was Percival Smithers. Oh, I get it. Well, I guess that's not your fault. So, what would you like for Christmas, uh, young Percival? A new front name. <laughs> That's a good one. A real good one. I gotta remember it. Hey, Ma? Yes, dear? I smell something funny. You do? Yeah. And I know what it is, too. The same as Dad. Santa Claus is loaded. Leave my boy alone. Lady, I never laid a glove on a kid. Oh, you've got some nerve drinking on the job. Madam, I am... <laughs> Mortally ashamed. Oh, you should be. Come along, Percival. I hope this won't scar you for life. Is there some trouble here? Trouble? No, there's no trouble, except that this is the last time I trade in this store. It seems you hire your Santa Clauses out of a gutter. Hey, who are you referring to? Drunken sot. Come on, Percival. Some Santa Claus? You don't even look like him. Mr. Dundee, that lady... He's got a problem. All right, everyone back to work. Back to your positions. And you, as for you, Mr. Kris Kringle of the Lower Depths, since we are only a few hours from closing, it is my distinct pleasure to inform you that there is no further need for your questionable services. You've had it. Now get out of here. It'll be my pleasure. Pick up your pay downstairs. Oh, and one more piece of advice. I'm all ears. Get that moth-eaten red suit back to where you rented it before you really tie one on and destroy it for good and all, you drunk. Thank you ever so much, Mr. Dundee. As to my drinking, it is in... indefensible. You have my abject apologies. Don't waste your breath. That just doesn't cut it with me anymore. But I have feelings, you know? Plain old human feelings, same as anybody. And I find of late that I have very little choice in the matter of how I express my emotions. I can either drink or I can weep. And drinking is so much more subtle. Will you please leave? But as to my alleged insubordination, I assure you I was not rude to that woman. Someone should remind her that Christmas isn't just barging up and down department store aisles and pushing people out of the way. Or when I'm warning you. Someone should tell her that Christmas is something quite different from that. It's richer and finer and truer and... And it should come with patience and love and charity and passion. That's what I would have told her. Had she given me the chance. My, how philosophical, Mr. Corwin. Perhaps, as your parting words, you can tell us how we go about living up to those grand Yule standards which you have so graciously laid out for us. I don't know how. I wouldn't know how to explain it, especially to you. All I know is that I am an aging, purposeless relic of another time and place. A different way of life. And now, I, I don't know how it happened, but... One day I woke up and found myself living in a dirty rooming house on a street that's filled with hungry kids and shabby, scared people. Good people. Where the only thing to come down the chimney on Christmas Eve or any other day of the year is more poverty. Keep your voice down. And if you must know, another reason I drink 
is so that when I walk up and down the tenements, I can think to myself just for a little while that they really are the North Pole and the children are elves and I'm really Santa Claus bringing a bag of beautiful things for all of them. Every last one. That's enough out of you. I wish, Mr. Dundee, on just one Christmas, only one, that I could see some of the hopeless ones, the, the dreamless ones. On just one Christmas, I'd like to see the meek really inherit the earth. So that's why I drink, Mr. Dundee, and that's why I weep. Who is that guy? Never heard anyone talk to Mr. Dundee like that. Never heard anybody talk like that. What in the heck is that? Sleigh bells? Yeah. Sure it is. Better get home and sober up. I could have sworn I heard. Who's there? In the alley. Stop hiding behind those garbage cans. What are you afraid of? Come out so I can see you. Oh, gave a start there, kitty. I gotta get sober. Look at the mess you've made. All right, I'll clean it up. Put the cans back in the bag. Lift it up. Put it back where it belongs. Wait a minute. What's in this bag, anyway? <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. It can't be. It, it flat out can't. Excuse me, sister. Is this the Delancey Street Mission House? It is. Could I get something to eat, sister? Will you take a seat with the others? Have yourself a nice cup of coffee. Oh, oh, sure. Dinner will be served after the sermon. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sister. God bless you. Have a seat. At least the coffee's hot. I sit down and take a load off. Uh, the sermon ain't so bad. No, it don't take long. Here's a chair. Uh, don't mind if I do. All right, what is this all about? You, the noise, the commotion, you. What is the idea of barging in and disrupting our Christmas Eve? Begging your pardon, Sister Florence. I ain't touched a drop since last Thursday, and that's the gospel truth. But I swear to you right now... You on mustn't swear. On a kind of... I've seen him with my own eyes. He's coming. Who? Him. Him. Santa Claus is coming to town. Oh, I thank you for the thought. He's coming up the street heading this way, and he's giving everybody their heart's desire. Oh, yeah, sure. Santa Claus? Are you kidding me? Pour yourself a cup of coffee. Black. Merry Christmas! I told you, sister, it's him. Now, what'll be your pleasure this year, gentlemen? How about you? Me? Yes, siree. Well, I'd sort of like to have a new pipe. Ha <laughs> ha Let me take a look at my bag. Here you go. A new Mershom. How's that? Oh, thank you. Thank you kindly. How about you? Uh, a woolen sweater? A woolen sweater you shall have. Size? Well, who cares? There you go. Next. Some new shoes? How about some pipe tobacco? Uh, a carton of cigarettes? Another sweater, maybe? Slippers. A smoking jacket. Where did you get all these gifts? Mr. Florence, <laughs> don't ask me to explain because I can't. I'm as much in the dark as anybody else. All I know is that I've got a bag here that gives everybody just what they want for Christmas. As long as it's put out, let's see here. What do you need? How about a new dress, sister? 
all wrapped up with a pretty ribbon for you. Well, we'll see about that. Don't you want your present? Let's open it for her. Well, looky, looky, an evening gown. And it's strapless. There he is. There he is. That's the man. What's your name? Henry Corwin, officer. At least it was Henry Corwin. <laughs> Maybe now it's Mr. S. Claus or Chris Kringle. <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> You're drunk, Corwin. Is that it? Naturally. Naturally, I'm drunk. I'm drunk with the spirit of the Yule. I'm intoxicated with the wonder that is Christmas Eve. I'm inebriated with joy and with delight. Yes, officer, I am quite indubitably drunk. <laughs> all right, all right, hold on there. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. You can begin by handing over that bag of yours right now. Wait a minute. You got no call to... The bag? Or I'm placing you under arrest. You can't arrest Santa Claus. I sure can. And I can arrest every one of you. So let's have that bag, or we're all going down to the station house. You hard of hearing? I, I'm, I'm sure we can settle this. Yes, we can, Carlin. And in a hurry, I'd like to see just one little thing. And that would be? Show me the receipt for all this stuff. Right now. The receipt? You heard me. Of course, you've got a receipt. Well, go on, Henry. Show it to the policeman. Sure, you got one, ain't you? Mm, I'm afraid that's the one... the one thing I don't have in this bag. Sister Florence. Yes, officer. Collect all the stolen goods. What stolen goods? I put them in a pile over there. I'll see that they get claimed after I find out where he took the stuff from. Gladly. Come along, Santa. But you don't understand. Move. I want to report a missing person. Yes, ma'am. Fill out a report. Do I get a phone call? After you see the judge, now sit down. Can you take these handcuffs off? Ah, here we are. And here he is. And there you are, Mr. Dundee. Sit down, Corwin. And there that is. All the goods you've stolen. How nice to see you again. And how nice it will be to see you, my wistful St. Nicholas, going up the river. Do you suppose he could get as much as ten years, Officer Flaherty? Ten years? Ah, don't look good, Corwin. Of course, they might lop off a few months if he was to tell us where the rest of the loot is stashed. The rest of it? You think there's a storehouse of some kind where I go to replenish it? Well, ain't there? Why, he may have been looting and pilfering for years. Now I understand. That's why he takes this job every December. He's been giving away stuff for two and a half hours. Must have a whole warehouse full of it. I'm glad you brought that up, officer. There's a little discrepancy here. Little discrepancy? Is that what you call it? Between this bag and what came out of it, did anybody see me go somewhere to fill it up? Because if they did, they're, they're lying or deluded. All right, you speak when you're spoken to, Corwin. Uh, I'm just trying to clear this up. Listen, you moth-eaten Robin Hood. The wholesale theft of thousands of dollars worth of goods is not a simple discrepancy. I wondered where my inventory went, and now I know. Let's take a look in the bag, shall we? You go right ahead, sir. Be my guest. Though I can tell you right now, Corwin, that this whole affair has come as no surprise to me. I perceived that criminal glint in your eyes the very moment I saw you. I'm not a student of human nature for nothing. I've personally spotted hundreds of shoplifters in my store over the years. I'll bet you tried, if you're any good at it. Quiet. And I can tell you that you fit the profile to a T. Then why did you hire me in the first place? Oh, huh, an act of Christian charity on my part. I try and I try to do for you people. What people? And this is the thanks I get. Maybe if you tried hard enough, I wouldn't need a bag like this. All right, enough already. Mr. Dundee, you go ahead and you check in the bag. Believe it or not, I got other cases to handle here tonight. It will be a pleasure to achieve satisfaction. To catch him red-handed, as it were. Well, suit yourself, Mr. Dundee. Go ahead. Reach right in. <laughs> Who let that cat in here? It was in the bag under all this... Uh, we'll be adding cruelty to animals to the charges now. Under what? Coffee grounds and empty tin cans? Looks like garbage to me, wouldn't you agree? He must have switched it. Where's the real bag? Uh, Mr. Dundee, you seem to have, um, put your finger on the problem. 
all your fingers, it looks like. <laughs> Messy, isn't it? Yeah, this isn't funny. No? Give me something to wipe my hands. Well, I guess the bag can't seem to make up its mind whether to give out gifts or garbage. Well, it was giving out gifts when I seen it. Whatever they wanted, Corwin was supplying. And it wasn't trash, neither. It was Christmas presents, toys, all kinds of things, expensive stuff, believe you me. You might as well admit it, Corwin. Oh, I admit it. Well, then, there you are. But I believe the essence of our problem here is that we're dealing with a most unusual bag. One that is both more and less than it seems. So you are some sort of magician con artist. A magician? <laughs> I love those guys. You know, this reminds me of a trick I saw once. Called himself Misto the Magnificent. Used to work down in Coney Island where they had those sideshows. He had a thing called the Never Empty Lotta. You know what a lotta is, officer? What's your point, Corwin? A vase, uh, an urn, sort of. Uh, and he'd, he'd pour out water, glass after glass full, till it was empty. And, and then he'd pick it up and start all over again. Couldn't figure out how he did it. But this bag here, I guess it's like the never-empty lotta. Only thing is, I'm no magician. I wouldn't know how to work it anyway. Whatever's going on, it's out of my hands. Some greater power is at work. I'm... Just the one who happened to be there at the right time and the right place. All right, no more talk. I told you I'm a busy man. For now, Corwin, my advice to you is clean up this mess and get out of my police station before I find a reason to book you. All right. If that's what you want, happy to oblige. Just, just like that? You're letting him go? My hands are tied. There's no evidence. And you, Officer Flaherty, call yourself a policeman? Hey, now. Well, I suppose it's a demanding task to distinguish between a bag full of garbage and an inventory of expensive stolen gifts. Too demanding for a civil servant whose salary is paid by my store city taxes. You can believe me, Mr. Dundee. It's just like Corwin says. We must be dealing with something supernatural here. Oh, in other words, all anyone needs to do is ask this man to make a little abracadabra for them, and no sooner said than done. I, I don't know how it works, but I can well, tell... Well, go ahead. Prove it. I told you. I I'm no magician. Well, it seems miracles are the order of the day, aren't they? I don't go getting sacrilegious. You want me to drop the charges? Well... Let's put him to a little test. I, I can't just pull a rabbit out of a hat. Oh, it's to be a rabbit now, is it? Instead of a cat? If you'd listen. Let me see. I fancy... Oh, how about a bottle of cherry brandy? Vintage 1903, if your mystical bag is in the mood to deliver. 1903. That's a good year. A very good year. Hmm. Try this. I hope you like the gift wrapping. And as for you, Officer Flatter... Well, but I guess you two can share the bottle, can't you? What in heaven's name? Where did you get this? Enjoy it, gentlemen. I'll be going now. And to all, a good night. Well, let me open that package for you. You go right ahead. No telling what's inside. Well... Would you look at that? Is it a real bottle? <laughs> Looks like one. Feels like it, too. It is a magic trick. It, it, it has to be. The old switcheroo. Either that or I'm dreaming, or I've gone completely mad. Now don't that beat all. 1903, just like you said. The card's even made out to you. To Mr. Dundee from Santa. Here you go. You look like you need it, Mr. Dundee. Give me that. I don't believe it. It's cherry brandy. And a very fine one, I might add. Uh, just one more thing. Yeah? Would you mind terribly much passing the bottle before it's empty? The bag isn't that heavy. There he is! There's Santa! Come on, he's got presents! Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! I want a jacket and mittens! And a train! Diesel or steam? No, no, electric! And how about you? I'd like... Well... Go on, say it. What's your heart's desire? A dolly, please. And what color hair would you like, darling? 
Blonde, brunette, red, or what have you. Anything's okay. Here you go. Blonde hair, just like you. Oh, thank you, Santa Claus. I love you. And a toy for you. And one for you. <sighs> what's the matter, Santa? Yeah, what's wrong? This bag's getting lighter and lighter. So, what's wrong with that? Well, there's so many folks who need things tonight. I'm just worried about what happens if... If what? What happens if I run out of presents? There it is. Midnight. Could have guessed it. Am I the last one? You are. Last present. In this bag. If someone else needs it... Well, go ahead. I got mine already. Well, if you're sure it's all right... I don't see anybody else around, do you? No. Then here you go, ma'am. It's all yours. Thank you so much. I hope it's something you can use, my dear. Oh, it is. A beautiful new blanket to keep out the cold. Thank you so much. Don't mention it. Yep, looks like your bag's empty, all right. That it is. So, what are you going to do now? Oh, I'll go on home, I guess. Nothing left to do. Good idea. How about you, old fellow? Me? I can find lots of good places to sleep tonight. Only this time I got these great big old socks you give me to keep me warm. <laughs> Hope they fit. Oh, they're going to fit just fine. Oh, hey, Santa, oh, can I call you that? Well, might as well. One last time. I kind of like it. I was thinking... That can be dangerous, my friend. Well, it just ain't right. What isn't? What do you get out of it? Well, don't worry about me. I, I, I have had the best Christmas of anybody ever. With nothing for yourself? Not a single thing? Just the best Christmas since... since the beginning of time. Their faces, the look in their eyes. Do you know something? I can't think of anything I want. Not a single thing. Aw, oh, quit joshing me. I'm serious. When I look around, I, I think the only thing I ever wanted was to be able to do something like this. To be the biggest gift giver ever. So folks would feel a little bit better, uh, at least for a while. And in a way, I've had that tonight. A real pleasure. I'm just sorry it has to end. Sure, but you could use something. Well, if I did have a choice, any choice at all of a gift... Go on, you're entitled. I guess I'd wish I could do this every year. Now, that would be some kind of gift, wouldn't it? A lot of work, though. It'd be worth it. That'd sure be something. <laughs> well, you take her easy now. God bless you, and a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Santa. Don't mention it. Whew. Am I beat? Now, how'd I get here? That's the alley. Guess I better put the bag back where I found it. What's all this? Looks like somebody's throwing out their Christmas decorations already. That's no decoration. That's your sled. Ah, uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> a sled and a reindeer right here in the alley just for me. Somebody sure made the eyes look real. He is real. Yeah, about as real as you are, little fella. Little fella. We've been waiting for you. And I suppose you're going to tell me you're a real elf, too. I sure am. We've been waiting for you to come back. Say, where did you rent your costume? I never saw one look that good. Pointed hat, turned up toes. Costume? I made this myself, by hand. A and the little bells? Must have been a heck of a party. It better be a costume because I haven't had a drink in it. Uh-oh. Oh, no. What's the matter, Santa? No, no, not me. You got the wrong guy. No, I haven't. Did you hear what I said? We've been waiting quite a while, Santa Claus. Better get a move on. We've got a whole year of hard work ahead to get ready for next year. Ready? Come over here. Yes, yeah, Santa? Pinch me. If you say so. Ow. You don't have to do it that hard. Are you ready now? I... 
I don't know. Come on, get in. There's plenty of room. Where? In the sleigh. You sure you don't have the wrong person? Oh, Santa, stop joking and get in. We're late. I don't have to. I, I, I could turn around right now and go home. If you do that, a lot of people would be very sad. Next year. You wouldn't lie to me. Elves can't lie. Okay. Okay. Move over, Shorty. Now, how do you work these reins? Good night, Officer Flaherty. Night, Mr. Dundee. So long, fellas. My regards to everybody in the precinct. And a Merry Christmas to you both. Night, boys. See you all in the morning. Watch yourself out there. It's mighty cold. <laughs> now, don't you worry about me. Tonight, I'm feeling no pain. Going home now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Flaherty? That I am. Going home, Mr. Dundee. Assuming I can find me way. I'm sure you will. Left foot, right. Left, right. Try to walk the straight line to the lamppost. Oh, uh, where? Over there. Hang, hang on, I'll hold you up. Uh, and you, Mr. Dundee, home is it? Home, Mr. Flaherty. Well, I'll walk you away, if you don't mind. We could stop off for a nightcap. Well, now there's a pub right around the corner. That is a thought. Or just a nip, you know. Uh, to warm the soul. For thy stomach and thy infirmities. Isn't that what the good book says? I do believe it does, Mr. Dundee. You know something else, officer. Uh, now, why don't you tell me? That's what friends are for. Uh, that they are. <laughs> so go ahead now. Tell me all about it. Well, sir, this is the most remarkable Christmas I've ever had. You don't say. F -f Flaherty, did you see it? Did you? I thought I saw something. What did you see? No, 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 you first. Mr. Dundee, I don't think I'd better tell you. You'd report me for drinking on duty. But you're not on duty. True. Go ahead, what did you see? Mr. Dundee, it was that Corwin fella, playing his life in a sleigh, with reindeer, sitting alongside a... A, a, a what? One of his little helpers. So help me. All done up in proper costume. They were riding towards the sky. Big as you please. One question for you. Yeah? Did we drink a whole bottle of cherry brandy back in the station house? Vintage 1903. But only one bottle. The finest I ever tasted. So I guess that's about the size of it then, isn't it, Mr. Dundee? Flaherty... You better come on home with me. We'll make some hot coffee. Yeah, and pour a little whiskey in it. We call that Irish coffee, you know. Oh, I do know. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk some more about all this. Sort it out. What is there to say? If a man can't believe his own eyes, what can he believe? Then, I will thank God for miracles, Mr. Flaherty. That we will, Mr. Dundee. That we will. A word to the wise, to all the children of our times, whether their concern be pediatrics or geriatrics, whether they crawl on hands and knees and wear diapers, or walk with cane and comb their beards, there is a wondrous magic to Christmas, and there is a special power reserved for little people. In short, there is nothing mightier than the truly meek. And so, a Merry Christmas to each and all, and to all a good night from those of us here in the Twilight Zone. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. 
You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Where would I find the thimbles? Well, you'll have to ask Mr. Armbruster, the floor manager, over there, the, the man with the flower in his lapel. Thank you. Hey, watch where you're going. Excuse me. I'm in line here. I, I know. I, I just have to... Sir? Yes? I'm looking for the thimbles. The, the symbols? <laughs> no, y you know, the for sewing. The pretty little gold ones. Well, that would be in gifts. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, which floor? Is this dress on sale? Yes, madam. Oh, good. Can you help me? The sales girl will ring it up for you. I is gifts... Mr. Armbruster to cosmetics. I'm sorry. What did you say? Is it upstairs or Mr. down? Mr. Armbruster, please come to the cosmetics counter. Sure, one moment. I'm needed. Is this the final markdown? Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, 40% off. I'll take it. Will that be cash? Charge. Oh, and can you gift wrap it for me? Well, certainly, ma'am. The customer service is downstairs. You take the elevator on your right. Would you push the button for me? What? The button. My arms are full. Oh, I'm sorry. I I'll get it for you. Is this elevator going down? I I'm really not sure. Ugh, such crowds. I know. Uh, it is hard to tell whether you're coming or going. Oh, it's always like that this time of year. Uh, I should have stayed home. It's exciting, though, don't you think? All the colors, the displays. It makes you feel so alive. I suppose. Going up? Actually, no. I'm looking for customer service. Next elevator, ma'am. Going up. Wait. Yes? Is the gift department upstairs? That would be the mezzanine, miss. Then I'd better get on. Yeah, good luck. I hope you find what you're looking for. So do I. What about all those people? Beg pardon? I'm the only person on this elevator. Miss? Why didn't you let them on, too? This is the express. The others are local this time of day. Oh. I guess I'm not accustomed to such personalized service. <laughs> My own private elevator. <laughs> A pleasure. I hope it's in gifts. What in particular were you looking for? Thimbles. Thimbles? Gold thimbles. Really? You had them advertised. And they would most likely be in specialties. They would? Ninth floor. Oh. Somebody told me to look in gifts. Ninth floor. Thank you so much. W w wait, there, there must be some mistake. No one's on this floor. I don't even see a salesperson. Wait! Express elevator to the ninth floor carrying Miss Marsha White on a most prosaic, ordinary, run-of-the-mill errand to the specialties department looking for a gold thimble. The odds are that she'll find it, but there are even better odds that she'll find something else, too, because this isn't just a department store. This happens to be the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, After Hours, starring Kim Fields with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Wait, you can't leave me here. There's nothing on this floor, only empty counters, almost no lights at all. Oh, I want this button to work. Now I have to wait till he comes back. Rude, that's what I call it. Hello? Is anyone here? Anyone at all? May I help you? Oh. Is there anything the matter? Where did you come from? Come? From? I, I didn't see you behind the counter. Was someone helping you? N no, how could they? I don't think I'm on the right floor. In fact, I'm sure I'm not. You see... Can I show you anything? Why, yes. If you are, 
open, that is. And what would that be? Well, actually, I was looking for a gold thimble. Really? Mm -hmm. It's a gift from my mother. I see. Gold thimble. Gold thimble. Oh, yes. I think we have just the thing. You do? Something you'll like. In fact, I'm sure you will. But where? I don't even see any merchandise. Down here, at the end of this counter. This way, please. Oh, I see it now. There. How about this? It's all by itself in a glass case? Well, that does make it stand out very dramatic. And in its very own little velvet box. That's lovely. Don't you adore it? May I see? It's 14 karat gold. Really? Quite distinctive, don't you think? Do you have any others? Only this one. But why look any further if this is the one you like? You do like it, don't you? Yes, it's perfect. How did you know? Let me write it up for you. Charge? What? Will this be a charge? Oh, no, no. I'll be paying for it in cash. As you wish. It's easier that way, at least for me. Applying for credit, waiting to be approved. I never have enough time to go through all that. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Do you want it gift wrapped? Yes, please. If you have the time. Mm, on second thought, I'd better wrap it myself. Of course. It seems that there's never enough time, is there? Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot to ask. How much is it? Twenty-two eighty plus tax. Is that all? Quite reasonable. It's our annual markdown sale for preferred customers. How nice. Twenty-five dollars even. Here you are. Perfect. You know, this is so... What? So odd. In what way, Marsha? Well, you don't have any merchandise here in any of the displays except for this thimble. Except for the very thing I needed. Is that so odd? We pride ourselves on catering to the discriminating shopper. I'm not sure. The whole floor looks so empty. And all the cases... You called me Marcia. Did I? I'm sorry. That was forward of me. I should apologize. How did you know my name? Aren't you a regular? I've probably seen you around the store. No, you haven't. I've never been to this department before, and I certainly have never seen you. Are you sure? Look, I don't want to make a big thing out of this, but really, what kind of place is this? What do you mean? I mean, I go shopping and I want just one small item, a gold thimble. And I end up in this store on a floor where there isn't anything in evidence except the item I'm looking for. Now, you may be more sophisticated than I am. Not at all. But I'd call that odd. Here's your purchase. Well, don't you? Please come again. Any time. The elevator's... But of course, you remember where it is. Yes. Yes, I, I, I do. Thank you. Why won't I come? Oh, Miss White. What did you say? I was wondering. What? Are you happy? Am I happy? You'll have to forgive me, but it's really none of your business. Is that so? Why are you smirking? Was I? You are. You're laughing at me. I didn't intend to. Is this all a practical joke, one that no one's bothered to let me in on? Not at all. Then explain why you know my first and last name. I didn't give you a credit card or show you my ID. As I say, we must have met before, somewhere. And where would that be? I'm sure I don't remember. And why the personal questions? Am I happy? What does that mean? I was making conversation. But what business is it of yours? What possible interest could my life hold for you? Very well, Miss White. Suit yourself. It's none of my business then, as you say. I believe your elevator's here. Going down. What did she think was so funny? Pardon? Nothing. Did you find what you were looking for? As a matter of fact, I did. Excellent. 
Also, as a matter of fact, it was the only thing for sale on that floor. You don't say. Somebody ought to hire an efficiency expert or something. Oh, dear. One entire floor devoted to the sale of a single gold thimble. And an extremely odd sales lady. Somebody ought to look into her while they're at it. Odd, you say? You don't believe me? See for yourself. A very nice choice. Wait, this is scratched. I didn't notice. I can't send this to my mother. It scratched terribly and dented too. You see here? Main floor. Just look at this thing. It's scratched and it looks like somebody stepped on it. Main floor. Sit down, Mr. Armbruster. You make me nervous. But I'm only trying to explain. Can't we cut through all this? You're in charge of the floor. You're supposed to handle any problems. I have a department store to run here. I know that, Mr. Sloan, sir. I distinctly told her that... What's I, your point? Uh, that all the gold thimbles we have would be in gifts. And that if the item is in its original packaging, we would make good on it, either by replacement or refund. I distinctly told her that, Mr. Sloan. Then what's the problem, Mr. Armbruster? The problem is that the customer claims she didn't get the item in gifts. She got it in another department. Then have her go to the department where she purchased the item. You know the policy. Oh, that's the point, Mr. Sloan. She has some idiotic story about having purchased the gold thimble on the ninth floor. Ninth? That's what she said over and over again. I trust you explained to her, Mr. Armbruster, that this store doesn't have a ninth floor? I tried, sir. Lord knows I tried. Mr. Sloan, believe me, I have tried desperately. And I really mean desperately to acquaint her with that fact. But she insists she was taken up to the ninth floor, waited on by a rather odd woman. An odd woman, no less. A personality trait she would be particularly knowledgeable about. Well, at any rate, a woman who allegedly waited on her... Never and... mind, Mr. Armbruster. I'll talk to her. Thank you, sir. She's right outside. Miss White. Oh, there you are. This is Mr. Sloan. How do you do? He is the manager of the entire store. Hello. Perhaps I can help you, Miss White. I hope so. I'll do my best. It's about this thimble. Let's have a look at it, shall we? It's dented. Oh, my. And scratched. See here? Well, now it most assuredly is. If you'll simply take it back to any register in the gift department, we'll be happy to replace it with merchandise of equal value or issue a credit. If that's all... Mr. Sloan, I've already explained to your Mr. Armbruster here. I didn't purchase this in the gift department. Where then? Now it begins. I was taken up to the ninth floor. Taken? If I may interrupt you right there. That's what's so difficult to understand, Miss White. What is? You see, we don't have a ninth floor. But that's ridiculous. As long as I've been with the store, which, by the way, is a considerable number of years... A considerable number. Well, I know what I know, Mr. Sloan. There's an old saying, those who were there know more than those who weren't. And I was taken up to the ninth floor, definitely. There's no question in my mind. I saw the numbers flash by, and then the elevator operator opened the door. Taken by whom? The express operator. And after that, he took me down again to this floor. Express, did you say? Yes, the express elevator. And I was waited on by a very odd woman. Is your receipt in your bag? My receipt? I didn't get a receipt. You see? I paid cash. I gave the woman a $20 bill and a $5 bill. Then I was given the thimble in this little velvet box here. Mm, it doesn't look like one of ours. Then I took the bag and... From the odd woman. She was odd. Anyone would say so. Can you be more specific? She had a very chic, tailored suit with her hair tied back tightly in a sort of bun. Mm. She seemed to know exactly what she was doing, so I'm sure she's also been with your company for a considerable number of years. And her name was? I don't know. You see? I didn't ask. All our employees are required to wear name badges, like Mr. Armbruster here. 
So all you'd have to do was glance at the lapel. Voila. And there's the name. I honestly don't think she had one. No, I'm sure. Just the tailored suit with a plain neckline, no jewelry. If you could give me something more to go on. I'm trying. Otherwise, without a proper receipt, I'm afraid. Like that woman. Which? She, she looked exactly like that woman over there. Where? Standing by the designer collections. The same outfit, same color. That's one of our newest designer suits. It hasn't even been put in the window yet. How did she... Wait. Yes? It not only looks like her, it is her. It is? The woman. The one who waited on me. She's standing right there. See her? Well, <clears throat> this will settle it then. Yes, it most certainly will. Miss, I wonder if you'd mind... She can't hear you. Mr. Arm Brewster, would you kindly ask her to come over here? With pleasure. Excuse me. Sorry. If you'll kindly step aside, I have to... You? Do you work here? I said... May we have a word with you, madam? This customer says she purchased a gift item from you earlier today. She refuses to answer. If you'll face me, please. My name is Sloan, and I'm the manager of this store. Where is your ID badge? I told you, she won't answer. She is not from any of my departments. My salespeople are all trained to be courteous, responsive. Are you deaf? Turn around and let me see your name. You still say this is the one who waited on you, Miss White? What in the world? What's the matter with you, Arm Brewster? Leading me on a wild goose chase. This is a mannequin. No! I could have sworn... Uh, of course it is. I knew that all along. A small jest, sir. A very small one. Only a mannequin, dressed for display in ladies' couture. Why, what do you say now, Miss White? A dummy! Not a sales girl at all. A mere dummy. Arm Brewster, what are you doing in ladies' lingerie? Sir, I'm waiting to see if our favorite customer, alleged customer... Miss White? You mean she's still here? In the ladies' lounge. I thought I told you to show her the door. She didn't feel well. She wanted to lie down. I thought it best to accommodate her. You never know about these crazies. Lawsuits, insurance oh, claims... Oh, all right. Let her rest. But send someone in to see how she's doing. It's almost six o'clock. Yes, sir. Miss Keever? Yes. Well? M Mr. Armbruster? Well, how is she? Oh, Miss White. She'll be all right, Mr. Armbruster. She was feeling a bit faint. That's all. Uh, what about this, uh, this delusion of hers? Delusion? Uh, I really don't know, sir. We didn't talk much. Well, go in and talk to her now. I think she may have gone to sleep on the couch. Wake her up, then. Get her on her feet. We'll be closed in a few minutes, and I want her out of here. Post haste. Oh, I I'll see what I can do. As soon as I ring up the sale, I... Now, Miss Keever. Yes, sir. Tell her we're closing. She can come back tomorrow and we'll get her a replacement on her merchandise or a refund or, or anything she wants. I'll tell her, sir. What I'd like to give her is a bus ticket to any department store west of Cleveland. Preferably one in Chicago, Los Angeles, or Honolulu. Miss Keever, did you hear me? Closing time. Yes. May I come in? Oh, yes, of course. How are you feeling? Mm, better. I must have dozed off. Oh, that's all right. You looked like you needed it. Mr. Armbruster wants to know how you are. I feel like such a fool. He must think I'm insane. No, mm, he doesn't. He and that manager and everyone else. Nobody thought anything. You just had a bad shopping day. I see it all the time. You know, it's strange. I didn't, really. You had what I came for, but everything went wrong when I got on that express elevator and the operator suggested... Well, which elevator is that? Next to the regular ones. You know, across the aisle, along the wall. Well, I have to tell you, I worked here all year, and 
And we don't have an express elevator. If we did, everyone would try to use it. Then I am out of my mind. Oh, it, it could have been the freight elevator, I suppose, except... Except what? Well, there's no operator on the freight elevator. And you're going to tell me there's no specialty department? <laughs> Where's that? You've never heard of the ninth floor, either. Oh, I am sorry. They do have a floor just for storage, but I've never been there. Look, why don't you just go home and forget all about this? Have you ever had one of those dreams where you just can't wake up? <laughs> Every day. Mr. Armbruster... No, I, I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> go ahead, you've listened to all my troubles. Well, it's just that... Well, I don't mind the job. Decent hours, great benefits, paid vacation. But what? Is there something about the store? No, no, not exactly. There's something odd about it, isn't there? Oh, it's the way Mr. Armbruster treats us. Have you ever worked retail? Isn't that odd? Really odd. Oh, well, what is? Do you know... Do you know, right here, right now, at this moment, I'm not sure. I have this feeling that there are things I, I can't remember, but I, I don't know what they are. <sighs> but of course I couldn't then, could I? <laughs> it, it's only logical. Does that sound crazy? That you can't remember? Well, did you fall and hit your head? No, nothing like that. You were telling me about Arm Brewster. Oh, well, I don't think he sees us as human. Oh, not just me. Any of us. The customers, too. We're objects. We stand at our stations or line up or whatever it is. But as far as he's concerned, we don't have feelings. We're lives. We're not real. Like the woman. The woman who sold me the thimble. Now, which one? That's just it. She wasn't a woman. Oh, listen to me. I think you're right. I, I'd better go home and, and get some rest. Well, can I call for a cab? It, it's no trouble. Don't bother. I'll walk. Is it very far? I don't think so. Well, what's your address? My address? Okay, I am off in a few minutes, and I have got my car. <laughs> oh, oh, that's not necessary, really. Just let me stay here for a minute more. I'll put on my shoes. Peggy? Yes? You've got a customer waiting. Oh, okay, I'll be right there. Miss White, don't worry about Arm Brewster. You know what I think? In his mind, he's some kind of little king or something, and this is his castle. And we're all his prisoners, or at least as long as we're here. But a few more minutes, and I'm off the clock. Look at it this way. You're one of the lucky ones. I don't feel very lucky. Well, think about it. You can walk out of here anytime you want to. But why can't I remember my own address? Why am I so tired? Excuse me. Yes. Oh, hi. You feel better? A lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. And for the talk. Sure you can make it okay? Oh, I'm sure. I just wanted to ask you, which is the way out? I think I got turned around somewhere. Okay, now that way. See the elevator at the end of the aisle? Mm, I don't need an elevator. <laughs> just point me to the nearest exit. Well, you still have to take the elevator. Why? We're on the first floor, aren't we? No, not quite. The second. Oh. <laughs> I really am turned around. Well, everybody has to take the elevator. The escalator's not working. Oh, you could take the fire stairs, but they're kind of spooky. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> the elevator's fine. Okay, then. I will see you next time. <laughs> I honestly don't think there'll be a next time. Not in this store. Good luck to you. Well, you too.
This is the last call. The store is now closing. Mommy, come on. These elevators take so long. My feet hurt. It's these shoes. Got some slippers for my husband, a shirt for my nephew, and a new dress for myself. I splurged. Here comes the elevator. Watch your step. Please move all the way to the back of the elevator. Going down? Yes, yes I am. Have to wait for the next one. This one's full. Oh, all right. Hurry up, please. Going down. Yes, please. Step into the elevator. But why is it so dark? Did your light fixture burn out? Step in. Wait, aren't you the operator from the other elevator? All the way to the back. You are. I just saw you in the elevator on the right. How did you... I said, step in. I won't. It's completely dark. I can't even see the floor. That's because there is no elevator in this shaft. What? Going down now. Let go of me. Falling asleep again. Oh, what an awful, awful dream. Hello? Hello, is anybody there? Empty. Then the store must be closed. That means. I'm locked in. Please, someone, someone, anyone. There, you, yes, you, Mr. Security Guard. Oh, please, over here, look over here. Yes, here. I'm locked inside the store. He must have a key, of course he does. Of course he does, here he comes. He'll, he'll unlock the door and, and I'll go home just... Just go home and, and like the girl said, forget all about this. And... No! He can't see me with the lights off. Use your flashlight! He can't hear me. Come back, please. 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 Can anyone help me? Anyone? Anyone? Help me. Somebody, please, please. Help me! The window won't break. It won't, no matter what I do. Who, who's there? Where do I go? I'll hide. That's it. I'll, I'll, I'll hide. He, he won't find me. Whoever he is, where? Men's, men's department. Not that way. Toy department, yeah. Yes, that's a good place to hide. Behind these boxes. If I can, if I can squeeze, squeeze down. Remember me? 
You took me up to the ninth floor today, just a few hours ago. And now I'm locked in. I, I guess we both are. Do you know the way out of the... Hello? Can you hear me? I said I... Huh? You're not real either. You're a mannequin. Marsha? Who do you think you're fooling, Marsha? Come on, dear. Climb off it. You remember, Marsha? Do you know who you are? We do. We do. We do. A payphone. Yes. Where's my purse? I don't have any change. Help. Someone, please! The elevator has to be working. The real elevator. Please. Please, come. Hurry. Any floor, I don't care. Move, move. Five. Six, seven, eight, no, no not, not this one. Wait, not the ninth floor. So, you finally come back. What do you want from me? Well, Marsha, dear. You'll forgive an observation, but you're acting like a silly child. Who are you? Can't you see? Come into the light. You're not real. You're not even the model for that mannequin in the women's department. You, you are the mannequin. That's all you ever were. Only? Are you sure? Take a good look. You know us. You're all dummies, dressed up in department store clothes. What, what are you doing here? Come now, Marsha. Think. Concentrate. And why am I... Remember now, all of us will try and help you. We want to help you. We'll help you concentrate. Stay away. Remember now? Is it coming back to you? Stay away from me, I said. Come on, Marsha. You can do it. We know you can. We have faith in you. What? That's odd. Is it really, dear? I, I don't know, but suddenly I, I do seem to, to, to. Remember? She remembers. Of course she does. She couldn't forget us. She didn't. She didn't forget. We knew you'd be back. You did? We've been counting on it. Then I must be... Say it. One of you two. There. Was that so hard? No. Of course it wasn't. Why should it be? Yes, that's what I am. One of you, and this is my address, isn't it? It's where I live. Good girl. And it was my turn to... Go ahead. Say it. Your turn to leave us for a month. Becoming much clearer now, isn't it? You left us last month to live with the outsiders. But you were due back yesterday, and you didn't show up. And you know, Marsha, that's selfish, my dear. All of us wait our turn, and then when it comes, we simply do not overstay. It was my turn, starting last night. I'm one day delayed already. Of course. Of course. I'm sorry. I forgot. When you're on the outside, everything seems so... so normal. As if it will go on forever. As if... As if what, Marcia? As if we were... like the others. Like the outsiders. 
like the real people. Well, my dear, no serious harm done. And now, I'll see you all in a month. Take care of yourselves. We will. Have a nice time. Enjoy yourselves. See you in 30 days. Did you enjoy it, Marcia? What? Your turn. Oh, yes. Was it fun? Yes, ever so much. Ever so much fun. Tell us about it. Please. I want to know. Did you get to wear what you like? Eat and sleep? Have a normal life? Were they nice? What did you see? You don't have to talk anymore now. There'll be plenty of time later. Time to tell us all about it. But for now, welcome back, Marsha. Good morning, Miss Keever. Morning, sir. Ready to set a new sales record? Oh, yes, sir. Splendid. I see the very irritating Miss White finally made it out of the store. Well, I, I guess so, sir. I didn't see her go. Well, good riddance to her and her little golden thimbles. Excuse me? Yes? Where can I find, well... Speak up. Ladies' undergarments? Uh, right here. Uh, Miss Keever will help you. Are you Armbruster? Mr. Armbruster. And you are? Maintenance department. I got another dummy for you. Where do you want it? Uh, on the pedestal in the window. As soon as it's properly dressed, of course. Right. Hold on. Yeah? Is that a new model? Don't ask me. Hmm. For a moment there, she... It... That is, it reminded me of... Well, it reminded me of someone. Hey, right. Someone I believe I've seen in the store. I can almost place her. Oh, well. I'm sure it doesn't matter. I have much more important things on my mind. Setting her up over here, Mr. Armbruster. Marsha White, in her normal and natural state... A wooden lady with a painted face, who one month out of every year takes on the characteristics of someone as normal, as much flesh and blood as you and I. But it makes you wonder, doesn't it, just how normal are we? And who are the people we nod our heads to as we pass on the street? A rather provocative question to ask, particularly in the Twilight Zone. Traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Fairfield, Elm, um, uh, uh, excuse me, boys. Hey, mister, get out of the way. Yeah, we're playing football. Uh, surely, but first, uh, that is, if, if you don't mind. Uh, huh? Uh, could, you, could you direct me to Yancey Street? What do you want to know for? Well, I've never been to that particular neighborhood, and, uh... How come you're carrying that thing? Oh, this, uh, this is the Hercules Mark IV, the finest device ever made for hearth and home. What is it? Some kind of an invention? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, a, a new breakthrough in home hygiene. It removes dust and dirt that you can't see with the naked eye. It comes complete with a laboratory-grade filter and an a, 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 a extension hose. You mean a vacuum cleaner? No, 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 nothing so prosaic. Yeah, it is. And you're a salesman. You better stay away from my place. My dad hates salesmen. Mine, too. He'll suck you in the jaw. The last guy that came around... Uh, if you could just point the way to Yancey Street... Over there, by the park. But don't stop at my house, neither. My mom will kick your butt. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, bye. That guy was weird. Yeah, with his little hat. Ha <laughs> ha, what a loser. Oh, 
here we are. Uh, Yancey Street. May as well try the first apartment. Yeah? Uh, madam, uh, may I uh, have a word? Who are you? Um, um, my, uh, my name's Dingle. Uh, I have something for you. You a process server? No, ma'am. I'm here to, uh... Social worker? No, no, not at all. I'd merely, uh... A cop? No, no. Uh... You said you wanted to give me something? Oh, yes, indeed. Well, you can come in, I guess, for a minute. <clears throat> Lovely place you have here. Yeah, sure it is. Now then, I have the most amazing thing to show you. That it? Yes. Looks kind of like a big tin can with knobs and wires. Now, I'll just plug it in. Now, pretend, if you will, that this rug here is your brain, and this dirt... What are you doing? This dirt is all the messy thoughts in your head. You threw dirt on my floor? Now, watch what happens when I turn on the Hercules Mark IV. All that filth goes away in a flash. It's better. See? Suck, suck, suck. Gone, gone, gone. Get that thing out of my house. Well, if you wish, but uh, first I, I'd like to, t to tell you about... Uh, What's going on in there? It's a crazy man. He spilled dirt all over and then he... Say, he... pal, what are you trying to pull? Well, I was just de de demonstrating... You uh, a salesman? Well, you might say... Uh... Well, take your crap and get moving. Uh oh, it's just one question before I go. What's that? I don't suppose, um, that is, you you wouldn't care to purchase one of my vacuum cleaners by any chance, huh? Get out now! You know, we have easy time payments. Ooh. <laughs> Look at him! I told you, mister, my old man don't like salesmen. Well, th th thank you. Uh, th thank you both uh, very much. Uh, no, I think, uh, I think I'll just uh, try the next block over. Well, Callahan, you heard the man. He says he's not going to pay, so that's that. Yeah, you want me to pay on a bum call? Where I come from, a bet's a bet. You saw the play. The umpire's blind. Look, you shouldn't have took the bet. I set the odds and you took them. All I want is what's coming to me. Ah, oh, hello, Mr. Dingle. Uh, the usual? Oh, not quite yet, Mr. O'Toole. Just allow me to sit here and collect my thoughts. Uniquely American institution known as the Neighborhood Bar. First up is Mr. Anthony O'Toole, proprietor, who waters his drinks like geraniums, but who stands four square for peace and quiet and booths for ladies. Then Mr. Joseph Callahan, an unregistered bookie whose entire life is any sporting event with two sides and a set of odds. His idea of a summit meeting is any dialogue between a catcher and a pitcher with more than one man on base. And the citizen who wants his payoff is every anonymous better who ever dropped rent money on a horse race, a prize fight, or a floating crap game. And who took out his frustrations and his insolvency on any vulnerable fellow barstool companion within arms and fists reach. And Mr. Luther Dingle, a vacuum cleaner salesman whose volume of business is roughly that of a valet at a hobo convention. He is a consummate failure at almost everything. But soon, two visitors from outer space will arrive on the scene and alter the destiny of Luther Dingle by leaving him a legacy. In just a moment, a sad-faced punching bag who missed even the caboose of life's gravy train will take a short constitutional into that most unpredictable region, the one we refer to as the Twilight Zone. <laughs> And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Mr. Dingle the Strong, starring Tim Kazarinsky, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Don't give me that, Callahan. I've told you before, I don't pay off on a bum call. Three umpires called him out. I called him out. 11,000 fans called him out. Final score, Pittsburgh three, Dodgers nothing. You and me got an even bet. I got the Pirates, hence you owe me five bucks. I know a bum call when I see one. That ball was foul when it hit him. It don't matter what you think you saw. 
So instead of an out, it was a foul ball. Who's to say he wouldn't have got on base? So that after the single, he would have scored a run and, and like that. You're dreaming. And furthermore, Callahan, you're a low-down, cheating insult to American bookiedom. I'm going to give you five seconds to take back that innuendo. Callahan, I told you once before already. Told me what? You start a brawl in here again, and I'll fix that mouth of yours, so from now on you'll be doing all your drinking through a tube stuck in a vein. Me? I give you trouble? You heard me. Tell it to the number one welcher of all the western states over here. This guy still owes me money for the fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe on account of that was a bum call, too. And I don't pay off on bum calls. Hey, Dingle. Uh, yes? You remember that fight? The champ's out of the ring, and the ref gives him a long count, like everybody in the room could have gone out for a beer, engaged in some small talk, and then come back and still sat down before the ref has finished counting. Now, how about that? I'm asking you. Me? Yeah, you. How about that? You're asking, Dingle. I sure am. I'm asking him. Well, I, I don't know. You see the game on television last night? Well, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I did watch it. Yes. There you go. Now we'll settle this. You talk about bum calls. Ninth inning, batters up with two down, and we got a man on first and a man on second. And this umpire with no pupils in his eyes calls a foul ball and out. You see that? I believe I did see that particular play. Then you tell him. You just tell him what you saw. Yeah, go on. Exceptional defensive play. Abner Doubleday would have been proud. Never mind Abner Doubleday. I leave it up to you. Was that a foul ball? Or was it an out? Well, yeah. well, I... Uh... Come on over to the bar, Dingle, and I'll buy you a drink. Refresh your memory. I'll pay for it. Put your money away, both of you. This one's on the house. Okay. Take your time. Say it. Say what you saw. Well, it did appear to me... Yeah? It, it appeared to me that the ball was in safe territory. Appeared? Uh, consequently, upon striking the ground and then hitting the batter, the rules would very clearly indicate that, 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 that the batter was out. You heard it! You realize, of course, pal, that you're calling me a liar. Now, I ain't an unreasonable man, so I'll give you one more chance. All right. Was that a foul, or was it an out? Well, uh, as I say, uh, it's my considered opinion. Here's what I think of your opinion. Hey, that's enough. Back off. What happened? Here, Mr. Dingle. Let me help you. Oh, oh yes. Uh, thank, thank you very kindly, Mr. O'Toole. How come you always got to hit Dingle? You hit him last week. You hit him the week before. A man can only stand so much. I'm tired of this guy contradicting me. And when somebody calls me a liar, there's my honor to consider. Your honor? You've got nothing but larceny in you, all the way from your arches to where you part your hair. And when you die, they're going to have to screw you into the ground. How about that, Dingle? Is that true? I'm crooked? I leave it to you, buddy. Am I crooked? Well... Hey, Dingle, Dingle, just once, why can't you just be neutral? Well, that's an interesting question. Watch what you say, Dingle. I got money riding on this. You are sure we are invisible? Beyond any doubt. This represents a typical gathering place for Earthmen. From the coordinates, yes. Did you ever see such primitive-looking creatures? Typical Earthmen. say that anybody tells me Philadelphia had any right to win the pennant that year is out of their green grass mind. You're blind as a bat and you're stupid too. And furthermore, if you're gonna sit there and tell me... Look at the record book. What? I rest my case. Not entirely typical. The one in the middle with the hat and peculiar neck adornment. In Earth terminology, I believe it is called a bow tie. He appears to have suffered physical damage. At the hands of his fellow humans, Appalling. This might be the perfect specimen. Does that compute? The very one we're looking for. Silence. I'm receiving his brain waves now. Awaiting confirmation. His name is Dingle. He's an abject coward. He doesn't even possess the minimum musculature for survival on this planet. Decidedly a sub-physical type. A genetic throwback. 
I believe we have found our subject. You intend to give him the additional strength? We have not found anyone weaker, have we? Negative. This one will make an exceptional subject. I estimate 11 additional psychograms atomic weight. That should make him approximately 300 times as strong as the average human. Yes, that will suffice. Contact the mothership. Tell them we have picked a subject. They may begin observing him in 60 Earth seconds. Confirmed. Adjust settings. Check. And prepare to let him have it. Look, Dingle, you, you don't gotta answer this guy at all. What do you mean? Just cause he don't happen to like the Phillies. Let him tell me. He's got a brain, don't he? Of course he does. You got a point of view, don't you, Dingle? All right, let's get historical. You follow the game, you know the stats. What did you think of the Phillies back in, uh, say, 53? That was a big year. The Phillies in 1953? That's right. You tell me, for example, if you think Robin Roberts was one half the pitcher that Labine was that year. Oh, here we go again. Well, um, of the two, I'd be inclined to take uh, Roberts. You heard the man, buddy. Why all the time you gotta fight me? Now let's run through this one more time. You say that Robin Roberts had more stuff than Clem Labine? Uh, to be perfectly honest and candid, uh, as to the two men, uh, as g g good as they both were, uh, all things being equal... So come on already. Hey, let the man talk. Who do you pick? Roberts. Uh, oh! I'm telling you guys for the last time, you pull any more rough stuff around here and I ain't gonna let you in that front door. Now look what you've done to this poor little fella. Ah, uh, he's coming around. How do you feel, Dingle? Uh, uh, Clem Labine was definitely superior. You see? All I'm doing is helping him see things clear. Whoa, 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 what was that? What was what? I, I, I don't know, but I, I definitely felt so something for a second just then. Uh, how you doing? You all right? Uh, definitely Clem Labine. Uh, all the same, I, I think you better go on home. Well, if you insist. Uh, but I feel quite well, uh, Quite remarkably well, in point of fact. Here's your vacuum. Oh, very kind of you, but I, I can carry it. Dingle, do you mind, a, you know, a word of advice? Oh, no, not at all. Look, there's some guys in this world that are, you know, they're going to get punched in the nose no matter who they pick in a ball game, or who they vote for, or the color of the tie they put on in the morning. I quite agree, O'Toole, though I've, I've always thought polka dots were quite stylish, personally. Yeah, well, look, you're one of those guys, Dingle. So, you know what I think you ought to do from now on? Don't talk. Just nod. If a guy asks you who you like in the third race, you just smile at him. Okay. If somebody asks you who you're voting for, you just nod. Okay. And if you're sitting in the bleachers for a doubleheader and you hear some guy yelling for the Dodgers, you don't go yelling for the Pirates. Uh -huh. You just leave your seat and you go get a hot dog. You understand, Dingle? Uh, I believe so. Uh, a word to the wise and so forth, huh? Uh, very considerate of you, uh, Mr. O'Toole. I'll definitely give the concept further thought. Yeah. What's the matter? Well, that, that's odd. What is? I feel, uh, I feel so funny. Funny how? Oh, oh nothing. I'm, I'm sure I'm fine now, but uh, for a moment there, it was as if something passed over me or, or through me, and I, I heard a high-pitched sound. Uh, very odd. Did anyone else hear it? I can't say as I did. What's he talking about now? Oh, well. No, what do you suppose caused that? Caused what? Well, this vacuum cleaner feels light as a feather. Oh, not that the machine isn't light. It happens to be one of the lightest on the market. Oh, give me a break. No, it's a handy-dandy Jim Cracker A1 piece of merchandise. A guarantee to lighten the labor and lengthen the life of that wonderful partner in the American home, the housewife. But, but, uh, I've never noticed it was this light. Hey, see you, Dingle. What the... Did you see that? The door fell off. Hey, look, Dingle. I mean, with all your faults, despite the fact that you cost me in band-aids what I normally would have to put out for the water bill, you've always been a nice type fellow who never gave me no trouble, but why all of a sudden do you have to go wrecking my front door? Oh, believe me, Mr. O'Toole, I am mystified. I am absolutely mystified. The door just seemed to, oh, just seemed to come off its hinges when I grasped the knob very lightly in my hand, uh, my right hand. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just set it here against the wall, and you can do whatever you need to make it better again. 
I bid you good day, gentlemen. Jeez, O'Toole. What kind of drink did you pour him anyway? Look it, there's that dweeb again. Boys? Hey, mister, why'd you come back, huh? I told you my dad had sack you in the jaw, and he did. Yeah, you're really asking for it. <laughs> Quite right. Uh, only this time, I'm not going to Yancey Street, uh, merely to that uh, park bench to sit in the sun and collect my thoughts. <laughs> he talks funny. I got an idea. Give me the ball. You're gonna throw it at him? Yeah, knock his dumb head off. Bet you can't do it. Watch this. <laughs> no, no, boys. That's not the best of all possible manners, is it? Pretty funny. Uh, go peddle your vacuum cleaners, you creep, and throw the ball back. Think you can catch it? He can't even throw it. Oh, is that so? Uh, all right. Uh, go back for a pass. Sure. Let me see now. How does one grip a football? Ah, uh, yes. I think I've got it. Uh, ready? Here goes. <laughs> Whoa, look at it go! Right at that building! It's gonna hit the window! Here's your lunch, Arthur. You want some soup with you? Just let me read my paper here, okay, Lydia? I gotta go back to work. You're always at work. Don't you like being home no more? Too hot. The air conditioner don't work. If you tell the super to fix it... What the heck was that? I don't know, Arthur, but you don't have to tell the soup or nothing. Cause now we got a nice cross ventilation all the way to the next apartment. Hey, mister, where'd you learn to throw a ball like that? Uh, I really don't know. I don't know what's happening to me. What in the world is, is happening to me? Get those kids! Down there! They broke my window! We better get out of here! Yes! Out of the street! A taxi! Over here! Where to? I don't care. Anywhere. I'm in a hurry. Well, get in, pal. Oh, oh yes. Of course. Hey, you tore my back door off. What'd you do that for? Oh, believe me, this is as much a mystery to me as it is to you. Uh, I'll leave it right here so you can fix it. Now, how am I gonna do that? Just, just, just let me catch my breath. Hey, quit leaning on my car. You, you're tipping it over. Help! Somebody get me out of here. Oh, dear me. You're pinned under the steering wheel, aren't you? Well, give me a second. There. You can get out now. Did you see that? He lifted the car and turned it over. With one hand. I can't believe my eyes. Most amazing thing I ever saw. Who is he? He's a hero. What's your name? N no name. I mean, I'm, I'm nobody. Nobody at all. Um, excuse me, miss? Yes? Um, may I sh share your park bench? Yes, of course. It's not mine. I only come here in the afternoons. <laughs> With your, your charming baby, I see. Oh, he's not mine either. I'm just the nanny. They want him to have his time in the park. You know it is. Well, how perfectly lovely. Well, I don't, actually. I know, that is. You're not married? Never. Really? That's hard to believe. A nice, normal man like you. Well, well thank you. What? Well, no, 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 no woman's ever said that to me before. That uh, you know, I'm I'm normal. You're joking. I wish I were. I'm not acquainted with many women. Uh, uh, hardly any, in fact, uh, on the personal level. Uh, 
Gosh, I, I hope you don't mind chatting like this. Not at all. I spend a lot of time here taking care of the baby. Oh, cute little fella. I know what he wants. You do? Well, look up. Where? Um, that tree branch uh, above your head? There's an apple on it, and the baby sees that. Really? Oh, I'm sure of it. Coochie, coochie, coo. I'm sure the cutest little fella. Oh, look, um, I, I don't want you to think I'm a masher or anything. I, I'm certainly not a masher, but uh, I, I wonder if you'd m m mind answering a question. That depends. Well, what I mean is, I mean, uh, uh, looking at me, would you say, uh, at least upon a, a perfunctory, uh, uh, cursory, uh, you know, very first surveil, would I uh, appear to be abnormal in any way? <laughs> Not at all. Oh, thank you. Mm, unless you plan to use that in the park. Oh, oh that. Uh, you know, up to a few hours ago, I sold those things. Uh, newfangled vacuum cleaners. Or at least I, I went through the motions. Uh, I was miserably bad as a salesman, just miserable. Would you believe it? Last week, I made exactly 89 cents in commission. And that was for an attachment, an upholstery nozzle, and I sold it to a drunk who kept insisting it was a divining rod for alcohol. Is that why you stopped? Well, there were um, other factors. I, I expected to be fired today anyway, but you know that's the least of my worries now. Uh, a few minutes ago, People were chasing me. Why? Well, that's just it. Be because they thought I was abnormal. Now, I ask you, would, would you be interested in hearing the source of my worries? Go ahead. Well, that apple, for instance, uh, the baby wants it, but you can't reach it, can you? No. Not even if you put the baby down and stood up on the bench. I couldn't put the baby down. Oh, precisely. But what if I were to give you a hand? I'm not sure I... Well, see, this bench weighs, oh, I'd say, um, 100, 150 pounds, and you're no more than 110 to 115. Well, 125. Well, what if I were to stand, reach down, pick up the bench by one of its legs, and lift it straight up into the air like this? Oh, please! Put us down! So that you could reach the apple, and you wouldn't even have to disturb the baby. Go on, reach over and take it. And then I put the bench down with you and the baby on it, right back down on the ground, as gentle as you can be. There. Uh, would you say that's abnormal? How? How did you... Hey, man, could you do that again? Whoa, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I got my camera with me. I sure would like to get a shot of that. Is it a magic trick, like in Las Vegas? Are you a magician or what? No, it's just something that I've discovered I can do. Uh, very recently, as a matter of fact. You see, um... uh, I, I better get the baby home now. <laughs> Let me just get the camera set up. But the young lady's gone now. There's no point in lifting the bench with no one on it, is there? Well, then do something else. Or like what? Anything. I don't know. I... Well, at least let me take your picture. Stand right there by that big rock. Oh, here? Oh, well, I, I suppose one picture wouldn't do any harm. Uh, shall I take my hat off? Uh, of course, then the sun would be in my eyes when I have to squint. Uh... Well, can you show me your muscles or something? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't believe I have any muscles to speak of. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Say cheese. Oh, wait, now the rock is in the way. Uh, perhaps if you stand a few feet to your left? And yeah, then the sun will be right in the lens. Oh, in, in, in that case, uh, I better move the rock. Uh, uh, may I? Uh, hold on one second. Whoa! You, you lifted it just like that. It must weigh a ton. There, young man. Is that better? I suppose you can snap my picture now if you insist. Yeah, that's great. Are you sure this is my good side? Couple more. All right. Wait till my editor sees this. Mike, did you see this? Uh, what do you got there, Callahan? It's Dingle on the front page of the Daily Bulletin. Let me see that. Hercules? No, it's Luther Dingle, 20th century Samson. Good gravy! There's his picture! Picking up a giant rock! You mean this is our Dingle? None other, by the looks of it. And this is where I spend my afternoons. Uh, when I'm not working, of course. Dingle, my old pal! Hey, have a seat, buddy boy! 
Mr. Luther Dingle, his favorite neighborhood pub. A regular guy who leads a regular life when he's not busy performing miracles. This is Jason Abernathy, and I'm here to bring you the full story on my eyeball news report. So, who wants a drink? Step right up. Are you his friend? What's he really like? What was his first feat of strength? Did you always know he was special? What's his secret? Well, now, uh, Mr. Dingle, uh, Luther, is uh, my number one customer. Never goes to any other establishment. Ain't that right, boys? That's the truth. I knew he had it in him. We was pals all the way back to grade school. All right, who's next? Line up. Mr. Dingle, if what I hear is true, do you realize how much money you could make on a tour with my international circus? A circus, eh? Uh, I, I don't know. Vegas, Atlantic City, Branson, Missouri. Hey, don't listen to her. Hey, Dingle, your future's in television. You're the walking, talking embodiment of every American male's wish fulfillment. You're John Q. Citizen, you're Babbitt, you're Tom, Dick, and Harry. We'll develop a sitcom around those values. A spinoff. After several guest spots, of course. Well, I'm just not sure. All right, well, how about uh, an infomercial? A simple across-the-board address by you with examples of your physical prowess followed by product endorsements. It's a natural for breakfast cereals, vitamin pills, anything at all. You mean like Jack LaLanne, uh, the juice man, that sort of thing? Forget it, Dingle. I keep telling you, boxing is a piece of cake. You line up with me, I'll get you a couple of real easy setups, and inside of eight months, I'll have you fighting for the world championship. Or if you want to go with the WWF instead... All right, all right. All right, everybody, we're going on the air live in just a few seconds. Uh, would the people around Mr. Dingle get out of the way, please? I don't want to. Okay, on the air in four, three, two, one, and... Hello, friends. Jason Abernathy here. Our unusual subject today is Mr. Luther Dingle, who, if what actual onlookers say is true, is the world's strongest man. Oh, well, I know. <laughs> Mr. Dingle, Mr. Dingle, uh, would you give us an example of this fantastic, uh, uh, allegedly fantastic strength of yours? Well, I'd be happy to. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, uh, is it all right? You know, the thing we discussed? What, are you kidding? <laughs> I ain't done this much business since, well, I don't know when. Be my guest, Dingle. Well, uh, yes. Uh, I'll start off with something simple. Uh, see this wall? Solid plaster. Supported, I believe, by wooden studs. I'll make a small X with my finger here and. Um... You saw it. Mr. Dingle has just punched a hole through a solid wall with his bare fist. Now, for my second demonstration. Oh dear, let me see. Uh... You've heard of karate. Uh, I suppose I could simply just line up the edge of my hand with the surface of this table, my open hand, mind you, and with a single blow. That's amazing! Would you call it mind over matter, Mr. Dingle? Oh, no. I, I, I call it an example of matter over matter. You see, it doesn't matter what's on my mind, even if it's nothing at all. Uh, okay, Dingle. <laughs> You just don't go breaking all my tables in half, okay? Hey, better sit down, buddy. Have yourself a drink. Hey, you want my seat? Not yet. Uh, I feel fine. Uh, splendid. Uh, these bar stools are bolted down, aren't they? If, let's say, I wanted to move one a few inches... <laughs> See that? He ripped it right off the floor and he didn't even break a sweat. What a guy. Go on. Take my stool if you want. Well, stand up. Sure, why? If you please. Uh, well, why are you looking at me like that? Oh, no. Wait a minute, Dingle. Ain't you ever heard of bygones being bygones? <laughs> Put me down. I see it, but I don't believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, the man at the bar is 160 or 70 pounds, and Dingle is lifting him like a rag doll, Whoa. twirling him over his head with one hand. Whoa. Whoa. There. Now, that didn't hurt too much, did it, pal? You're good as new. Well, almost. Uh, gonna give you a hand up, pal? Mr. Dingle, you're my hero. He can do anything. Well, better not pick a fight with that fellow. Had enough. Most inferior. We give him the strength of 300 men and he uses it for petty exhibitions. What shall we do about it? Give him 20 or 30 seconds more, and then remove the power. Excellent. Then I think we'd best be off. Three more planets on the itinerary. What is particularly interesting contains only females. Set the ray for cancellation. Check. Now, 
Ladies and gentlemen, for my next feat, I think I'll lift this entire building. Whoa. Huh. Well, at least the ceiling, and hence all the floors above it. Uh, uh, step aside, everyone. I, I don't know if we have a clear shot of this, but he's standing on his tiptoes, extending his fingers to the ceiling. <clears throat> Here we go. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, huh. uh, let me try that again. Uh, uh, I can't seem to... Uh... Something's wrong. Uh, no, I just felt strange there for a second. Uh, uh, let me try another bar stool. Remember, they're bolted to the floor. Uh, one finger. Uh, uh, no, maybe two fingers. Uh, He's a fake! No wires this time. It was a trick. What's the matter, Mr. Dingle? Uh, the wall, then. Uh, I'll punch another hole right about here. Uh, ah! Oh. Well, apparently, we've all been the victims of a charlotte. Cut. Are we still alive? Come on, let's get out of here. That was a trick. That's all. Just some guy looking to get his picture in the paper. All right, leave off with poor Dingle here. Get out of here. Hey, come on, Dingle. Sit down. I'll get you some iodine for those knuckles. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the station's apologies. We uh, didn't realize that these were merely stage illusions. And okay, we're off the air. That's a wrap. Off the air for good, I think. Let's go. So long, Samson. Time to go. Yes. Wait, who are they? Hello, boys. Where are you two from? Venus, how about you? Mars, conducting your own experiments? Yes. And you? Sudden introduction of strength to subnormal Earthmen. What is your experiment? Sudden introduction of an enhanced intelligence. Find any interesting subjects? That one over there, referred to as Dingle. He is certainly subphysical, maybe submental too. A likely subject. Give him the intelligence quota ray. How much? Oh, we'll make him approximately. 500 times more intelligent than the average human. Uh, what was that? Hey, Dingle, who do you like in the doubleheader tonight? Well, in this case... The laws of probability are interspersed with the finagling laws of chance, so through a process of calculus and a subdivision of grapple-based physical motivating and a divisional annotating, in this case, of course, using the two X factors as represented by the teams, the final score must, of necessity, be 5-3 to three Milwaukee in the opener, 6 to nothing Dodgers in the nightcap. Yeah, what did he say? Search me, Callahan. Let's have another drink. It's on the house. It is apparently on an advanced mathematical plan that the entire quantum theory of space and time relativity must, of necessity, be equated with the parallelian law of definitive numerical dialectical algebraic and can be located. Exit Mr. Luther Dingle, former vacuum cleaner salesman, strongest man on earth, and now mental giant. These latter powers will very likely be eliminated before too long. But Mr. Dingle has an appeal to extraterrestrial note-takers, as well as to frustrated and insolvent bet losers. Offhand, I'd say that he's in for a great many extremely odd periods, simply because there are so many inhabited planets to send down observers, and also because, of course, Mr. Dingle lives his life with one foot planted firmly in the Twilight Zone. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow between science and superstition. It lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area we call the Twilight Zone. Where is he? We 
should start anyway. Uh, pass me the coffee, Bob. How long are we supposed to wait? Gentlemen, I called you here for a meeting, but I don't have all day. You try my patience, Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. I want the figures on the account now. I'll try to reach him again, sir. Put me through to Jake Ross's secretary. Yes, I'll hold. Williams, we're still waiting for your Mr. Ross. I'm trying to get him now, sir. Is this Jake's office, Joni? Uh, yeah, 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 I'm fine. Mr. Williams! I know he's out to lunch, but there was a conference called for 2 o'clock and it's 2.30. Yes, Mr. Misrell's office. Where is he? All right, then check. Tell him to get his keister back here fast. Well, where is your protege with the multi-million dollar automobile account? She's, uh, she's calling around the usual places, Sardis East to Colony. Don't be an idiot. He's due any moment, sir. Probably stuck at a big client lunch or something. More likely a big martini. Or three. Or four. Mr. Mizrell, I assure he you He was that... too young to put on this account. I told you that, Williams. Much too young for so large and important an account. See? I knew it. Here's Jake now. Message regard Williams? Give me that. We have been here now for 34 minutes, Mr. Williams. This is... This is a note from Jake Ross. Would you be so kind as to share its contents with us? I can tell you the sense of it very quickly, Mr. Misrell. It's Jake's resignation. He's... he's moving to another agency. And? And he's taking the automobile account with him. That account represented a gross billing of millions of dollars a year. And how many times have you promised it to me? This is as much a shock to me as it is to you, Mr. Mizro. Don't con me. It was your pet project. Yours. And it was your idea to give it to that little college greenie. Get with the program, Williams. Get with it, boy. I'm sorry. So what's left? Not only has your pet project backfired, but it sprouted wings and left the premises. I'll tell you what's left for us in my view. A deep and abiding concern about your judgment. Please. This is a push business, Williams. A push-push business. Push and drive, but personally, hands-on. You don't delegate responsibilities to little boys. I don't feel well. You should know that better than anyone else. Oh. I, have, I have to leave now. It's a push, push, push all the way. All the time. Right down the line. Hey, you don't look so hot. Well, what's the matter with him? Why don't you just shut your mouth, fat boy? And who precisely are you addressing? Who do you think, you ugly, bloated, self-important old... I'll clean it up, Mr. Misrell. He didn't mean that, sir. I closed two new accounts. If I may, uh... Oh, no. Oh, excuse me. Please, excuse me, all of you. This is Gart Williams, age 38. A man protected by a suit of armor all held together by one bolt. Just a moment ago, someone removed the bolt and Mr. Williams' protection fell away and left him a naked target. He's been cannonaded this afternoon by all the enemies of his life. His insecurity has shelled him. His sensitivity has straddled him with humiliation. His deep-rooted disquiet about his own worth has zeroed in on him, landed on target, and blown him apart. Mr. Gart Williams, ad agency exec, who in just a moment will undertake a desperate search for survival in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Stop at Willoughby, starring Chelsea Ross with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Oh, hi, Mr. Williams. You have some messages. I put them on your desk. Thank you, Helen. 
Are you okay, boss? Just, uh, let me sit down for a minute. You don't look so good. Well, the ulcer's acting up again. Oh, no. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. You should take it easy. I can get you some lunch. Uh, no, thanks. Sure? Something plain? I think I'll, I'll go home early today. Oh, good idea. Well, can I get you anything first? Yeah. Anything at all? A sharp razor. What? And a chart of the human anatomy showing where all the arteries are. Tickets, please. Ticket? Hmm. Oh, right here. How are you tonight, Mr. Williams? In the absolute pink. Cold winter this year. Seems to get darker earlier than it ever has. That's the way of the world. The rich get richer and the days get shorter. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Here's your ticket. Enjoy the ride. Tickets, please. It's a push, push business, Williams. A push, push business. You gotta get with them, boy. A push, push business. Push, 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 push. Got to get with it, boy. You got to get with it. Got to get with That's it. That's enough. Is anything wrong? What? What? Oh. Oh. No, no, no. I, I was just thinking out loud, I guess. Oh, I was afraid you were speaking to me. Not at all. Sorry. It is a boring commute, isn't it? It's easy to doze off. Yes. Yes, it is. All that darkness outside. You can barely see the landscape. To tell the truth, I never paid much attention to it. But uh, well, now that you mention it... I used to read, but I got motion sickness. So now there's nothing to do but wait for the next station, and the one after that, and I don't even know where we are at the moment. I can't see any lights. What's the next stop? <laughs> I've lost track. That's funny. It is? Lost track. Track. Oh. At least we're not off the track. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Give it time. Well, I suppose we could be anywhere. Wait, do, do you hear that? Hear what? What's happening? M Miss? Where are you? Willoughby! This stop is Willoughby! What do you mean, Willoughby? Where's Willoughby? That's Willoughby, right outside. There's no place called Willoughby on this line. I've taken this train hundreds of times. Where's the woman I was talking to a minute ago? Woman, sir. This car's empty. And the light. Why is it so bright outside? Well, why wouldn't it be? Sun's out. The sun? It's summer. That's what she is. Mid-July. And a real warm one, too. <laughs> no, it's not. It's November. What is going on? Why are you dressed that way? That ridiculous old hat, the uniform. Where's the regular conductor? Willoughby, five minutes stop. W wait, what is this place? Already told you. Willoughby. But that's impossible. Take a look for yourself. But those clothes, the horses. What is this, a practical joke? No, sir. It's Willoughby, July 1888. Nice place, don't you think? And there's the woman I was talking to. Where did she get that parasol? Uh, you'd have to ask her. Getting off? Well, this isn't my stop. Uh, miss, you there? Why, hello, Mr. Williams. Good day to you. Uh, ho hold on. Can you tell me... Shall I open the door? Uh, no, I... You ought to take a look around sometime. Peaceful. Restful. Where a man can slow down to a walk and live his life full measure. If you're not getting off, you'd best take a seat. Yep, right on schedule. All aboard! Pardon me, sir. I, 
What? Oh, uh, what did you say? I didn't mean to bother you, but I didn't want you to miss your stop. Is this it? No, no, that's all right. Uh, you got back on. I did. Oh, I, 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 I must have dozed off again. I don't blame you. At least you got a little rest. I guess I did. A little rest and an idiotic dream. Why do you say that? Ever hear of a town named Willoughby? I don't think so. Willoughby where? Willoughby, Connecticut, I guess, or Willoughby, New York. Not on this run. Are you sure? There's no Willoughby on this line. Westport, Sulgatuck, next stop. Hello, Gart. Jane. I didn't hear you come home. That's all right. I figured you'd notice sooner or later. Oh, I see. So that's how it's going to be. If you say so. What are your plans this evening? Do you care? So you're going to get quietly plastered and sing the old college songs. No, no. No songs. I'm all sung out. Then you're just going to get drunk while I sit here and watch. You can join in if you like. No, thanks. I don't have anything to celebrate. Neither do I. It was just one of those days. I guess it was. How would you know? Bob Blair's wife phoned. She said he'd been in a meeting with you. You got hysterical or something. She called to find out how you were. They were all very solicitous, all the boys at the meeting. The kind of free-flowing compassion that spells relief for everybody because it means I'm the victim, not them. That's a big word with you, isn't it? Victim. Pour me another drink, will you, Jane? Would you spare me your little homilies for once and just give me a simple, honest answer? Did you throw away your job this afternoon? Did you wreck your entire career? It appears not. Mr. Mizrell phoned before I left the office. And? He has found it in that giant, oversized heart of his to forgive me. Forgive you for what? What's the difference? That gracious, somewhat obese gentleman will allow me to continue in his employ simply because he's such a human-type fella, real people person. And one small additional reason. If I were to go to a competitive agency, I might take a lot of business with me. Go on. That's it. That's all of it. I'm tired, Janie. I'm tired and I'm sick. <laughs> then you're in the right ward. We specialize in people who are sick and tired. Gart, I'm sick and tired of a husband who lives in a permanent state of self-pity. A husband with a bleeding heart sensitivity. He unfurls like a flag whenever he decides the competition is too rough for him. Some people aren't built for competition, Janie, or big pretentious houses they can't afford like this one or rich communities they don't feel comfortable in. Comfortable? Let me get this straight. You're not comfortable here? That's the one thing... Country club memberships that they wear like a badge of status. And you would prefer... I would prefer, if anyone cares, a job, any job at all, where I could be myself. And who's that? You know, where I wouldn't have to climb on a stage and go through a masquerade every morning at nine and mouth all the dialogue and play the executive and make believe I'm the bright young man on his way up because I'm not that person, Janie. You've tried to make me that person, but it isn't me. You're right. It isn't. It isn't me at all. And I'm not very young. I'm a soon-to-be-old, very uncompetitive, rather dull, quite uh, uninspired, average type of guy with a wife who has an appetite that won't quit. And where would you be if it weren't for my appetite? I know where I'd like to be. And where is that? A place called Willoughby. A little town I chartered inside my head. A place I manufactured in a dream. An odd dream. A very odd dream. Willoughby. It was summer. Very warm. The kids were barefoot. One of them carried a fishing pole. Oh, please. And the main street looked like, like, like a Courier and Ives painting. Bandstand, old-fashioned stores, bicycles. I've never seen such... such serenity. It was the way people must have lived a hundred years ago crazy dream. Gart. You should have seen it, Janie, this Willoughby. 
It wasn't just a place or a time. It was like a doorway that leads to sanity. A soundproof world where all the noise, the shouts, and the cries can't get through. Nothing serious, Gart. It's just that you were born too late, and your taste is a little cheap. You're the kind of man who could be satisfied with a summer afternoon and an ice wagon pulled by a horse. My mistake. My error. My miserable, tragic error. To marry a man whose big dream in life is to be Huckleberry Finn. That's what you want, isn't it? Something like that. A place, a time, where a man can live his full measure. And what does that mean? I don't know. But I'd like to find out. It's what that conductor said. A place where a man can live his full measure. That's where I'd like to be. Yes? Mr. Williams? Uh, yes, Helen. You've got a 2 o'clock, a 2.30, and a 2.45. Is that right? So I was wondering, should I cancel the 2.30 or the other one? What? The 2.45. Which? Uh, oh, the 2.30 is the man from the baby food company. He's got an idea for an ad campaign, remember? And the one after that is about the frozen fish account. Uh-huh. Tough call, huh? No. Well, I mean, it is. No, I, I mean, I'm... I was just wondering. Which one to cancel? Uh, not that. What would happen, do you suppose, if I weren't here? When? For the meeting. Either one. Take your pick. Me? Or both. You want me to cancel both meetings? It's a hypothetical question, Helen. Oh, but you are here. Of course I am. But what if... What if one fine day I just wasn't? Well, I guess they'd have to wait around till you got back. And if I didn't come back? Then they'd reschedule. And if I never came back? Never? Ever. Not in a hundred years. Well, in that case, somebody else would get the account. Is that all that would happen? And I'd miss you. You would? We all would. Even Miserel? Well, he can be a bear sometimes, but... But he'd get over it. He'd probably be relieved. And you would, too. Somebody who really cares. I mean really cares about his accounts and keeping all his appointments and after a while it would be like I'd never been here at all. Oh, Mr. Williams. Isn't that true? Mr. Williams, have I let you down in some way? Are you unhappy with my work? Of course not. You're the brightest face in the building. Honest. The only one I really look forward to seeing every day. You do know that, don't you? Then why are you talking about my working for someone else? Not you, Helen. Me. I see. Who do you want to work for besides Mr. Mizrell? Oh, I don't know. Uh, how about nobody? You mean go out on your own, start your own company? Maybe eventually, if I felt like it, maybe not. Freelance? That can be pretty tricky, can't it? In New York, it's none of my business, but... Well, go ahead, say it. Well, could you afford to do that? Not around here, that's for sure. Do we have any courier knives? You mean tea bags? Oh, no, no, I mean uh, the engravers, 19th century illustrations. Have you seen any books like that on this floor? No, I sure haven't. I can call the bookstore. How about Norman Rockwell? Maybe in the art department. They have a reference library. I'll check. Oh, there's no hurry. I was just thinking about a boy with a fishing pole. For the frozen fish account. I don't think it was a Rockwell. I don't think it was any illustration I've ever seen. What did it look like? The real thing. The one those painters were working from in the first place. He looked like the real deal, you know? The original model. Yes, sir. Uh, it's almost two, so should I tell them you're not back from lunch yet? Who? The two o'clock and the 2.30. No, uh, no, I'm here. You have their files? Somewhere. I brought them in. I'm sure you did. But if you haven't had time to look at them yet, maybe I should tell them to reschedule. That would be a lie. Not exactly. I can say you were at a long lunch. No more lies, Helen. Not in this office. I don't have the stomach for it. Hello again. It's you. Uh, please, have a seat. 
You look like you caught up on your sleep. Feeling better? Mm, tolerable. And you? No complaints. It is a bit of a grind, though, isn't it? These long commutes. Well, actually, I only take this train for the scenery. Some view. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the scenic route. If you like miles and miles of pitch black fields, you can't even see the towns. So there's nothing much to do but grin and bear it. It's an opportunity. It is? For conversation. Do you know I've never spoken to another soul on this train? They're all so wrapped up in their own melodramas. Misery loves company. So? We might as well be miserable together while we're sitting here. Has to be more interesting that way. Did you ever... What? It's silly. But did you ever want to get off at a stop where you've never been before, just to see what it would be like? Which stop are you thinking of? No, oh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Pick one and see what happens. Hmm. Well, you'd be on your own. Nobody waiting. No car. I wouldn't mind. There's nobody waiting for me anyway. Would you? Not anymore. Forgive me. Did I say something wrong? Oh, it's just a... a <laughs> this is going to sound strange. I, I didn't mean to get personal. I, I think we're having the same dream. <laughs> what? what? Sharing the same fantasy, in a way. Remember the last trip when I dozed off? We spoke, and I asked you about the next stop. I was afraid you'd miss your station. You see, I, I dreamed we came to a station I'd never seen before. You got off as if you lived there. I saw you outside, walking around. In the dark? It was a bright summer day. Nice. What was I wearing? Something stylish, I hope. An old-fashioned long dress. Oh, I don't know about that. And, and a parasol. The kind with those uh, those little fluffs of the material around the edges. <laughs> really? What color? White, I think. Everything was old-fashioned. I could hear a band playing and the sun was up as high as it gets. It was the middle of July. I'm beginning to like this dream. And did you get off the train so we could have an adventure? That's the problem. I wanted to, but I didn't. Why not? I wish I knew. Willoughby. What did you say? Well, last week you asked me about a town called Willoughby, Mr. Williams. Oh, yes. I looked it up. No such place, as far as I could see. You're sure? Every old timetable I could find. Nothing with that name. Not even close. Thanks, anyway. Where did you hear about it? Oh, I... I must have dreamed it. Probably did. Old-fashioned name. Sounds nice, though. It does, doesn't it? Nice place to visit, maybe. Don't know if I'd like to live there. You never know. No, you don't. Take it easy now, Mr. Williams. Next stop, Stamford. Stamford, next stop. Is that the name of it? Willoughby? It was. You know, it seems familiar. They used to have different names, these towns, a long time ago. It could be you read about it in a book. It could be we both did. I don't have much time to read. It's almost as if I'm remembering something. Don't tell me you believe in past lives. That's nonsense. <laughs> no, it's not that. But the name does sound familiar, and I do like the sound of it. I do, too. Willoughby. 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 What did you say? Next stop, Willoughby. The woman who was sitting there. Woman, sir. In that seat, where is she? No other fares in this car, sir. But it was only a minute ago. Good day to you. Day? All out for Willoughby! It is day. Getting out, sir? Quick, what year is this? Why, 1888, sir. What else would it be? I don't know. I've been away for a while, have you? Lost track? Y yes, in a sense. Uh, how long is the stop at this station? Long enough to drop off and pick up. You have a ticket for Willoughby? No, I... Then you'd best take your seat. Though it is a fine, balmy day. A place where a man can live his life full measure. Yes. Hello there. Hi. You did it. You got off. Of course. This is where I live. 
It's such a lovely afternoon, and I do believe I'll take a walk in the park with some of my friends. You're quite welcome to join us if you'd like. All aboard! Wait, the train started moving. Goodbye, Mr. Williams. If I can jump to the platform... Oh, no, don't do that. I can make it. Too late. I can make it. Don't. It wouldn't be safe. Another time. Yes, a, a, another time. We'll make a day of it. People. A full car, Mr. Williams. Always is this time of day. There's your seat right over there. The woman I was talking to. I'm not sure that... I... She, she's not here now. Oh? Maybe she went to the club car. Or got off. Where? No stop so far. She got off at Willoughby. <laughs> you on that kick again? I told you there's no such town. I know. That's what you said. Sounds like a nice place, though. A real nice place. Tickets! Next time. Next time I swear I'm going to do it no matter what. I'm going to get off it. Willoughby. Yes, Helen. It's the big man on line one. Should I tell him to call him right back? Don't bother. I'll take it. Mr. Mizrell, morning, sir. I wanted to remind you, Williams. What we need here is an ad with pizzazz. Real entertainment. We've got to take the audience by the ears and give them a yank. Rock them and sock them. Give them the old push, push, push. My thoughts exactly. You've got to be bright, Williams. Bright with patter, hipness, and the whole thing push, 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 push. That's what the client wants. I'm working on it. Tomorrow morning, I'll need at least a preliminary storyboard. You know what I want. A solid format with some pops for the product, leading up to one big pop at the finish. And not just any pop this time. Light, color, explosions. I see it as a field artillery attack. We show the audience with mortar fire, lay down some tactical air support, and establish a beachhead in their cerebral cortex. Then we send in ground troops and occupy the territory. There. What do you say to that? I'll do what I can. Do more than you can. With me, Williams, aspire. Dream big and then get behind your dreams big time. Push. Push. Well, I haven't seen the ratings on the show. No. Uh, no. No, but it was the time slot the sponsor wanted. Uh, hold on a second, will you? Y yes? They were what? No, wait, wait. Helen? Yes? What film outfit did the commercials on the Bradbury account? The negatives are all scratched. They're screaming bloody murder at me. I'll send a fax. Oh, and Mr. Miss Rell would like to see you in his office. I'm going to have to check it out for you, okay? Mr. Miss Rell, sir, he got disconnected. He seemed rather insistent. Are you all right? You look so pale. Oh, I'd like to be, I'd like to be alone now. Not the ulcer again? Oh, please, just go. I'll be right outside if you need me. Janie, this is Gart, honey. Stay there, will you? Things are going to be different from now on, you'll see. I just want you to stay there. I'm coming home. Janie? Janie, please listen. I've had it, understand? I can't go on for another day, another hour. This is it. I, I've got to get out of here, Janie. Janie, help me, will you? Please? Please help me. Janie? Janie? Another scotch, Mr. Williams? No, thank you. Pretty empty in here today. Well, that's because it's too early. Most people don't hit the club car till after work. 
Wait till the commuter run. They'll line up like kids in a candy store. I bet they do. You going home early today, Mr. Williams? Yeah. Yeah, my wife's waiting for me. Oh, she is, huh? That's nice. At least I think she is. You call her and tell her? That I did. I just hope she got the message. Oh, I bet she did. Gonna take her out for dinner and everything? If she's there. Well, if she's not, you can just kick back and watch the game. Have the place yourself. You win either way. <laughs> That's right. I'm the winner, not the loser. That's the way to look at it. Let me ask you something. You know that woman? Which one? She rides the train the same time I do. Except today, because I'm running ahead. Uh-huh. What does she look like? Well, she wears an old-fashioned long dress, and she carries a parasol. And... <laughs> in here? Oh, no. No, I'm sorry. No, not in here. That's not what she wears on the train. Only in Willoughby. Willoughby? Where's that? That's just it. I don't know. Ah, oh, forget about it. I don't know what I'm talking about. I just thought she might have come in here. Just till she gets to her stop. Not many women in here today. So I see. You okay, Mr. Williams? A1, top drawer. See you next time. Sure thing. If there is a next time. Oh, you changing schedules? I might take some time off. Good deal. Vacation, huh? That's right. A vacation. A long one. Ticket? Hey, you're early, Mr. Williams. What? Decided to call it a day, huh? Yes, uh, yes, you could say that. Well, enjoy the trip. Oh, a conductor. Something else? You wouldn't happen to have a light, would you? You want a cigarette? It matches in the club car. No worse than a drink, I guess, if that's your poison. But you can't light up here. You have to wait till we stop at a platform. Of course, I... I was just wondering if you could uh, bend the rules this time. It's been quite a day. I need to unwind before I get home. I used to smoke. Two packs a day. Had to give it up, though. Doctor's orders. Right. Said it was cutting years off my life. So I decided to stick around. You want to do that, don't you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I do. That's why I'm going home. There you are, then. I have another question for you. Yeah? That woman, the one I talked to. Which woman is that now? Have you seen her in the other cars? Can't say as I have. Would you take a look? If I see her, I'll let you know. Thanks. I appreciate it. Some people didn't go to work, though. Cold day. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's it. Be colder tonight. That's what they say. Looks like snow. You keep warm now. I'll try. Next stop, Stanford. Stanford. Willoughby, next stop. Next stop, Willoughby. This is where I get off. Stop the train. Yes, sir. That's your station, Willoughby. Need a hand with your baggage? I don't have any. Nothing at all? Not a thing. Well, good day to you, then. Yes, it is. It really is a beautiful day. All aboard! Hi. We're going fishing. I can see that. Catch some big ones today, huh? <laughs> the biggest you ever saw. Want to come? Uh, maybe some other time. It's pretty hot today. Yeah. We're going to get a sunburn, then go swimming. That'll be fun. Come on, we got an extra pole, and there's plenty of fish. I'll bet there are. Bye, boys. Catch one for me, okay? Sure.
Such a lovely day. Too nice to stay indoors. I want to hear the band. Yes, the band. I love the sound. So do I. Beautiful. Did you say something? Not really. I'm... It's you. Hello. Oh, it is you. I'm glad you decided to join us. I was on my way down to the park. Where? Oh, that's right. You just got here. Come with me. It's not far. I'll introduce you to all my friends, just as I promised. Then they'll be your friends, too. I'd like that. I feel as if they already are. Then later, perhaps we'll take a stroll by the lake. It's truly splendid with the moon and the stars and... I like it here right now, with you. The trees, the stores... The shops are my weakness, I must confess. <laughs> You've got some wonderful antiques here. Antiques? That beautiful grandfather clock in the window, for example, a classic. wonder how much they're asking. Mm, it's quite reasonable. I'm sure, even though it's new. But it can't be. Come along now. We'll be late. Again. Again. It's no use. There's no pulse. Uh, it's a crying shame. He wasn't very old. You say he just jumped off the train? Right here. In the snow. In the middle of nowhere. Never saw anything like it. Poor Mr. Williams. He shouted something, ran out, opened the door, and that's the last I saw of him. Thought he went to have a smoke or something. Well, a heart attack, probably. Yeah, if the fall didn't get him. Well, he must have died instantly, then. At least he didn't suffer. Look at his face. Like he's at peace. Yeah, that's the way to look at it. All clear. Let's move it out. Where should we take the body? Out of the local mortuary, for now. Willoughby's funeral parlor? That's the one. They'll hold him till somebody contacts the family. All right, let's put him on the stretcher. Okay, you ready? One, two, three, lift! Mr. Guard Williams, who withstood the slings and arrows that come with life in the fast lane for as long as he could bear them, and eventually sought respite for his torment in the only place left open to him, under a gravestone, who climbed onto a world that went too fast for him and then finally jumped off. Mr. Gart Williams, who might now tell us what really awaits us in the great beyond, because this too is very much a part of the Twilight Zone. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Entry. Fourteenth day, sixth month, year four, I think. Kind of runs together after a while. Got up this morning, same as always. Big deal, huh? I even made my bed. See, it's strictly the honor system up here. Yeah, one more day scratched off the old calendar. First thing I did was, let's see, I made a pot of coffee. That's what they call this stuff. Uh. Next, some breakfast. Fake bacon and eggs. Hear that? Mm-hmm. Kind of makes your mouth water, doesn't it? Got to watch the calories, though. Putting on some pounds around the middle. That's bad for the ticker. <laughs> Wouldn't want to check out before my time. I make it 46 more years, give or take a few. Anyway, welcome to my world. At least I'll have something to play back later. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't have anybody to listen to. Because this way, I know I'm dealing with a higher class individual. Corey, you did it again. My compliments to the chef. Now, let's go outside and take a look around. Don't mind if I do. This is my backyard. And my front yard. It's all my yard now. No footprints in the sand except mine. I never even locked the door. Why should I? Nobody comes calling. Not even a lizard. Just miles and miles of nothing. Anyway, be back in a while. Time to go to work. I got a 1947 pickup truck out there. Been restoring it for years. Gives me something to do, like a hobby, you know? Alan B., he brings me parts a little bit at a time. Wonder how he's gonna get the long block here. Now that's gotta weigh more than a few pounds. Bye for now. This is Corey, signing off. Welcome to the world of Mr. James A. Corey. A shack, a shed, and a yard made up of sand and scrub that stretches to infinity. His work? An old truck, cobbled together from junkyard parts. He takes his time, for there is a ritual to loneliness. Twice a day, Corey leaves his shack, goes over to his vehicle in progress, and makes a few minor adjustments. Then he sits in the front seat, stares through the windshield that isn't there, and perhaps succumbs to a wishful daydream that he is at the wheel of a moving car, and the car is on a highway, and there is some place to go. But this will have to remain a dream, because where this man is, there are no highways, no places to go, and no people to see. For the record, let it be known that James A. Corey is a convicted criminal placed in solitary confinement. And it matters very little that his confinement stretches as far as the eye can see. His sentence is the kind of isolation that can destroy a human mind. It is an exile far worse than a dungeon at the ends of the earth. Because he has been banished to a place well beyond the earth. In just a moment, Mr. Corey will discover that he may not be alone for the rest of his life after all. And with that discovery will come the requisite spark of hope. But a spark is all it takes to fire a man's imagination in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Lonely, starring Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There she is, dead ahead. Got it, Captain. Prepare for planetfall. All systems check. Sir? What is it, Carstairs? I got a question for you. How can we still call it Planetfall if it's only an asteroid? <laughs> That's a good one. Well, call it whatever you like, off the record. But we're on the record now. This isn't a training mission. Set the coordinates. Yes, sir. The surface is coming up mighty fast. I don't know how you can tell one sand dune from another. By doing this every four months, year after year. That's how. Cory Shack is just over the rise. I don't see... It's right there. Fire retro rockets. Decreasing speed. Ready to nose up. Nose up. 40 degrees. 60. Keep pulling. 75. 80. 88. 90 degrees, sir. Now angle her down. Tail first. Piece of cake, Captain. What are the numbers? 0400 hours, Earth time. Fuel, 0.87 capacity. Cutting in a little close, sir. Now oh, those meteors on the way out. We lost some precious time. Corey won't be very happy. He's not supposed to be happy, is he? You don't know him the way I do, Adams. He waits for these deliveries like a kid on Christmas. Always wants to hear how things are back home. What the women look like, how the world has changed. I'm the only contact he's got. I didn't stop here. I think he'd go stir-crazy. what do he do anyway? He stopped caring, that's what. After he lost his wife. Yeah? Now he got in a fight. Some say it wasn't his fault. The guy died and he ended up here. They don't have room for any more criminals back home. The new regime, huh? I read about that. Uh, but he's had a lot of time to think. Nothing to do here but think. 
Prepare to set her down. I want a three-point landing this time. Yes, sir. Tailfin's ready. We're going in. Fifteenth day, sixth month, year four. <laughs> I'm even measuring time by this place now. I go on every day like the day before and the day before that. The weeks, the months. But I can't give in. I have to stick it out. There'll be a supply drop coming soon, I think. They're overdue. I hope it's Allenby's ship. Because he's a decent man and he brings me things. Like he sneaked the parts for that antique out there. Few pieces at a time, as much as he could carry. Thank God for that truck and the hours it used up. I can look at it out there and know it's real. And reality is what I need. Because what else is left that I can believe in? The desert? The wind? Myself? Here's a thought. Maybe I'll end up like that truck. Inanimate. Nothing but an object sitting in the sand. I wonder if I'd still feel the loneliness. Would I feel anything? Hey! That's it. The ship. Hear that diary? Now I don't have to talk to you. I've got somebody else. Besides myself. Be back later. How you doing, Allenby? Corey, how are you? All right. Corey, I, uh... Well, don't just stand there. Come on inside. It's hotter than blazes. What a place you got here. Glad you like it. I didn't say I liked it. I think it stinks. And I guess you think I don't? I don't know what you think. Hey, take it easy, Adams. Well, you don't have to live here now, do you? No. But I've got to come back here four times a year. And that's eight months out of 12, Corey, away from Earth. Sometimes my kids don't even recognize me when I get home. I'm sorry. I'll bet you are. Come on, fellas. Have some coffee. I got some clean cups. That's all right. <clears throat> uh, Corey. Wait, what am I thinking? Let me pour you a real drink. Thanks, Corey. It's real nice of you. Not right now, Carstairs. If you say so, Captain. Hey, this isn't so bad, huh? I like the way you set it up in here. Sure, sure. I have what I need. Most of it anyway. Thanks to the captain there. Yep, you got it made. This is Corey's kingdom, and it never changes. Sit down, everybody. How about a little poker? Four-handed draw, jacks to open. Who's in? Uh, we don't have much of a layover this time. All right, no openers. Joke is wild. Uh, there was some trouble on the way, and we lost time. Deuce is wild. How's that? A blackjack. Anybody want to play blackjack? You can count to 21, can't you, Adams? Listen to this guy. Look, we've only got 15 minutes, guys. So what? Nobody's checking your schedule out here. What's the big deal? I'm sorry, Corey. This isn't an arbitrary decision. If we delay our departure by more than 15 minutes, that places us in a different orbital position. We'd never make it back to Earth on the fuel we've got. We'd have to stay at least 14 days before we're in position again. So? Why not hang out here? I've got some beer put away. I can turn up the generator and get it cold. We'll sit around, talk. It's just not possible. It's a few lousy days, a few hours even. A couple of card games at least. How about you guys? What's the matter? Think I'll murder you or something over a bad hand? Not this time, Corey. All right, all right. Three or four minutes gone already. Better get going. I wouldn't want to foul up your schedule. Not for a lousy game of cards or a few bottles of crummy beer. How's your water supply? Don't worry about it. I got plenty. Well, I'll have a cupful then if you can spare it. Sure. We've got some fresh on board. I'll have them in bring it over. You do that. I brought you a few more things, too. I uh, thought you could use them. Thanks. Any news? Not yet. But I told you last time, there's been some pressure back home about this kind of punishment. A lot of people think it's unnecessarily cruel. Well, who knows what'll happen in the next couple of years. They may change their minds, rewrite the law, bring you back to a prison on Earth, like the old days. 
Allenby, I have to tell you something. Every morning, every morning when I get up, I tell myself that this is the last time. That I won't be able to live another day alone, not another day. And by noon, when I can't keep still anymore and the inside of my mouth feels like gunpowder and burnt copper and deep down in my gut, I've got an ache that won't go away and it starts to spread through my body, tearing little trunks out of me. Then I think that I've got to hold out for one more day, just one more day. But I can't keep doing that forever. You hear me? I swear I'll lose my mind. You're breaking my heart. What do you know about it? That's enough. Let him go. Why should I? What do I have to lose? I said... Take your hands off me, you nutcase. Watch your mouth. Corey. You shouldn't worry about losing his mind. Look at him. He's already lost it. Back off, Adams. Now, you and Carstairs go back to the ship and get the supplies. Yes, sir. Go on. Do as I tell you. And the big crate, the one with the red tag, handle that one gently. How about using the truck out there? Some of the stuff's pretty heavy. It's not running today. <laughs> it isn't, huh? What's the matter, Corey? Out of gas? Lots of places to go around here. There's the country club past the mound over there. And the seashore over that way. And the drive through restaurant. That's around here someplace, isn't it? Knock it off, Adams. Get the supplies. I'm going. I brought you some parts for the truck. A set of coil springs. I got some magazines, too. Strictly on my own. And some old vintage movies. Science fiction. Uh, you'll get a kick out of them. I'm sure I will. I brought you something else. Yeah. It would mean my job if they found out. Look, Alan B. I don't want your gifts. I don't want your tidbits. Makes me feel like an animal in a cage and there's a nice old lady out there who wants to throw peanuts at me. Alan B. I only got one question. What about the pardon? I'm afraid you're still out of luck. That's what I figured. The new regime, huh? The sentence reads 50 years. And they're not even reviewing cases of homicide. Alan B., take a look out there. What do you see? It says 90% of the view I'm going to have for the rest of my life. Did it ever cross your mind? Because it crosses mine every hour of every day. Unfortunately, we don't make the rules. All we do is deliver the supplies and pass on information. Because you're out of position for radio contact. Yeah. That's why they picked this place. Look, Allenby, a pardon. That's the only information I want. I'm not a murderer. I know. It was self-defense. A lot of people believe me, and it happens to be the truth. I killed in self-defense. I remember, Corey. Then why am I here? I doubt if it'll be much consolation to you, but this kind of assignment isn't easy. Stopping here four times a year, having to look at a man's suffering? You're right. It's not much consolation. Here they come. I can't bring you freedom, Corey. All I can do, all I can do is try to bring you things to help you keep your sanity. You want this big crate opened up, Captain? Not yet. Stay there. I'll be right out. Okay, I'll bite. What's the big box? You can open it after we're gone. If it's a 20-year supply of puzzles, you can take them with you. When I want a problem to solve, all I have to do is look in the mirror. We've got to go now. Did you hear what I said, Corey? Wait till we're gone to open it. And this is important. When you open up the crate, there's nothing you need to do. The item has been vacuum packed. It needs no activator of any kind. The air will do that. There'll be a booklet inside that'll answer any of your questions. You're being awfully mysterious. Well, I don't mean to be. It's just like I told you, though. I'm risking a lot to bring it here. They don't know what it is. So I'd appreciate it if you wait till we get out of sight. No problem. Give my regards to to Broadway and every place else while you're at it sure Corey I'll see you Allenby yes I don't much care what it is but for the thought Allenby for the the decency of it I thank you you're quite welcome Corey have a good trip two minutes captain go ahead and fire up the rockets yes sir Cap, just man to man what did you bring him? What's in the box? I'm not sure, really. Maybe it's an illusion, or maybe it's salvation. Open the hatch. Let's get out of here. What? You 
are now the proud owner of an XB1 robot. This model represents the latest in modern technology. Do not think of it as a machine. For all intents and purposes, it functions as a highly sophisticated simulacrum of a human being. Mm. Hello. My name's Alicia. What's yours? Hold on a minute here. Don't I speak clearly enough? No, no, no. You sound fine. Fine. What is this thing? Both physiologically and psychologically, she is comparable to a living human with a full set of emotions, a writable memory track, and the ability to reason and to speak. She is immune to organic illness and under normal circumstances should have a lifespan similar to that of a human being. Caution must be taken against exposure to excessive heat and moisture. She comes complete with a loose-fitting microfiber garment for general use. Would you answer my question, please? What question? What's your name? Um, Corey. My name's Corey. I like that name. Good. Glad to hear it. Now, if you don't mind, what are you doing? What is this place? This is mine. My place. Yours? Where I live. Alone. Alan B. must think I'm pretty far gone. Hey, 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 don't move that. It's my cup. I've still got some water left. Water? Do you like water, Corey? Yeah, I like it. Leave it, I told you. Would you like some more water? No, that's okay. Not right now. Very well. Where is your place? Where? On an asteroid, all right? Asteroid. I know that word. 6,000 miles north to south, 4,000 east to west. It's got atmosphere, gravity, the works. Now, why don't you just, just... What, Corey? Stop saying my name! Get out! I don't want some machine in here! I'm not a machine. I'm an XB-1. Go on! Get out! Corey? 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 Ow! Blasted coil springs. What's wrong, Corey? Nothing, all right? I brought you some water. Where shall I put it? Just leave it. But it will get warm on the sand. It won't taste as good. You know that, huh? What it tastes like? I can feel thirst. Yeah. What else can you feel? I don't understand. Can you feel heat and cold? The wind? Yes. How about pain? Can you feel pain? That, too. How? How can you? You're a machine. Excuse me. A different kind of machine. Yes. Of course you are. So why didn't they build you to look like a machine? Why aren't you made of metal with nuts and bolts sticking out of you? With wires and electrodes. Would you prefer that? You know, I might. Because then you wouldn't be a lie. A lie? Why do they cover you with stuff that looks like flesh? Why even give you a face in the first place? A face that if I look at it long enough, it almost makes me think... Makes me believe that... Believe what? Stop asking me stupid questions. I didn't mean to. Look at me. Don't hang your head. Corey. Turn that face up. I'm talking to you. Corey, please. Don't give me any of that phony stuff. Somebody program it into you? Why? What's the point? To mock me? I'm not mocking you, Corey. Yes, you are. Every time you talk to me, every time you look at me, like right now, I'm being mocked. You hurt me, Corey. Hurt you? How could I hurt you? This arm, it isn't real. Please, let go of me. There aren't any nerves under there. There aren't any tendons or muscles. There isn't any flesh and blood. But you don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? What are you doing? Oh, just what do you think? I'm looking for the right tool for the job, and you know what that job is? No. I'm going to turn you back into parts the way you should have been in the first place. Maybe I can use some of them in the truck. Corey, that's a hammer. That's right. That's what it is. You know what you are? You're like this broken down heap of iron set in here. Exactly like it. You're just a hunk of metal and plastic and, and, and God knows what, with arms and legs instead of wheels. But that heap doesn't mock me the way you do doesn't look at me with make-believe eyes and talk to me with a make-believe voice. No. Well, listen, you, 
You machine. I'm sick of being mocked by some kind of ghost, by the memory of what a woman looks like. Well, I don't need it. I've got enough memories. I don't have to be reminded of anything. And that's all you are. Nothing but a reminder that, that I'm so lonely I'm about to lose my mind. That's right. Close your eyes if you want. I don't care. Corey. What are you? Oh, Corey. Are those tears? Yes. You can cry, too? When I have reason. I, I, I can't stand to see that. But why? What are you crying for? I'm frightened. Frightened of me? You can feel fear? Yes. The book said with a full set of emotions. What else can you feel? Sadness. You can? And happiness. Joy, mystery, wonder, and other things. Such as? Loneliness. I don't believe it. Don't you? There you go again. Listen, it's hot out here. Yes, that's not good for me. We'll go back inside. All right. Yeah, better? Much better. In a little while, maybe we'll... We'll have some dinner or something, okay? That would be nice. And we can talk. If you wish. You like to talk, don't you? I mean, sit around, have conversations? Yes, Corey. What would you like to talk about? Anything. Tell me everything you know. Everything? I don't know very many things yet. You'll learn, Alicia. You'll learn. Here you go. Of course, it's only freeze-dried, but it isn't bad. Uh, you're not a vegetarian, are you? No, Corey. I hope you enjoy it. Me? This is for both of us. It smells wonderful. You haven't touched your wine. I'm fine, thank you. No, no, no. Go ahead. Drink up. I don't require food or drink, Corey. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, of course. What am I thinking? You should have let me prepare the meal. Why, you're not a slave. We're going to be partners from now on. You and me. No. But it means so much to you. I like to see that. It makes me feel happy. It does? Of course, I'm not a true human being as you are. I don't care. I don't care how you were born or made. You're flesh and blood to me. I need you, Alicia. Do you understand? And I need you, Corey. Okay. Now that we got that settled, let's drink up. Here's to us. From now on, we don't need anybody else. Yes, Corey. Drink up. It's a beautiful night, isn't it? Sure is. I mean, it's the first night I've seen. I know about trees and mountains and streams. Are there any of those nearby? Afraid not. It's all like this. But we can walk as far as we want. You're not cold, are you? I don't think so. Here, take my jacket. Once it's dark, the wind gets pretty chilly. I'm fine. Really? Can we have a conversation now, Corey? Sure. What do you want to talk about? Anything you like. Oh, I've got tons of things to tell you. A whole life's worth. But you talk first. Tell me things I've never heard before. Tell me what you think, how you feel. It's very dark out. Yeah, don't worry. We can't get lost. See the shack back there? It's the only light in the whole place. I see other lights. Where? Yeah. Up there. Oh, those are just stars. Really? I know some of the constellations. Well, they look different from here. Not like on Earth. That's where you, um, where you're from, isn't it? Yes. Are you from Earth, too? I sure am. New York, New York. You ever see the Great White Way? You mean the Milky Way? No, I mean Broadway. In Manhattan. You should see it when it's all lit up. Can we see the Earth from here? <laughs> I don't think so. It's a million miles away. More than that. 
Sometimes planets shine almost as brightly as stars. Like that one. Where? Over there on the horizon. Oh, yeah. Must be a shooting star. Make a wish, Alicia, before it disappears. But it's not. It's moving this way. Must be a ship, then. Like the one that brought us here? Allenby's? Could be. There are a lot of ships out there. Will he come back? Allenby, I mean? Oh, well, sure. You'll see. With supplies. Things to make our life better. But for now, let's just sit here for a while. Why? So we can look at the stars. Funny. I never paid much attention before. There's a North Star. You can see it even where we are. So bright. It looks like God's beauty. I like that, Alicia. God's beauty. I wonder if Alan will believe it when I tell him. Me sitting out here counting stars with you. Will he mind? What? I mean, is it permitted? Now, why would he mind? It's good like this, isn't it, Alicia? The best thing that ever happened to me. I hope you're right. Sure I am. We've got our whole lives ahead of us. Just you and me and... Have a little faith, will you? I'll try, Corey. I'll try. Alicia has been with me for 11 months now. Twice when Allenby brought the ship in with supplies, I've hidden her so the others wouldn't see. But each time, I've seen the question in Allenby's eyes. It's a question I have myself. And I don't have the answer. It's difficult to explain the sum total of this relationship. It's strange, all right. Man and machine. But it's also man and woman. There are times when even I know that Alicia is simply an extension of me, a mirror of my needs. I hear my own words coming from her. The things she's learned to love are the things I love. Where do you want to store the magazines and books, Corey? Anywhere, Alicia. Anywhere you'd like. I think I've reached the point now where I won't analyze her any longer. I accept her as a part of my life an integral part. I don't know how I ever got along without her. Because I'm not lonely anymore. Each day is something I can live with, something new. It's a gift. Nothing else matters. Because I love her. I've been trying to get up the courage to tell her. That's all for now. Alicia? Yes? I think I'll go outside and work on the truck for a while. Shall I go with you? That's all right. Now, uh, wait. Why not? You can see how it's coming. Just don't stay in the sun too long. I won't. I haven't done much work on it lately, but it's going to get finished. And it'll be great, I promise. I believe you. Go on, get in the front seat. If you like. Right next to the driver. Are we going somewhere? We sure are. Let's see, uh... How about burgers and a movie? But we have the movies Allenby brought us. Haven't you ever been on a date? First, I pick you up. Then we go to the movies. A driving. How about that? You don't even have to get out of your car. Then we go to a drive-in restaurant on the way home. We still don't have to get out of the car. Isn't that something? We order burgers and fries, maybe a chocolate shake. Then we drive home real slow. Home? You know, where we live. Where we really live. Where we belong. Mm. Sounds wonderful. Sure it does. There's lots of places we could go. Take a drive out to the beach or a cruise. So I can show off my girl. Would you show me off, Corey? You're darn right I would. Because you're beautiful. Alicia, something I've been wanting to tell you. Corey? Yeah. What star is that? You can't see stars in the daytime. I was going to tell you. But maybe it's a ship. The ship's not due for another month. What is... There. See it flash? It looks like silver. Wait a minute. It must be Allenby's. That's the only one that ever comes this close. 
Corey, what does it mean? I'll find out. You wait here. Just wait, all right? If you say so. Allenby? Hello, Corey. What are you doing here? Have some trouble? No, we had no trouble. What's the matter, Corey? Aren't you glad to see us? But you don't have a scheduled stop for another month. This is a scheduled stop. What are you talking about? We've got good news for you, Corey. Hold on. Let me tell him. Tell me what? Well, Corey... Forget it. Whatever it is, I'm not interested. <laughs> you better hear what it is first. You heard me, Alan B. I'm not interested. Don't you get it? I don't care what happens on Earth. Not anymore. You will this time. I guarantee it. Doesn't make any difference. It's worse. If we'd come back a month from now, I'd have been eating sand or something. I'll see you guys. Leave the supplies by the shack. Corey! Listen to me. It's this way, Corey. All the sentences have been reviewed. They've given you a pardon. We're not here to bring supplies. We're here to take you back home. What? But we've got to take off in exactly ten minutes. We can't wait any longer. We're almost out of fuel. Any more than ten minutes, and the coordinates will be wrong, and then I don't think we'd ever make it. Wait a minute, Allenby. What did you just say? What did you say about... You heard me right. A pardon. It won't do any of us any good unless you pack your stuff and get ready to move, Corey. We've picked up seven men from other asteroids, and we've only got room for about 15 pounds of gear. So grab what you need and leave the rest of it behind. Such as it is. I don't even have 15 pounds of stuff. <laughs> A shirt, a pencil, and a recordable diary. A pair of shoes? The truck you can leave here for the next poor devil. There won't be any next poor devil. There won't be any more exiles. You're the last. All right, we'll leave it here to rust then. The father's auto junkyard in the known universe. And Alicia and I will wave to it as we leave. We'll just look out of the porthole and throw it a kiss goodbye. The car, the shack, the salt beds, the sand dunes, the whole works. Alicia and I will just... Who? Who, Corey? Oh, my dear God. I forgot. Allenby, it's Alicia. You remember her? Is he out of his mind? Who's Alicia, Corey? <laughs> Who's Alicia? Adams, you idiot. You brought her here. You brought her in a box with a red tag on it. She's a woman. Well, a robot, technically. But closer to a woman. Much closer. She kept me alive. I swear to you, if it weren't for her... Corey, I don't know what to say. You worried about Alicia? You don't have to be. I tell you, she's just like a woman. And she's gentle and kind, and... Without her, I tell you, I'd be finished. I'd have given up. The only reason you'd have to come back would be to bury me. That's what you wouldn't let us look at, huh, Captain? The great... Sorry if I wasn't supposed to tell him. It doesn't matter now, Corey. But unfortunately, there's another problem. <laughs> problem? There are no problems left on heaven and earth. We'll pack up 15 pounds of stuff and we'll climb in that ship of yours and when we get back to that beautiful green earth. 15 pounds? 15 pounds? You've got to have room for more than that. Throw out some equipment. Alicia weighs more than 15 pounds. That's the point, Corey. We're stripped now. We've got room for you and nothing else except that little recorder of yours and the pencil. You'll have to leave the robot here. Helen B. She's not just a robot. You live it behind. That's murder. I'm sorry, Corey. No, you don't understand. You can't leave her. Alicia! Come here! You'll see. You'll see why you can't leave her. Alicia! Alicia! Where is she, Corey? I don't know. Look, just pack your gear and get out. Captain, we've only got a few more minutes. Come on, Corey. No! I'm not leaving without her. I told you that. I can't leave. This is our last trip. It's off the route now. That means no supplies. That means if you stay here, you die here. And if you make that choice, there'll be a day, Corey, when you'll pray for death to come quickly. I can't help it, Alan B. I can't leave her behind. And you won't take her. So that means I stay. Alicia!
Come here, Alicia. Let them see you. Don't be afraid. Corey, listen to me. I saw this, this thing get crated, shoved into a box. It's a machine with servo motor and wires and circuits and batteries. She's a woman! Captain Allenby, we've got to take off. How about it, Captain? We better leave him. We can't do that. Sick, mad, or half alive, we've got to bring him back. Those are the orders. Corey, it isn't just you now, it's all of us. So we can't argue anymore, Corey. We have to take you one way or another. I'm sorry, Corey. Grab it. No, no, you don't. Alicia! Stop him. Corey! Come on, Corey. We'll carry you if we have to. There you are. Alicia, talk to them. Tell them you're a woman. Tell them... Corey, is it all right? You said to hide. What are they doing? Are they hurting you, Corey? I have no choice, Corey. No choice at all. No, Alan B, I tell you, she's a human being. She's... Corey, I'm frightened. Corey! No. You see, Corey? There's nothing behind that face except wires and circuits and visual receptors. Alicia! Alicia! Corey? 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 Come along now. It's over. Yeah. It's over. It's gotta be now, Captain. Put it behind you, Corey, like a bad dream. When you wake up, you'll be on Earth. You'll be home. Home? That's right. All you're leaving behind is loneliness. I'll have to remember. Remember to, uh, keep that in mind. Let's go, Corey. Let's go home. Down below, on a microscopic piece of sand that floats through space, is a fragment of a man's life. Left to rust is the place he lived in and the machines he used. Without use, they will disintegrate from the wind and the sand and the years that act upon them. All of Mr. Corey's machines, including the one made in his image and kept alive by love, but now obsolete, in the twilight zone. <laughs> You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Director of Development. Please hold. Good morning, sir. Yes, this is market research. Mr. Abercrombie is still in. Mr. Jameson's office, personnel. I asked Mr. Sterling to return your call. Oh, uh, hello, sir. Legal department. I'll connect you with Mr. Barwell. No, he hasn't. Not yet. May I take your number? Miss and... Pepper. Mr. Feathersmith, how are you this morning? Miss Pepper, when the old gentleman arrives, Will you show him in? Of course, sir. Is there anything I can get you? The mail's on your desk. I have a list of your appointments. The old gentleman, that would be... Mr. Dietrich? Then it's Der Tag. What's that? The day. Today? Isn't that right, Helen? Well, he has an appointment. He's going to get it. Mr. Feathersmith will have him drawn and quartered and served up in the executive dining room with an apple in his mouth. I really couldn't say. That's because you haven't been here very long. Did you hear him? He was humming. Do you know why he doesn't like to get haircuts? Because his horns show. <laughs> Shh, there's Mr. Dietrich. Excuse me. I have an appointment to see Mr. Feathersmith. Oh, yes, Mr. Dietrich. If you'd let him know that I'm here. He's expecting you, sir. Go right in. Thank you. Very kindly. Yes? Mr. Dietrich, sir? Come in. 
I can just see him now, that big happy grin before he draws blood. Have a cigar, Mr. Dietrich, before I rip you to pieces. Cigar, Mr. Diedrich. You're about to witness a murder, a willful predatory case of homicide. The victim is a Mr. Sebastian Dietrich, age 77. The killer is a Mr. William Feathersmith, a robber baron whose body composition consists of refrigeration coils covered by thick skin. In a moment, Mr. Feathersmith will proceed on his daily course of conquest and calumny with yet another business deal. But today's deal will be one of those bizarre transactions that take place only in an odd, out-of-the-way marketplace known as the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Of Late I Think of Cliffordville, starring H. M. Wynant, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I said, would you like a cigar? No, thank you, Mr. Feathersmith. You asked me to come here at two, and it is now two. What did you have on your mind? Hmm. <laughs> You've never cared much for my personal habits, have you, Diedrich? Smoking, for example. Whether I do or don't is really not at issue, Mr. Feathersmith, but the extent of time that you keep me here is, on the other hand, of considerable import. I'm a busy man. I'd like to get on with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, by all means. Um, we've gone a pretty far out, the two of us. Have we? I owe you a great deal, Mr. Diedrich. I remember vividly the afternoon many, many years ago, back in Cliffordville. You called me into your office. You ran a rinky-dink, nickel-and-dime little tool shop. And you said, you said, uh, Bill Feathersmith, I like your style, boy. I want you in with me. Uh, do you remember that afternoon? I shall never forget that afternoon, Mr. Feathersmith. I thought about it a good deal in the ensuing years, and I've never ceased to regret it. <laughs> you never did like me. I wouldn't say that. I have disliked and detested you with great cordiality. I have found you to be, as of the day you walked into my office, a predatory, grasping, covetous, acquisitive animal. Without heart, without conscience, without compassion, and without even a subtle hint of the most commonplace decency. Does that answer your question? I give you this, Diedrich. You never were a man to toady around with a lot of phony euphemisms. You always did speak your mind. <laughs> and you, Mr. Feathersmith, mark you, this is perhaps the singular compliment I can dredge up. Have always been a man to speak yours, so why don't you? All right, then. I'll do precisely that. See this map? It's my empire. Mining over here. Electronics here, here, and here. Lumber, railroads, minerals. An industrial complex I built up step by step, piece by piece. And in which I take pardonable pride. Yet there's a piece missing. Go on. Well, that is to say there was a piece missing. The Diedrich Tool and Die plant. Was. A good, substantial plant employing 13,000 people some 40 years in operation, not always perfectly managed. But sufficiently well to make you move heaven and earth to try to buy it. Thank God I won't live to see the day when you get your greasy hands on it. Of course, as a matter of your financial problems, I happen to know, Mr. Diedrich, that you secured a loan of 13 million dollars. This is the note here, isn't it? How do you... I bought the note, Mr. Diedrich. I paid an exorbitant amount of money, far more than it was worth, but it was, let's say, an exceptional opportunity for our lives to crisscross again. What is your point? The point is right here on the note. It says payable on demand. So, on demand it is. I want it paid. Not tomorrow, 
Now, this moment, I want your personal check in the amount of $13 million, or I'm very much afraid I'll have to send out the painters to the Diedrich Tool and Dye Works and cross your name off the sign. Feathersmith, if you call in that note, you'll ruin me. You'll put me into bankruptcy. You'll kill off everything I have, everything I own. You're a most discerning man. Here it is only six minutes past two. Six minutes! That's all the time it's taken for you to comprehend that I've managed to kill you off. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dietrich, are you all right? Sir, is everything... Would you like to sit down? You, you look so pale. Miss, Miss Pepper? Miss Pepper? Where is she? Where is, where, uh, what time is it? Oh, excuse me, sir. I didn't know you were still here. I'm here, my good man. I'm assuredly here. <laughs> and here is the mountaintop. The high rung on the ladder. <laughs> I'll finish cleaning later. No, 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 no. You may join me on the mountaintop. <laughs> Here I am, way up on the mountain, like, like, uh, like who was it? Uh, Genghis Khan? Uh, Julius Caesar? Julius Feathersmith! <laughs> Don't worry, sir. I'll clean it up. Who are you, anyway? I'm Hackett, sir. The custodian. Top three floors. Well, uh... How, how would you like a drink, Mr. Uh, custodian of the top three floors? Uh, see, I, I, I have a, another bottle somewhere. Thank you, no, but I appreciate it. How long have you been performing this illustrious task? Thirty-four years, sir. I've been thirty-four years in the building. I got a... I got a gold watch last year. A gold watch? Ho, ho, ho! After thirty-four years! That's practically as long as I've been in the building. But I didn't start here. No, 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 no. I know indeed. I, I started in a little town called Cliffordville. Hmm. Never hear of Cliffordville, Mr. Hickett. That's a... That's a coincidence, Mr. Feathersmith. I was born in Cliffordville. Grew up there. Well, then we have something in common. We're both from Cliffordville, and we both put on our pants, one leg at a time. <laughs> but there, the similarity ends. Come here, I want to show you something. Yes, sir? See this picture on the wall? Know who it is? Why, I'm not sure. That's William Feathersmith. Me. Taken in front of our old home in Cliffordville. Now, that was a town, wasn't it? That was a real place. Stately trees, gracious homes, beautiful, sprawling park. And real people, people who knew the value of a buck, people who worked hard to get it. There was none of this crazy stuff about unions, retirement benefits, or antitrust suits, or any of that claptrap. Those were the real times, when a man could go up to the stars if he had a mind to, and the legs to carry him, and the fingers to reach out and grasp. Not like now. Nah. Not like now at all. I... I reckon so. I'm going home now, Mr. Hackett. May as well. No place else to go. Yes, sir. I've been sitting here for three hours, all by myself. Thinking about Cliffordville. About how I... how I wished it was that way again. I had an old man here today, Diedrich. He gave me my first real job. <laughs> well, I fixed his wagon. He never liked me, I never liked him. We both used each other, and I got the most use out of it. I broke him to pieces today, just like he would have done to me if he could. And he's tried, Mr. Hackett, let me tell you. He's tried. Good night, then, Mr. Feathersmith. William Feathersmith, what a crock. <laughs> Alexander Feathersmith is more like it. Alexander the Great Feathersmith. 
I've got everything there is to get. But I'm still hungry. Understand, I'm hungry. A 20-course meal. I've got a tapeworm inside me that's taken every bit of it. He cried. What? What did you say? Alexander the Great. He cried because he had no more worlds to conquer. I guess... I guess maybe he was kind of like you, Mr. Feathersmith. Hmm. Y you know... You know what I wish? I wish... I could go back to Cliffordville. Back 50 years ago and start all over. Because getting it all... That was the kick. Not having it. Getting it! Good night, Mr. Hackett. Custodian of the top three floors. Don't forget to wind your gold watch. Oh, at last. Hold on, Ed. This isn't the lobby. Hey, wait! I said wait! Where? The 13th floor. Oh, great. But well, this building doesn't have a 13th floor. Hello? Who's there? Hello? Hello? Oh, I'm glad you're still here. The elevator let me off the wrong floor. Oh, how do you do, sir? I was just about to close up. Who are you? Devlin. Just Devlin? The first name's not important. No, I own this building. I'm aware of that, Mr. Feathersmith. What I'm not aware of is you're having an office here, whoever you are. Oh, I've just opened it, Mr. Feathersmith. Devlin's Travel Service. Hmm. As a matter of fact, I opened it for your convenience. Mine? Would you care to come in? Why? Why, because, Mr. Feathersmith, we've got some business to transact, you and I. Please, have a seat. There's no reason why we shouldn't be comfortable, is there? I must have missed something. We have business. What sort of business? Travel, of course. I've been expecting you. You have? Sit, please. Now, isn't there anywhere you'd like to go? Your heart's desire? Well, there was this town. <laughs> of course there was. The name of the town was Cliffordville. Ah, yes, Cliffordville. And it was a pleasant town? It was better than pleasant. And <laughs> there were the local girls. Oh, beautiful. Just beautiful. They always are. Go on. You were saying? I remember old Doc Wagner, too. <laughs> Treated me when I broke my arm. That's another thing. There was none of this blood pressure, basal metabolism, cholesterol nonsense. Old Doc Wagner looked at your tongue and wrote out a prescription, and that was it. And the food, simple, fair, healthy, and delicious. That was the way life was then. Simple. And you enjoyed that, didn't you? What? No, I, I didn't have time to enjoy anything. But, but I did what I wanted to do. I worked, I scrambled, I dug, I scratched, I pushed, drove, and I went up. Understand, I went up. And now you're all the way up. But you're simply bored. That's what it is, isn't it, Mr. Feathersmith? I'm worse than bored. I don't have any purpose now, no, no plans, no, no drive, because there's no place left to go. Hmm, are you sure? The sign on your door, what, what does it mean exactly? A succinct suggestion of the kind of service I offer, Mr. Feathersmith. And that is? Just as it says. Travel. Or more to the point, if you don't mind the rather melodramatic terminology, one might call it time travel. Miss Devlin, I think we may have something to talk about after all. Indeed, Mr. Feathersmith. You've got everything you want. And the pleasure is not in the acquisition. It's in the struggle to acquire. Isn't that the sense of it? Go ahead. So, let's do this. Let's send you back to Cliffordville. The Cliffordville of 50 years ago. And you can start fresh. Acquire. Build. Consolidate. Do it all over again. 
How does that sound? You're not dealing with a bumpkin, Miss Devlin. This isn't one of those sell your soul for a nickel country boys. <laughs> Try this. You send me back in time to Cliffordville, but I want to look like I looked 50 years ago. Agreed. Number two, I want to keep my memory, everything that's happened since, not impaired one bit. Check again. And I want the town to be exactly as it was, the same people. All very easily arranged. Now for the price. I suppose the standard payment is, well, <laughs> what you call a soul. On occasion, that is part of the transaction, but in your case, I believe we got a hold of your soul some time ago. Mm, let me check. Mm. Oh, yes. Here it is. There was the crash of the Trans-Mississippi Debentures, the company you bought and manipulated. You ruined several hundred people with that bit of chicanery. The bulk of your soul went over to us shortly thereafter, and there are several other items here. Private life, subconscious thoughts and dreams, uh, indirect murders, people you drove to ruin, hopelessness and suicide. No, I'm afraid your soul is not yours to negotiate. Then what do you charge? Cash, Mr. Feathersmith, the old Missoula. I have your current assets tabulated here. Were you to liquidate as of this moment, you'd be worth precisely $136,891,412.14. <laughs> You're very thorough. We have to be. Now, the cost for what you ask is nominal. The entire bill, and this covers transportation, clothing, the retaining of your memory, the maintenance of the town in its historically accurate form, including its citizenry, is... One hundred thirty-six million eight hundred and eighty-eight thousand six dollars, leaving you a balance of two thousand eight hundred twelve dollars and fourteen cents. Highway robbery. Quite a little nest egg, considering. Hmm. Considering that I know where the oil is, just outside of town. Fourteen hundred acres not discovered until they brought in the first well, and of course I know the stock market in advance, and every important invention over the years, before it happens. I can get in on the ground floor. The absolute basement. All things considered, Mr. Feathersmith, it's a fortune. You just send me back there with my bankroll and watch my smoke. How soon can I go? I'll handle the liquidation for you. Just sign this power of attorney and there's no reason why you can't leave, say, tomorrow morning. Done. Exemplary, Mr. Feathersmith. You're one of the few remaining rugged individualists. A pleasure doing business with you. Now, Union Airways, 8 a.m., followed by a rail connection the rest of the way. I'm afraid there was no airport near Cliffordville back then. You'll arrive at noon, exactly 50 years ago. And needless to say, I wish you everything that you deserve. Little lady, you don't have to wish me anything. I'll get everything I go after. Everything. You know, Mr. Feathersmith, I believe you. In fact, I have no doubt whatsoever. Care for a cigar? Here's your stop, sir. A are you sure? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yes. Yes, there, there's the town square. <laughs> need a hand with your bags? I don't have any bags, and I don't need a hand from anybody. Why well, say, Conductor, is there, is there a mirror handy? Why, yes, sir. There's one right inside that door there. Devlin, you really did it. I look... Fifty years younger! <laughs> Is everything all right, sir? All right. My man, things couldn't be better. Then, then, good day to you, sir. Enjoy your stay in Cliffordville. All aboard! Cliffordville. <laughs> the devil, you say. Yes, sir. May I help you? I'd like to see the president of the bank. That would be Mr. Gibbons. Do you have an appointment? No, but he'll see me. He's having his lunch right now. 
Tell him uh, Mr. Feathersmith is here to talk about investments. Some very important investments. All right, sir. I'll tell him. Take your time, sweetie. <laughs> By the time the bank closes, I'll have this dumpy little milk stop tied up with a ribbon around it, deliverable to me. I'll only be a moment, sir. I don't normally let business interfere with pleasure. I never allow pleasure to interfere with business. The name is Feathersmith. I'm not a peddler, a drummer, or door-to-door -door salesman. I'm here to make myself rich. And in the process, you'll pick up a few crumbs of your own. I beg your pardon? The Widow Turner's Land. The south end of town. Is it available? The Widow Turner's Land. There were 1,400 acres. Mr. Gibbons, is there an echo in here? No. No, indeed. It's just that... Well, sir, you're talking about a valuable piece of property. A beautiful spot. Singing birds and constant sunshine. A garden of Eden for a man with vision. The potential is unlimited. It's a swamp for mosquitoes, and the potential's malaria. I just want you to tell me who owns it and how much they want for it. As a matter of fact, it was purchased from the late Mrs. Turner's estate by... Yours truly. In partnership with a Mr. Sebastian Diedrich. Diedrich, huh? What do you know? Well, do you suppose you and Mr. Diedrich could be persuaded to part with your land? Assuming the price is right. As valuable as it is. Well, sir, everything has its price. How does eight dollars an acre sound? Lovely. Good, good. If I were an idiot. But I'm not an idiot, Mr. Gibbons. I'll give you one dollar an acre. Well, why don't we strike a compromise and say six dollars? Let's say one fifty. You drive a hard bargain. Mr. Diedrich and I might hold still for four dollars an acre. Mr. Gibbons, you wouldn't hold still for a back rub if it couldn't be converted into currency. Two dollars an acre and that's it. Two, you say? Two, I said. And ten minutes from now, it'll go down to one sixty. Going. Going. Gone, Mr. Feathersmith. I presume this will be a cash transaction. You bring the deed over to my hotel tonight. Properly signed and notarized, and you'll have your money. Well, now, sir, this is the way I like to do business. No fiddling around, just two staunch men of goodwill who know what they want. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Feathersmith? I'll agree with you all the way down the line, Mr. Gibbons, as long as you keep both hands on the table. Here's your coffee, sir. Enjoy your dinner. Give my compliments to the chef. Tell him if he ever wants to go into the cement business, I'll back him. Oh, you didn't like your steak and eggs? I was enraptured by them. All 14 pounds. What do you fry them in, motor oil? Why, lard, sir. Lard, of course. The things a man remembers. Beg your pardon? Weren't there elm trees outside on the square? Elms? No. Just those old oak trees. Kind of ratty looking. The same thing applies to the young ladies of the town. The ones I used to go on hayrides with. Incredible. I thought they were as sweet as peach pie. Now they look like 14 course meals fried in lard. The things you remember. And how wrong you can be. Ah, Mr. Feathersmith. Right on time. I don't believe you two gentlemen have met. This is my associate, Mr. Dietrich. How do you do? Yes, I recognize you, Mr. Diedrich. So very, very much younger, though. You have me at a disadvantage, sir. Never mind. Sit down. Please. I presume you have the cash. Fourteen hundred and three acres. Twenty-eight hundred and six dollars. Hmm. You like to put all your eggs in one basket, don't you, Mr. Feathersmith? Don't concern yourself, Mr. Diedrich. I happen to have an exclusive contract with the hen. <laughs> <laughs> Waiter, uh, beer's all around. Right away, sir. All right, gentlemen, uh, let's get down to cases, shall we? When it comes to a fast shuffle, I don't mind telling you I'm a very knowledgeable dealer. Comment, Mr. Diedrich? Uh, you have the floor, Mr. Feathersmith. You seem rather anxious to have it. Just a human frailty to gloat a bit when one has just skinned a couple of professional skinners. 
I suppose you're thinking that when this pigeon flew into town, you plucked him bald. Well, <laughs> I sent a telegram to a geologist this morning. He came in on the one o'clock train, spent the afternoon out at the Widow Turner's land, made some preliminary soil tests. <laughs> Care to hear the results? Feel free, sir. Then I'll oblige. That crummy swampland you sold for two bucks an acre is worth a million times that. There's oil in that ground. Oil, understand? Black gold, enough to produce 500 barrels a day for the next thousand years. <laughs> oh, I swear, I can almost feel sorry for you. <laughs> uh, maybe you didn't hear me. Oh, we heard you. Oil. How's that for a shocker? Well, at the time, it did make us gulp. At the time? Four years ago, when the first geological tests were done. There was no doubt then that the land had oil under it. Six thousand feet under it. Which means that it might just as well be on the moon. <laughs> There's no way that oil can be taken out. What do you mean, no way? I could drill down a mile, two miles if need be. You could, perhaps, Mr. Feathersmith. But nobody else on Earth could. Unless you've already invented such a drill. Of course. I forgot. It wasn't until several years later that they came up with a drill bit strong enough to... Something uh, wrong, Mr. Feathersmith? Not feeling too well? Something... something I... I ate. Oh, something you ate. No doubt. Something like crow, sir? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Cronk, this here is Mr. Mr. Uh... Feathersmith. Yeah, he says he wants to talk to us about inventions. What kind of inventions? Something that'll turn this two-bit bicycle shop into a factory. Such as? Well, for starters, um, how about a motor-driven scooter for kids? Uh, you want to enlarge upon that, Mr. Feathersmith? What do you mean, enlarge upon it? It's a gadget that gets kids around town. Teenagers, too, even businessmen. What's it used for? It's used... To make about 200 million bucks. That's what it's used for. Lightweight aluminum with wheels and an electric motor. <laughs> What's wrong with foot power? Everyone's going to want these. Kids will be begging Santa Claus for them. Look, I'm handing you the whole thing on a platter. All you have to do is build it. Well, I'll tell you what. You draw me a blueprint and some specifications, and Mr. Clark and I will give it a try. I'm no crummy draftsman. I've given you the principle. All you have to do is manufacture it. Not without a blueprint and specs and some backing. You have any money? I can get it. Anyone with a little imagination could see. Well, only place that makes loans around here is the bank. That'd be Mr. Gibbons. You better talk to him first, with your blueprints, of course. What other inventions you got? Other inventions? What isn't there? Everything under the bloody sun. There's color TV, stereos, compact discs. Compact what? Supersonic airlines, plastics, transistors, computer chips, O-rings for space shuttles. Whatever you want. And you rubes sit here fixing tricycles. We could be making billions. <laughs> of course we could. I tell you, there's nothing to stop us. You name it. Well, now, how about a nice little perpetual motion machine? That'd be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's funny? I don't need you. What other machine shops are there in this hick town? Well, you might try Otis over at the gas station. He's got all kinds of tools. Of course, he's pretty busy regrooving people's tires. See you in the funny papers, boys. You live to regret this. Mark my words. What was his name again? Featherhead? <laughs> Modems, you connect your home computer to the telephone line. Y your home what? It's called an intermittent windshield wiper. Say it isn't raining very hard, just drizzling, but you want to keep the windshield clear. The wiper motor has an in-between position. What kind of motor exactly? Cable television. You pick up the signal from a satellite. What's a satellite? Listen, you download it over a dish network. Dishes? But nobody watches TV in the kitchen. 
pantyhose. I say take off your garter belt now and throw it out. Now. And I say get out of my store. All the way out. You have a filthy mouth, sir. Diedrich! I know this is your house. Come out here. Who's out there? It's me, Feathersmith. Do you know what time it is? It's 50 years too early. That's what time it is. Listen, I, I played it all wrong. I, I should have had it done the way it happened in the first place. I, I'll, I'll start in the morning, just like I did before. I. What are you talking about? You said I had get up and go. You, you said I had drive. Then I went to work for you and I moved up from there. You want to do what again? I want to go to work for you. I wouldn't hire you if you were the last man on earth. You're a loudmouth clod born to get suckered out of his last quarter. Now let me have my sleep. Oh, I got, got to rest. Oh, this pain in my chest. Oh. Are you all right, sir? You look pale. Why don't you sit down on this bench? Doc Wagner? Is that you? Now you must be the new fella in town. Nothing but idiots in this place. Now, now, take it easy. Hmm. That's not a very good pulse. Not good at all. Never mind that. Never mind that. How, how do I get through to these village idiots here? They're, they're peddling their lives away on bicycles and I'm trying to give them the space age. I don't know much about that, but I can tell a bad pulse when I feel one, and yours feels like the heart of a 75-year-old man. You sure don't take care of yourself. What did you say? The pulse of a what? A man in his 70s. If I've said it before, I've said it a hundred times. Modern man drives himself to an early grave just trying to keep up with the pace of life nowadays. Why? That dirty, cheap little thief! She didn't change me inside. That's why I'm so tired. That's why I can't make it here, because inside I'm old, the way I was. Swallow two of these pills. You horse doctor. I remember when you were diagnosing acute appendicitis as cramp colic. Go on, get out of here. You couldn't diagnose anything. Well, I can diagnose insanity when I see it. And that's what my diagnosis is in your case. Insanity. Plain and simple. I don't need you. I don't need this jerkwater town. If I were you, I'd check myself in for observation. At a mental hospital. Well, you're not me. It was that Devlin dame. That dirty, two-timing little hustler. Why, Mr. Feathersmith, everything all right? You look a bit queasy. You miserable. Now, let's be fair. Nothing was said about changing your chronological age. You wanted to look 30. And you do. We said nothing about your insides. Your heart, veins, kidneys. What, what, what about this town? You wanted it as it was. The contract was very specific. It's really not my fault that your memory is so imperfect. And as to the possibility of investments, your problem was that you lapped before you looked. But everything else is wrong, too. I mean, the deals, the inventions. They've never heard of space shuttles or microchips or... Of course they haven't. And you, Mr. Feathersmith, because you're a wheeler dealer, a raider, because you're a taker instead of a bringer, you are now what is commonly referred to as behind the old eight ball. Look, I don't want much. I, I swear to you. Make it the way it was, that's all. Get me back with Dietrich. Let me start out there. That's all I ask. Impossible. I've made no deal with Mr. Dietrich. If he doesn't want to hire you, what can I do about it? And then send me back to where I was. I give you my word. You understand, Mr. Feathersmith, that I could send you back to the future. But it would be a future predicated on... on this. On what's occurred in the past 24 hours. I don't care. I... I don't care. I just want to go back to where I belong. I think we might be able to arrange that. Mind you, purely as a gesture of sympathy, 
though it hurts me to mouth the word. Frankly, you are so unhappy, so totally abject a creature that I cannot find it in my... Well, in the place where you'd normally find a heart, to leave you here. There's a train out at midnight. A special train. Bless you, Miss Devlin. Please. I won't forget this. There is a small surcharge for the service. How much? Forty dollars. Things do cost, Mr. Feathersmith. I don't have forty dollars. I, I don't have ten. I don't have... What's this in your pocket? Well, how about that? This is your night. You have one negotiable item left. The deed. All you need to do is liquidate it. But who'd buy it? That I wouldn't know. What do I do? You've got a few seconds. Find yourself a customer. It's as simple as that. But where? There's a young fellow over there on his way home. You can ask him. It's bargain night, right here. Huh? 1,400 acres of singing birds, constant sunshine, all for 40 bucks. Here, please. Well, for $40, I might be able to... All aboard! Please hurry. There, there. You won't be sorry, you'll be rich. Hey, hey what's, what's your name, young fella? Uh, Hackett, sir. Bill Hackett. Yes, want something? I was going to clean up, sir. So clean up. Who are you? Feathersmith, sir. <laughs> Great old town. What is, sir? I was just thinking about Cliffordville. That's where I grew up, got my start. That's a coincidence. I, I grew up in Cliffordville, too. Well, now, how similar we are, Mr. Feathersmith. We both came from Cliffordville, and we both put our pants on one leg at a time. And here we both wind up in the same building, each with his own particular function, eh? Yes, sir, our, our own particular function. They, yeah, well, they gave me a gold watch four years ago. My 40th year as a custodian. Well, now... Maybe for your next 40 years, if you really apply yourself, Featherstone, I'll get you a box of these imported Cuban cigars. What do you think of that? That sounds great, Mr. Hackett, sir. Have one now, why don't you? On me. <laughs> Mr. William J. Feathersmith, tycoon, who tried the track one more time and found it muddier than he remembered it, proving with at least some degree of conclusiveness that nice guys don't always finish last and some people should quit when they're ahead. Our tale of Iron Man and Irony delivered F.O.B. from the Twilight Zone.